the hour of 1.30 having arrived, the Santa Cruz City Council meeting of May 23rd, 2023 is called order and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins is currently absent. Uh, Bruner? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Uh, here. Sorry. Oh. Councilmember <laughs> Kalantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? I am still here. <laughs> and Mayor Keeley? Here. A quorum having been established. Uh, this is the opportunity for anyone to address us on items on our closed session agenda. Uh, we will be moving into closed session in a moment after any public comment on that, and then we will return on or about uh, 2.30, 2 o'clock rather. Do we have anyone wish, with us today who wishes to comment on our closed session agenda? Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? No one with their hand raised. Seeing, hearing none, the council stands adjourned into closed session. having arrived the May 23rd 2023 session of the Santa Cruz City Council will come to order the clerk will call the roll Councilmember Newsom present Brown here Councilmember Watkins is currently absent uh, Bruner present Kalantari Johnson present Vice Mayor Golder here and Mayor Keeley here Having established a quorum, we will proceed. Uh, item two on our agenda, we will take this up at about four o'clock this afternoon when some other folks uh, will be able to attend. We will now be on item three, Beach Safety Week. Um, I will recognize DC Lawson, Recreation Supervisor of Sports and Beaches. Good afternoon, welcome Good afternoon. to the council. Thank you. And with me, I also want to introduce Fire Captain um, Brian Thomas and Patrick Mason over at the wharf. Thank you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to give this presentation today. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Um, this is National Beach Safety Week. It starts the uh, Monday before Memorial Day and goes all the way through Memorial Day. Nationwide, we see a lot of people um, coming to our beaches from all over. So that's why we want to highlight that and let you guys know some of the preventative tips that we can share with our public um, before they go into the water. And I'll bring it to uh, So the PSA is the public safety announcements that we do. Uh, at the end of 2021, we had a string of drownings that happened up north that kind of spurred us to revisit um, our PSAs that we put together. Uh, we started in 2019, but uh, last year we had a new one, which was our Know Before You Go campaign. And we put that together in collaboration with uh, multiple agencies, uh, just to name some of them. Uh, forgive me if I leave some out. Central Fire, State Parks, Cal Fire, Harbor Patrol, the Sheriff's Office, UCSE, California Fire Prevention Organization. Um, they were all pivotal in creating these PSAs and a joint training with the sole purpose of educating the public and uh, increasing our operational ability between agencies. Um, those PSAs that we've created um, currently, we have them in the Dream In and the Daily Dreamer. Um, it's, uh, it goes out in their newsletter and a QR code, gives them all the beach safety tips as well as our, our current beach uh, hazards and everything. Um, and it goes out uh, on CCTV later when they do the upgrade. And uh, Chief Odie is working with other hotels and visit Santa Cruz to see how we can roll it out in other uh, communities and hotels in order to kind of reach a further Thank you, sir. So last year, I asked council to um, inform their friends, their family, the public about all of our beach safety tips. So this year, rather than me telling you what those tips are, 
we went down to the beach and asked the public if they could name the safety tips that you referred back to them. So, Bonnie, if you don't mind playing the video. Those are the top 10 beach safety tips, and it looks like the public um, nailed them all and included a few additional ones, which is awesome. And to, to go from there, um, I'm going to turn it back to uh, Captain Thomas to go over some of our marine safety stats from last year. Uh, 2022, we had nearly a million visitors visit Santa Cruz beaches. Of those visitors, uh, Santa Cruz lifeguards made roughly 90,000 preventative action contacts. 45,000 public service contacts, 219 water rescues, and 175 medical aids. So to kind of break that down, what that means is we make an effort to try to contact at least one out of every 10 person that, that enters our beach. Um, and I'll just segue into uh, this winter was like one of the worst we've ever had and we've ever seen. And the amount of damage that we had to our infrastructure and our coastline was devastating um, this summer. Uh, the lifeguards are going to be um, addressing some of those new hazards by having a tower out at Lighthouse Point uh, where we're going to be um, really focusing on education and preventative actions to the, the new cliff collapses and the hazards that are in that area. And that's just one of the areas that we've been focusing, but really the wharf crew and the amount of effort that they've been doing to rebuild all the damages and stuff has just been uh, um, incredible. So I'm going to pass it over to Pat. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good Patrick afternoon. Mason, uh, maintenance crew leader on the wharf and beaches. Um, since the 6th of January to the 26th of April, we've removed about 638.24 tons of storm debris from the beaches. 1.2 million and change, and we're still counting. Um, it's been a lot. It's been a huge team effort. Um, there's one person on our team that I, we couldn't have done this without. That's my senior parks maintenance worker over here, Joel Braga, <laughs> who's been doing this for over 27 years. <clears throat> and um, yeah, thank you very much um, for having us and for listening, and have a great rest of your day. Well, thank you very much. That's all we have for you guys, but if you guys have any questions or comments for us, we're here. <laughs> I think we're all terribly impressed and grateful, but the vice mayor does have a question or a comment. I just want to thank all of you guys for your incredible work and um, everything you guys do every day is so important to the visitors, to the beach, local and tourists alike. The only like thing in regards to beach safety when they said know your flags, if you're not from here, how do you know what the flags mean? Is there like a, a, a making like a, a sign on the beach that says what a black ball is? What the, you know what I mean? Like so people. So they could mean multiple things, and that's kind of that. Uh, 
that point to, if you don't know, that's when you go and ask the lifeguard, okay. what okay. does that flag mean today? Cool. So it's about uh, regulating a certain unsafe event, and uh, you'll need to talk to the lifeguard on duty that day. Cool. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Enormously grateful to your good work. We are on item four. This is a mayor's proclamation declaring May 21st through May 27th as Public Works Week. And uh, I'm going to, Mr. Nguyen, come on up. Uh, it is a great honor and a privilege every year to acknowledge the fine work uh, of your team and all the public works teams in the public agencies uh, in Santa Cruz County, they do a terrifically good job. We call on you every day, whether it's an emergency or not an emergency, to keep all of the various component parts of infrastructure, which is essentially what cities do, uh, to keep that in good running order, uh, to make sure that every part of our infrastructure is operational and when it isn't to be able to quickly fix it and repair it uh, that helps make our city both a, a safe and sane community to be in i would invite you to make some remarks sir uh, thank you mayor uh, thank you council members thank you members of the public <clears throat> my name is nathan Wynn, director of public works and this year's uh, public works week uh, is the 63rd annual and its theme is connecting the world through public works. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> and so we do do that every single day. And of course, we've had a very challenging year as well. And I'd like to uh, thank and recognize staff for the efforts um, throughout the city. Uh, the, the storm damages that occurred could have been much more worse if you know, our staff wasn't out there doing maintenance and working on CIP projects, uh, not just this year, but leading up to this, all these storm events. So just want to thank them and thank you guys for recognizing our efforts. Thank you very much, sir. Questions, comments? I think I speak for us all when I say, God love you all. You do a great job for us. Thank you very much. Please have, pass that along uh, to all of the employees of the department. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are on item number five, and this uh, is a presentation regarding the citywide housing project interactive map. And I will invite our Director of Economic Development and Housing, Ms. Lipscomb, to address us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the Council. I'm Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Economic Development and Housing. And I'm just going to intro the item for um, just the first minute. I know that Sarah Domandon, who's uh, one of our, it's our business liaison at the city, this is actually her project. And she worked really hard on this. And we also have Rich Westfall, who is great, is coming and joining us. Um, so it's my pleasure to kick off this brief presentation on this interactive housing map. We frequently are asked about the number of units in the pipeline, both affordable and market rate, and how soon they'll be completed. We generally refer them to the amazing planning website that has so much detail. You can get the plan sets, you can get the dates, you can get uh, where it is in the approval process, but we don't have like one place that has like a total database that totals up the number of units, that tells you how many bedrooms um, each of the project has and how close it is to occupancy. Um, so actually, it's Vice Mayor Golder reached out um, regarding the need for specific housing data related to two to three bedroom units for families for Santa, Santa Cruz School District planning. And I, I recognize you might want to go into a little more detail on your project. But we did realize at that point, we get these questions so often, but this specific request um, from a planning perspective as they're trying to plan for schools going into the future was such a, a, an important need. And we recognize that there's a, a lot of people who are out in the community trying to plan like what's being built, what's in the pipeline, and also just to know a little more detail about what's affordable and what's not, um, and where these projects are in the community. So what started out um, with what generally was a, a research project that um, Sarah uh, graciously took on um, became just this collaborative citywide effort. And we now have an interactive housing map. And it wouldn't have been possible, I'd say, without the, the vision and the skill of these two, both Sarah and Rich, who are sitting um, right now, um, as well as the, the foundation of the Building Blocks of Planning's website with all of the great data. So taking the database, creating it, and then turning that into a GIS tool with Rich's help and our housing team and other folks around the city. So we're so excited. You can now look at specific data, including the 
total of the number of units in the pipeline, where they are, how many bedrooms, where they are geographically. You can zoom out for the whole city and get the total total unit counter. You can zoom into a specific geographic area and get the total unit in that geographic area. You can go as deep as you want, and it links to the planning project pages. Um, and you can look at the totals um, in real time and see where they are in the planning process, if they have their approvals, and then some estimates of when they'll be to occupancy. We plan on updating this probably quarterly. We're going to see how it goes. This is our first sort of public airing. We don't have it up yet on the website. We're probably going to refine it over the next week and then hopefully post it, post it very soon. Um, so with that overview, I'd like to turn it over um, to the great team over there of Sarah and Rich and let them sort of give you, uh, you know, an overview of how the interactive map uh, can be used by the community. Thank you. Good afternoon. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley, members of the City Council. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, my name is Sarah DeMond, and I'm the business liaison with the business support team at Economic Development. And just to provide a brief background on the project, uh, we did initially create a version of this map for the downtown scope uh, to assist the business community members as well as existing and prospective businesses um, in sort of envisioning the changes coming down the pipeline from the two to five year mark. The feedback we got uh, showed the value and importance of visual storytelling for both short and long term planning. So we expanded the work to include all significant housing projects citywide. Um, with the objective of creating a visual tool for anybody speaking to the city's capacity to house our growing community. With this in mind, this cross-departmental cross effort seeks to consolidate a wide range of living data into simple, interactive um, map formats that allows for filtering and sorting, as Bonnie mentioned. Uh, whilst, while it's still in its early stages, I want to recognize the existing and ongoing work from planning and housing, um, as well as with Rich uh, at GIS that this map builds upon. Um, it really has been a collaborative effort across teams and departments. Um, so I thank everyone that's worked on this uh, map. So with that, I'll pass it off to Rich to walk us through the map. OK, I'm going to share my screen here. My name is Rich Westfall. I work in information technology. All right. So. The application, uh, when it initially starts up, um, as both Bonnie and Sarah mentioned, um, has all the data uh, that they collected or is available on the planning's website uh, for project-specific locations. And with this um, that you have set up, the initial view is the city limits itself, um, along with, um, let me see if I can close this. Um, along with a list that's on the left side of the application. So as you're kind of scrolling through, you're able to um, go into any one of the individual projects and click on it. That's going to highlight what you're going to see on the map. Um, to reset it back to the original view, you would click on the project again uh, at this point, and then I'll actually put the map back to um, all the projects in it. Um, as you zoom in and zoom out, uh, the list that's showing up on the left will change uh, based on what you see in the map view. The numbers that are associated with each individual list, um, each individual project in the list are kind of the numbers that you're going to end up seeing on the map. Um, you can kind of go into one of these and you can select one. It'll give you quite a bit more information um, that you can go through and See if there's a way to share this out. There we go. Let's move it to the center. Um, so this gets you more into those planning pages that um, that Sarah and Bonnie were talking about. That gets you into a lot of the data that the planning department has put out. Um, if you want to go back to the application itself, you can zoom your way back out, you can hit this home button, and then I'll bring you all the way back out as well. Um, if you would like to filter some of the information, not spatially, by zooming in and out, you can actually select this filter tool. And this allows you to go in and look at the data that was collected for each one of these projects. Um, so if you want to look at projects that are currently under construction, you can come in here and select this filter hit apply, 
the map will refresh, so will the list on the side that'll actually give you an idea of what projects are currently under construction. If you wanted to filter something down a little bit more, you can go into and select uh, time to occupancy. If you want to see what's going to be potentially available as an estimate in the next year, um, you can come in here and select that as well. Hit apply. That'll filter down um, the data a little bit further, show the list itself. To reset the filter, you can come back in here and hit this refresh button. It'll bring you all the way back out uh, to all the projects um, that are associated in the database. You can export the data out, so if you're not interested in looking at it necessarily in a map format, um, you can push it out into a CSV file, which is something that can be opened in uh, Excel, so you can look at all the data columns in that regard as well. Um, another tool that we have built in here is these housing calculations, and these are over in the bottom right-hand corner. And the way that this tool works is that uh, these values will recalculate depending on where you are in the map and what the list is showing. So if you're looking to show the amount of housing that's going to be put in in a given area, you can zoom into that area. It'll show the housing, it'll show the number of affordable units, and then it'll break out the units um, in terms of a single family or, a, or I'm sorry, a one bedroom or a studio or two bedroom by unit type. Um, you can also select the, within the list, if you want to look at one individually, and it'll give you that breakdown of the units as well that are there. Um, in addition to that, there are your standard map tools that you have. So zooming in, zooming out, you can do regular address searches or place name searches that are within the city limits. Um, another standard tool is changing to base maps. So if the gray is not something that you're interested in and you want to look at more data, you can come in here, turn the aerial on, or terrain. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways that you can actually try to visualize the data to get yourself familiar with where you are in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, also on the top, we have a number of um, link or a couple of links. One of it is to the downtown projects that kind of started this off and how we were going to create it, as well as a Pretty simple help that kind of goes through some of the steps that I went through kind of quickly. Um, so if you need to go back in there and refresh how to use the application, you can come into the help at any time. That's about all I plan to show. Be willing to take any questions. Thank you very much. Let me see if council members have questions or comments. Council Member Bruner. <laughs> I want to throw confetti. <laughs> no, it's Yay, great. thank you. Great. This is such a great visual. It's something that I know I've received a lot of inquiries about and also myself having to go from link to site to here to there. It's just all in one spot. And so thank you so much for um, finding a way to put it all together and to have all those filters and to have the map and the visuals, excellent. This is, it, it's almost like, why wasn't this sooner? So um, one last piece is missing from those that are accepting applications. There needs to be a button, because that's really what everyone wants to know as well. How do I apply for that rental? Where do I go? Where can I see the list of all of the, I mean, some are city, some are private developers, and having to go to 10 different websites for rental applications is very cumbersome. So if we're looking at this, I think one more button um, that can take you to the rental application link um, would be super cherry on top. Thank you so much. Other questions or comments? Madam Vice Mayor. I just wanted to thank you guys so much. This is going to help a lot with um, Santa Cruz City Schools long-term planning, and I, I really uh, acknowledge the amount of work that went into this and appreciate you. Thank you. Council Member Brown. I'll add my my thanks, my appreciation, and, and confetti, uh, because this is really an incredible tool. Having just recently gone into, I had a project I was working on and trying to identify all of the housing projects countywide, I can say that 
even before this, Santa Cruz City is much, has, a, has a great um, and very transparent uh, kind of process or, or, or way of presenting those. But you do, you did have to go back and forth and back and forth. And this is just, it's really incredible. And I hope that um, other jurisdictions in our community will be inspired as well. Further. Thank you very, very much. This is a, a step uh, very much not just in the right direction, but into a form of modernity that we need in terms of how we, uh, how we present this data. Ms. Lipscomb, thank you. You folks, thank you very, very much. We appreciate it. Good work. Thank you very much. As I indicated earlier on item two, this will be taken up about four o'clock this afternoon. Uh, we are now on uh, presiding officer announcements. I have none. Statements of disqualification. Anyone wish? Ms. Bruner. Um, Consent agenda item nine, it relates to my employment with downtown association. You will be abstaining, thank you. Thank you. Any other additions or deletions to the agenda? Do we have any? Any additions, deletions? Thank you. City attorney report on closed session, sir. Thank you, Mayor Keeley, members of the City Council. Uh, this afternoon at 1.30, the Council met in closed session. Uh, there was one category of business on the closed session agenda, and that was liability claims. The claims are those of claimant Ezekiel Tidmore, claim of Judith Lang, the claim of Justin Lang, and the claim of Deborah Marie Guadian. Council received a report from uh, the City Attorney's Office and the Risk Manager. On those items, they are also listed as item 12 on your consent calendar this afternoon. Thank you, sir. We are on council meeting agenda and calendar. Uh, Ms. Bush, do we have any items there you wish to bring to our attention? I do not, no. We are on the consent agenda. This would be items 17 through, excuse me, items 7 through 19. These will all be taken up in one vote. Uh, you will have an opportunity to comment on any item or to pull an item uh, from the consent agenda. First, let me go to my council colleagues and ask if anyone has a comment, a question, or wishes to pull an agenda, an agenda item. No, I don't believe so. I think you can be recorded as an abstention on number nine. Uh, are there any other questions, comments, pull items off consent? Anyone with us today wish to make a comment on an item on the consent agenda or have the item pulled? Mr. LaBerge, please come forward. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, sir. Chair of CFSC, item 10, the Darwin issue on the consent agenda. We will take that item, uh, item 10. How about we do this rather than comment on it? I think there will be a little bit of give and take here, so we will take it as a separate item. That's great. On the consent, after we take the agenda item and the consent agenda in total, we'll take item 10 up separately. Great, thank you. You're certainly welcome. Anyone else who's with us today wish to have an item on the consent agenda pulled, or do you wish to comment upon it? Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online who would wish to comment on consent? We do. We currently have one person with their hand raised. Let's hear from that person. Good afternoon, person online. Yes, hello. This is Garrett. Hey, as to item 19, I was a little surprised at the $216,000 valuation fee for ASR wells, considering you already approved a $127 million bond down payment, actually over a $250 million bond obligation with the interest, so far, some of which green-lighted this ASR well program. It sure seems like this proof of concept testing should have come before this and before signing up the public to debt. I wonder if the results will be made public with the storage capacity and actual cost estimates of how much it will cost to pump water in and then reclaim with what quality, then to sell this water at what price to uh, Santa Cruz per CCF. Recall I sent you a starter pack of dozens of questions you should have asked but didn't about the water bond. 
cricket so far, and I don't expect any answers, but it looks here like uh, some of those answers were never available anyway. Uh, we only know bills will be due from what I can only infer to be about a $600 million uh, total bond repayment obligation plus this. As for the sugar tax, hey, why stop at soda? How about cookies, pastries, cakes, candy bars, chocolate, refined sugar itself, enhanced fruit drinks, and any product containing sugar? I do think health education is important, and the current acceptance of a plus size, me being me, fatty, isn't really helpful. Uh, I say that even as a somewhat fat person, but it really is all about portions since sugar isn't exactly a poison. Apparently, then, this is a pleasure tax, a pleasure revenue source. Uh, sugar drinks have been around for centuries, and what, just now the council figured out it is the eighth sin after sloth, although gluttony might figure in this somehow. The question is, where does the money go, and what service are you providing in exchange for what? My guesses are you don't say and nothing. Every dollar you extract doing zip can be acknowledged as an ineffective punishment uh, of some people who do employ moderation. I uh, suspect that Kula Fultiva La Salud people could lose some weight in Fresno if they wanted to without this as an initiative here. I missed the part where Fresno is Santa Cruz. Who is representing who, where? I suspect anyone who cares about this doesn't drink such products is otherwise none of their business and everyone else would rather not pay more for nothing in return. I'm guessing the public tolerance for new extra taxes restricting their freedom is less now that when the economy uh, was cruising in 2018, uh, the last time this came up with low inflation. Chalk this up to uh, a few in the government who think they know best, trying to regulate every aspect of people's lives, claiming a virtuous public protection, while for sure, if nothing else, they're just gorging on the public's pockets, and if the public really wants sugary drinks, they probably will just buy them somewhere else. I don't consume many sugary drinks, but do indulge now and then. And, uh, you know, it, well, uh, I value freedom and occasional enjoyment more than a government who really just wants more of my money, seemingly every meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Phillip. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Having heard all, a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item 10. Move the consent agenda with the exception of 10. Brown, second by the vice mayor. Clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. <clears throat> Brenner? Aye, with the exception of item 9. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Consent agenda is approved with the, uh, with the appropriate notations. We will take up item 10. Uh, this is a, uh, an extension of a loan. And uh, please come forward, Mr. LaBerge. Let me make sure that everyone here understands what we're dealing with. Uh, this is to authorize the city manager to execute any and all loan documents necessary and in a form approved by the city attorney to extend the terms of existing Red Cross funded loan in the amount of $75,000 to CFSC for the property located at 223 Darwin Street for 30 years with 3% simple interest and deferred payments. That is the recommendation of staff. We have heard this item on a previous occasion, and it was directed to come back to us at this meeting. Mr. LaBerge, good afternoon. Great, and thank you, everybody, for providing me an opportunity to speak to this issue. Thank you, Mayor. The word precedent implies a convention established by long practice. That's the definition of the Merriam-Webster Dictionary of Precedent. The unique circumstances of CFSC saving much-needed AIDS housing in Santa Cruz at the city request in 2012 and later seeking the promised loan forgiveness as the opposite of a convention established by long practice. This indeed is a classic one-off situation. CFSC was recruited by the city in 2012 to save the Darwin House, Perlman House project when SCAP could no longer financially support that all-important AIDS housing in Santa Cruz. We at CFSC are a break-even nonprofit established in 1981. We have over 60 units of affordable housing in Santa Cruz County. This is Affordable Housing Month of May, and I'd ask the council to consider 
the plight of nonprofits that are break even nonprofits to provide affordable housing, especially supportive housing for the mentally ill in Santa Cruz. In January 2012, the board minutes of CFSC reflect, and I quote, two debts, $75,000 and $105,000, all of which are forgivable with service rendered, end quote. The two summaries of the loan presented to the CFSC board in 2012 promise forgiveness. And I quote again, repayment of grant forgiven if terms of grant met. The unique circumstances, the very unique circumstances of coming to the city's aid in 2012 to provide support for this precious resource are clearly a unique one-off situation. This does not set a precedent. The 1993 modified promissory note makes clear that the loan and interest can be, get, can be forgiven. In fact, in 1993, the city council sitting in your very same seats authorized forgiveness of that loan. So this is, this is not a precedent. This is a one-off situation where our nonprofit came to the support of the city in a time of need to save precious AIDS housing. The forgiveness comes at no, absolutely no economic cost to the city. However, the promised forgiveness, with that promised forgiveness, CFSC can provide future housing support for necessary needy affordable housing populations in the city of Santa Cruz. So once again, the issue at hand is this authorized forgiveness. Does it set a precedent that puts the city at risk in any way? It costs the city no money. It does not create a precedent. The city attorney sitting to my left can assure the council that it provides no legal precedent. So there's no reason that I could understand, especially in this month of affordable housing, that a nonprofit such as CFSC, which has very little profit margin that provides 60 units of housing in this county, should not have forgiveness that was authorized in 1993. And I'm here to answer any questions as to that issue. Questions, comments by council members? I do have a question. You begged me to answer this question from what you just said. Mr. City Attorney, the gentleman alleged that if I asked you the question of whether it sets a precedent, you would say it does not. Uh, I, th I think he accurately stated that it would not set a legally binding precedent. Thank That's you. That's correct. Thank you. What is the pleasure of the council? Is there a motion on this? Seeing hearing none. I'll make a comment, if I may. Well, you, um, how about a motion? I'll move staff recommendation. There's a motion for staff recommendation. I will There's second. second. There's a second by Ms. Brown. Ms. Kalantari Johnson on your motion. Sure. Um, thank you, Mr. LaBerge, for um, your testimony and providing us with a letter. Um, I, I looked at the letter. I looked at staff recommendation. Um, I further inquired. And, and one thing I was interested in and seeing is why CFSC did not accept the um, condition of um, deed restriction for affordable housing in perpetuity for these properties. And so this is why I've sort of landed in the decision that I have landed um, to support staff recommendation. Um, I understand what you're saying about this would be a one time and it would not set precedent. Um, but I was interested in seeing the acceptance of staff condition of approval of the affordable housing deed restriction, affordable housing perpetuity. I think that's a good question. If I could answer that, the definition of perpetuity um, speak to endless time. In this house, uh, 223 Darwin, the Perlman House, was built in 1947. I think the analogy would be if we're going to leave property to our children or grandchildren, would we leave an asset that's crumbling? And this 1947 house is crumbling. We spent CFSC money to maintain it, but if you imagine an endless time, this house through termites, plumbing, and all the other issues of time will crumble. Would we leave to our children and grandchildren a crumbling asset with increasing debt? In the terms of this loan, the debt will double in 30 years. So it's 150000 now, will be 300000 and then 600000 with a property that's built in 1947. And if I could remind the council, at this moment, we're applying for a $4.5 million home key grant to provide housing for transitional housing for 22 turned out foster kids. So we not only have we provided housing since 1981, we have a commitment for the next 40 years to provide 22 units of housing for 
termed out foster care kids. So we are a trusted companion with the city of Santa Cruz in providing affordable housing. The issue that they raise is a hypothetical of some other nonprofit that may take these assets and run. We're the opposite. Our debt load, for us to continue to provide affordable housing, we can't have a high debt load. This would add to our debt load and would keep us from doing more affordable housing in the future. So I really would ask you to reconsider this vote. We've proven to be a reliable ally. We're providing four and a half million dollars of home key money to provide more housing for termed out foster care kids. Does the city council really have a concern about us staying in the business of providing affordable housing? All we're asking is for the city council to support what the city council promised in 1993, which would put us in a better position to provide, to provide more affordable housing. I think that's a pretty simple request, and we're a pretty good long-term ally of this city and the city council, and I'll leave it at that. I, uh, if I might, did you have further comment, further comment, Ms. Bruner? Thank you, and um, thank you for sharing your comments as well, and this is something that um, I know I gave a good read and and looked through the information and the data, and um, I think for me what the concern is, um, in addition to your comments of affordable housing, applying for grants for future affordable housing, I see this as affordable housing funds now that have been invested in affordable housing that um, we are responsible for ensuring that our affordable housing uh, remains affordable housing. And um, to say that other affordable housing projects in, in the works is enough to replace something like this, um, I, I think it's very, um, you know, given that already the CBDG uh, loan was forgiven over a hundred thousand, and um, I just don't see that being very responsible if we were to forgive this loan. I think from the city staff report, the conditions that have been offered are um, reasonable. And if I could just respond to that, we do have a hundred thousand dollars in ongoing loans that are part of a million dollar loan from Comerica that supports all our supportive housing. So we carry debt on Darwin Street and we're gonna to continue to carry that debt on Darwin Street. And so what we'd like to do is understand too that I understand the city's philosophy presently of not forgiving these loans. But this was a promise made to CFSC when we came to the city's assistance back in 1993. And it made sense then to have forgivability to trusted allies. And we're a trusted, time-tested ally, and we're asking you to provide that forgiveness to us so that we'll have less of a debt load so we can do more supportive housing in the city of Santa Cruz. And I think it's a pretty straightforward request at no cost to the city, even though I do understand the council's concerns. But having been here since 1981, providing probably more homeless housing than any other nonprofit, if you look to Van Ness, to Broadway, to Mission, to Water Street, to Darwin. I don't think there's any other nonprofit that's shown that commitment to supportive housing. And we're just asking the city council to put us in a position so we could provide more affordable housing in this city. Further questions or comments? Uh, Mr. LaBerge, I, I met, you were in on this at the ground floor at the start Correct. of all this. Uh, and uh, when the city and CFSC were negotiating the terms of the agreement. Uh, the city was willing to put in, I'm assuming willingly put in the forgiveness provision. Correct. Was there any argument or debate about that at the time? No, oh, indeed. Um, when we took it over in 2012, the SCAP program had financial problems, so we had to come in and assist the city in SCAP. At that time, there was no question 
to, when we undertook to help save this housing, that forgivi forgivability was a key part of our acceptance. The minutes of January 2012 indicate that our board accepted this liability based on that forgivability. But you didn't, you didn't believe, did you, that it was automatically going to be forgiven since it was an option on the part of the city to do that or not do that? Is no, it was right? clearly in the promissory agreement that it was an option, but in the discussions with us and the notes and the summary that I included in my letter to City Attorney Condotti, it was clear the assumption was if we honored that agreement, if we kept that as quality housing, that that loan would be forgiven. And if you look to the letter I sent to City Attorney Condotti, that was exactly the information contained in the summary and the minutes of 2012. Well, it does seem to me that if the city didn't ever intend to forgive, they shouldn't have put it in as an option. They had a resolution by the city me, council. I'll, it's my turn now. I'm sorry. Uh, that the city uh, didn't intend to ever forgive, then they shouldn't have put it in in the first place. Uh, seems to me that in a direct question to the city attorney. The city attorney said that he did not believe this was precedential in nature if we were to go ahead and forgive the loan. We have a, seems to me, a very long-standing, very trustworthy partner here in you folks, uh, providing some of the most difficult housing to provide in this community. There's no question that you pick your, pick any category of housing and the city of Santa Cruz, and what you'll find is that it is overpriced and uh, uh, only a small amount of it. And so, especially when we get into these challenging situations like the services that are provided inside the facility for which we provided a loan and, and enumerated a forgiveness provision, I think all of that makes good sense. I don't see how in any way the city is disadvantaged materially by forgiving this loan. Uh, and so, uh, unless there is a different motion, I will be voting in opposition to this motion. Further questions or comments? The vice mayor is recognized. So, my understanding, I don't see Bonnie in here. She's available. Okay. And I'm wondering if she could speak to this, to the terms, because Let's put this. Let's put this over until Ms. Lipscomb is here. She's she's on she's online. There she, there she is, Ms. Lipscomb. Good evening. Good afternoon, rather. Good afternoon, Mayor. Um, just um, the the terms that we have before you are similar to what we have with all of our nonprofits, and um, they're actually a little more generous in that we agreed to defer all of the principal and interest payments for thirty years, and to subordinate for any financing that he may have. Um, I did want to go back to a comment that Mr. LaBerge made around the minutes and the city commitment. Um, the letter and the accompanying documents that went with that letter were not city minutes. Um, those were um, between the two entities when they agreed to take over the loan. So there was not a commitment directly from the city um, for forgiveness. And the minutes themselves that are referenced in that letter talk about the potential for forgiveness, but it wasn't from the city. That was not a city document or city minutes. Thank you. And so I would like to say that I am supporting the staff recommendation because although it's in perpetuity, someone that's getting an ADU has to do deed restrictions on their property. There was a time period where we did that. And so I, I'm sorry, you can get loans, you can remodel the property, you're still leaving a property, but you're just agreeing to keep it in, in you know, deed restriction and in, in perpetuity and, and someone that be investing it in the fu future would hopefully, you know, keep that if you're taking the 75,000 and if not in 30 within 30 years in the 30 years you've had it I don't think 75,000 is going to break the bank on a nonprofit um, and so I'm inclined to support the staff recommendation and although I agree with the comments that Mayor Keeley said in regards to your organization I appreciate the good work that you do for the question or comment clerk will call the roll Councilmember Newsom aye Brown aye Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Terry Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? No. Motion passes and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LaBerge. <laughs> Members, we are on item number 20. This is a uh, technology surcharge. This item 
uh, is continued to the meeting of Ju June the 13th, 2023. So anyone who came for that item, that item has been continued. We are now on item 21. Uh, this is an agenda item relative to West Cliff Drive update, including infrastructure, transportation, roadmap development. The, uh, this will be uh, presented by Ms. Schmidt from the city manager's office, accompanied by the planning director, excuse me, the public works director and others. Good afternoon, Ms. Schmidt. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. Laura Schmidt, your assistant city manager. I'm here to introduce the topic. We last visited you at the end of February regarding Westcliff, and um, our tagline is an accessible, a resilient and accessible Westcliff for all. So we're continuing with all of our hearts and might to pursue that with an integrated citywide team, as well as looping in a very uh, educated and um, expert consulting firm in Fairlawn Strategies, and the team is here today to present you an update. So we will kick it off with Public Works, and they'll give us um, some highlights on the infrastructure work they are doing, as well as transportation. They will then hand it over to Michael and Jen from Fairlawn Strategies, and they will give you an update and begin the public comment and feedback on the partial roadmap that is in your agenda packet today. And um, our eyes were a little bit big at the buffet, and it is a partial draft of the roadmap, and we'll be kicking off your feedback today and delivering the um, subsequent portions of the roadmap by the end of August. So just a heads up on that piece. And with that, I will hand it over to Nathan Nguyen, our Public Works Director. Thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Mr. Nguyen, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the Public Council. Um, we have a presentation to share with you. I'm going to start it up right now. How it looks. Are you able to see that, Bonnie? Apologies for that. Oh, fantastic. OK, great. Thank you, guys. Uh, so today, um, I'm here with uh, Matt Stark, our transportation manager, and Nathan Nguyen, public works director. And we're here to give you guys an update uh, with regards to the uh, latest events on Westcliff. Um, a few things that we'll, we'll talk about today is the current approach that we've embarked upon within Public Works. Um, we'll touch on the infrastructure, uh, the, the current status of the, the funding, as well as the design ideas that are being played with. And then we'll close with a transportation update. So we'll talk about the uh, traffic calming measures that are existing, some additional ones that are being proposed, and then we'll, we'll hand it off over to um, Fairline Strategies on the roadmap. Okay. So the first thing we'll kind of talk about is kind of restoring the bluffs and the damages. So um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Public Works has gone out. We've done uh, additional assessments early after the January storms um, and then are continuing to work with um, our, our partners in Caltrans, FEMA, FHWA, and the Coastal Commission on different funding sources. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in the next slide. Um, additionally, uh, we're doing a lot of neighborhood outreach that Matt will go into in a minute, but it's um, Discussing the uh, challenges of the pilot one way, um, you know, the evaluation efforts that are, gonna, that are currently underway and that will continue to happen throughout the summer. So on the infrastructure updates, so I just decided to include this plan view that you can see in front of you right there is, is showing this is a, across 1016 Westcliff. Um, and so this is where um, we sustained a significant amount of damage uh, back in January and where we ended up doing um, uh, in our last update to you guys, where we ended up placing the 250 tons to protect that particular site from uh, sustaining some more damage. Okay, so on this next slide that I have here in front of you, you guys may also recall seeing the slide originally, but we've updated it with a few things. So over the last uh, two to three months here, we've been meeting with uh, FEMA as well as FHWA and Caltrans teams. We've submitted uh, damage assessment forms to those different uh, funding agencies, 
And this map is to really give you guys an update where what you see in blue and in, in the highlighted bubbles, those are the locations that FHWA appears to uh, will likely fund um, those repairs in those locations. And those, that's because those locations actually touch the actual pathway and the roadway of Westcliff. While the bubbles that you see in there in white, that also shows um, riprap that has been displaced along the coast, but that's more for the coastal armoring portion. And so those white locations are what we expect or are hoping that FEMA will fund uh, reimburse us for. And so if you're looking at those five different uh, FHWA locations, you know, the, the estimated damages in those locations is roughly 17 million at this point. While the riprap that was displaced, um, we're looking at about 1.8 million. And that's based off the numbers we got from the uh, riprap that we placed back on 1016 Westcliff in, in early January. Okay, so of those erosion repairs, for those locations, you can see um, we've identified 920, 932, 1016, and 1030 Westcliff. Um, those are the areas at which we were planning to do some type of uh, erosion repair. Originally, we were looking at doing a riprap design, which is placing boulders and stacking them from the larger ones at the bottom with some smaller ones towards the top to help protect the coastline. But as time went on, we were able to work with our consultant team, a structural and geotechnical firm, to propose a new idea, which you see on the left there, highlighted in yellow. That's what we're calling an infill wall. And so that's not necessarily a full seawall. It's really just those specific locations, those four locations along Westcliff um, that stretch uh, you know, anywhere between 10 to maybe 30 or 40 feet, but not necessarily a long stretch um, that's being looked at or being proposed in the uh, Westcliff Adaptation Management Plan. But what the infill wall allows us to do is we can tie into a future seawall should we pursue that avenue as our long-range planning process continues. Um, what else we also found was that it's actually based on, the, again, the estimates that we got from the riprap that was recently placed, that the infill wall actually might be uh, less expensive, potentially 10% in that range. And so it actually could be a benefit in cost, um, in resiliency. Um, and then we also talk about the design, the aesthetic of it. So with regards to a infill wall, there's an opportunity for us to try to sculpt that in a manner that is more um, nature-based. So the funding source I mentioned earlier in these locations uh, that we're looking at is FHWA. Now we're under a tight timeline. If we can essentially get all these repairs done um, by middle of October, there's a potential that we can get a 100% reimbursement. But we're now we're still waiting for FEMA, or I'm sorry, FHWA, to respond to our damage assessment forms. So again, we've had initial contact, we've submitted those forms, and now we're waiting for that process to continue to play out. If we're not able to make that timeline, and it's some uh, repairs happen after October, uh, middle of October, we would be looking at about an 88% uh, match. So we'd have to provide a 10, 12, 10 or 12%, 12% local match for that grant program, which is also still very enticing, but we're all working to see if we can um, accelerate these projects, getting them to come back out here, giving us authorization, approval of these grants, so we can try to get construction going uh, later this summer or fall. So that's, that's roughly uh, the ideal situation, and staff is continuing to, again, work with FHWA on those four locations. Now, the big other location that FHWA is also going to potentially cover here is the Bethany Curve Culvert. So this culvert sustained uh, significant damage you know, during the January storms, but it also had some existing damages, as you can probably see here. The structure is over 100 years old. It's, we feel it's well past its service life. And it's a combination of a culvert and a seawall. Now, for us to evaluate or do an additional assessment of that particular structure, we'd have to do additional demolition and so forth. And we're holding off right now and waiting to see, again, if FHWA will fund this project and potentially betterments here at this location at well, as well. So we're looking at potentially extending the actual uh, culvert seawall uh, approximately you know, 20, maybe 50 feet on each side and raising the actual roadway in elevation. So right now, uh, this actually ends up being a low point on Westcliff. And as you can see from all the years and storm uh, events that uh, we put our catch base in there, things water collects there, but we may be looking at trying to, again, raise elevation maybe one to two feet, but it'd still be the low point on West Cliff, but again, with less um, likeliness for wave action to come up onto the roadway. 
timeline for this is a little more difficult though. So we don't necessarily have uh, engineered plans uh, on Bethany Curve Culvert yet. Uh, ideally, uh, we could potentially get into the in construction this fall um, and try to meet that same timeline that I mentioned to you guys earlier. This one is a bit more challenging without knowing the full extent of the damages. We do know, again, that, that the wall is cracked, it's rotated, the storm drain system is disconnected, there is um, silt and sloughing behind the wall itself, and so we're still not opening it uh, back open for uh, vehicle traffic for the public. But uh, ideally, we could get into this later this fall. And with that, I'll pass it off to uh, Matt Starkey. Great. Thank you, Nathan. All right, so uh, with all these uh, infrastructure challenges, we've also been trying to manage uh, the traffic flow uh, through West Cliff, and I'll give you guys an update on that. So here's a, uh, an image here showing our pilot area where we're working. Um, focus there in the middle in gray is our main study area between Almar, Delaware, and Columbia. Uh, but we're also zooming out a little bit to just see how this, this impact works in the whole neighborhood. We've really heard a lot about that um, from the community. Uh, shown on the screen uh, with the dots and the lines is just an idea of all the different pieces of data that we're pulling together. We're doing traffic counts and we're using historic data to really inform um, inform this work that we are pursuing. We kind of have two uh, situations out on West Cliff. I know we have a lot of conversation about two-way, one-way, and, and how we want to use the roadway. Um, but right now, we're really constrained by this bridge being closed. And that's really leading to a lot of, a lot of our challenges. Uh, so at the bridge closure at Bethany Curve, uh, we have no vehicle access. And because of that, uh, we see cars uh, going up Woodrow, up Almar and Delaware, and into the neighborhood to try to get around that closure. At the same time, uh, also between Woodrow and Columbia, we have uh, one-way traffic uh, where we've provided an on-street uh, separated bike lane, and, and that's due to the, um, the different erosion sites. So with this, we kind of have, we have two different situations that are kind of going on uh, out there, and we're trying to, to see what we can learn from them to help uh, you know, inform changes to this pilot um, and also uh, inform sort of the long-term roadmap thinking that we have uh, going on as well. So with the um, with this in place, uh, we're doing a couple levels of traffic analysis to, to see what we can learn from this pilot. Um, shown here on the screen is um, what we're doing right on the ground. We're doing some uh, traffic counts. Uh, we collected counts back in February, uh, and we had counts out uh, last week, and then we'll be counting uh, on Memorial Day weekend to see what sort of peak traffic is like out there. Um, and then after that, we're going to look at uh, sort of a broader picture of travel patterns, which I'll share on the next slide. Um, but from this level of traffic analysis, we can really start to see patterns emerge in the real immediate area, and the really interesting one here to me is on Almar and Woodrow, shown in these graphs, is we're seeing a real... Um, imbalance in the directional traffic where there's a lot more northbound traffic, so people leaving West Cliff, uh, which is actually a really different pattern from what we saw in West Cliff before the storms. We saw a lot of more even eastbound, westbound traffic. So this is starting to tell us is people are changing their travel patterns um, because of this. I think that it might be a really obvious statement, but I think it's, it's really interesting that people are adapting to this change uh, in a new way. The other piece of information that we're, um, we're starting to look at is um, data, like big data or location-based service data. Um, this is gonna help us look at sort of that bigger picture of how travel patterns are changing uh, in the area. Um, so what we're seeing here on the screen is an example of that with um, showing where people came from to West Cliff um, in 2022 compared to 2023. I think one thing that really stuck out to me is there's a we can see a bit of a change in how people maybe came from the UCSC area down to West Cliff. There seems like there's less people doing that in 2023. Um, and, you know, we continue to see a real big concentration of usage from people right in the neighborhood, shown by that big blue dot there in the middle. Um, but we also see how many people come from different neighborhoods in uh, Santa Cruz and, and the county to come enjoy this um, resource that we have. So these sort of patterns that we can find from uh, big data, something we're going to keep looking into to really try to understand more about how people are using uh, this area. The other sort of element to the travel pattern analysis we continue to work on is um, 
traffic calming. Uh, we've heard a lot um, from the impacted residents in the area about the changes that these travel patterns have had in their neighborhood, and it's something we're um, looking to keep working on as we refine the pilot. Uh, we've started to sort of test this process out here with um, uh, some neighbors on Oxford, and this is a sort of an evaluation process that we're gonna refine more and bring back in August, um, where we can really provide a, what we think are a menu of traffic calming options we can do in the area, how we can have a neighborhood identify that they want them, uh, and then have us evaluate and prioritize them. Because we do get a lot of requests, but we have limited resources to install them. Uh, and then we'll work with the neighbor to confirm they want these, and um, then work on implementation. And this is, this is really kind of a model from how we do our uh, residential parking permit program. So more, more to come on this, this process. I think the, one of the major things we've been doing is outreach events. Uh, we've had a lot of great uh, garage meetings uh, or backyard meetings with people to learn more about the challenges. Uh, and then we'll have a lot more of these coming. We want to hear from people out, out on the streets. So you can come find uh, us on Westcliff or at the Wharf Summer Concert Series to, to talk more about um, what's going on on Westcliff. And uh, so here's, I think, what we're leaving with our next steps in the transportation element here. We're going to continue our public engagement uh, through July. Uh, work on refining this uh, traffic analysis from the data we've collected. Hopefully, create some real uh, findings from that in July as well. Uh, refine that traffic calming approach that we talked about and identify which tools uh, we'll need to mitigate these diversions that we're seeing. And then compile all those three items into um, how we will refine the pilot area. Um, and we'll submit those findings, uh, hopefully in August, uh, to Council. And with that, well, I think we're going to pass it over to uh, Fairlawn Consulting Group. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council. Pleasure to be here today to talk a little bit about the uh, preliminary draft roadmap. As Laura introduced, um, this is a work in process, so please view our uh, both presentation and the materials that you received earlier from that perspective. You gonna, are you going to end up? Okay, cool. Then I will use the clicker here effectively. Um, so I'm Michael McCormick. I'm the president of Fairlawn Strategies. Uh, honored to, to be supporting the city in this work. Uh, we uh, operate in this gray space between nonprofits, uh, public agencies, and um, the consulting space. So we, we uh, operate in a pretty unique place uh, as a partner to communities and a lot of different um, structural aspects of how we operate. Um, I think this project is, is really unique in that there's a, a lot of that context that we're bringing together here. And so we have a stellar team supporting this project, including Beth Gibbons, who's our national resilience lead, uh, connected deeply into our friends in Washington, D.C. Um, Jen, uh, Jen McKenzie, who's with us today, who is our quant, <laughs> I guess you would say, uh, really helping to do detailed dives on the data and information that's out there. And then our uh, wonderful uh, fellow from Middlebury Institute, uh, Pratima Rosen, um, so, uh, without further ado, whoops, that's the wrong clicker. This is the clicker. We will click <laughs> a direction. You'll click for me. How's that sound? <laughs> that's great. It'll be a partnership. Um, so we have three primary objectives in our uh, support functions. One is city engagement, recovery, uh, program scoping. So these first two items we uh, really focused in on in the first couple of months of working with the city. We've been on board since February to help connect resources and submit proposals that you'll hear about in a little bit. Um, but there's also a regulatory uh, funder and interagency support role that we're providing as well. Relationship building, connecting, connecting folks, and building collaborative constructs for the recovery process and the longer term resilience discussion. And the third piece, which you're hearing about in a little bit more detail today, is the Westcliff uh, alignment roadmap. And this is a, a core part of this because it's rolling up a lot of these conversations that we've had over the past few months into a more formal discussion of uh, how the city can move forward more effectively in the future and more efficiently when things do affect Westcliff and other parts of the community. Um, so uh, purpose of the roadmap, you know, very uh, briefly, we've got the, um, you know, the story of the Westcliff as a resource for the community and as a public amenity accessible to all. Right, this is framed directly in the document as it is now. So we'll ask some questions about this afterwards as well. 
Um, through the document, uh, the work's gonna align priorities and timelines from existing plans, including the City of Santa Cruz Mark Parks Master Plan, the Westcliff Adaptation and Management Plan, the Active Transportation Plan, the Local Coastal Program, and other plans and documents. And the roadmap is really gonna allow the city to streamline decision-making to focus the city's limited resources on things, um, uh, projects uh, and implementation efforts that are highest priority in that moment, but also with that longer term vision in mind um, and maintaining consistency with the greater goals and that vision for uh, a resilient Westcliff. So rather than a static document, this is being built as a document that can help guide decision making by the city uh, longer term and is intended to be updated pretty regularly as the dynamic coast changes. So we'll talk about that in a second too. So if we go to the next, uh, next slide here. So this is the starting point, right? Table of contents, <laughs> this is where we have to start our work. Uh, and there's some critical uh, pieces of this that we'll talk about uh, structurally um, as we move forward. So the next slide, please. One of the things that we've done is we've uh, started with uh, support of the city is look across the various different documents that apply to Westcliff. There's about 38 that we've pulled out. We've dove, dove deeply into 30 of them to identify the various different projects, policies, and programs that apply to Westcliff, acknowledging the city is unable to implement all of them concurrently at the same time with the same priority with the limited funding and resources you have, and acknowledging the, the post-disaster dynamic has changed the calculus on which of those projects may more be more important than others. Um, so we're looking at the, uh, the policies that connect to those projects and then the potential triggers and thresholds that we can use now to help prioritize uh, per particular policies and projects and in the future when something like this happens again and acknowledging in a dynamic coast these types of instances will happen and uh, they'll continue to happen as climate change continues. Um, and the uh, objective is to be as prepared as possible for when they do occur in the future. So next slide. So the, there's a, a couple of important um, three legs to the stool, as we like to say, in the sustainability space, um, looking at prioritizing Westcliff policies and projects while also concurrently engaging uh, the public and aligning the longer-term vision of Westcliff, and then helping to coordinate across the, the City of Santa Cruz departments on the various different programs and plans that are going through the update cycle, that are going through the regulatory process, going through funding consideration discussions, and making sure that there's a shared understanding of what some of the priorities are longer term. This is all being done, if you go to the next slide, in the context of the dynamic coast, acknowledging we have a lot of different priorities to balance along the coast, including the recovery dynamic, but also the resources that come from recovery opportunities, uh, coastal management, economic resilience, transportation and mobility, park space as a community asset, and then uh, planning process as well. Um, as a next slide. And the uh, one of the longer term dynamic um, coast considerations, and you've heard plenty about triggers and thresholds as a part of the Westcliff Adaptation and Management Plan, is longer term, we uh, need to have clear signals about when policies and programs might need to be implemented or changed or funded. Uh, so reassessing these triggers, triggers and thresholds in context to the current dynamic that we're in a post-disaster recovery effort um, and also in consideration of the Coastal Commission's desire to see these as part of the local, local coastal program uh, update. Next slide. So I won't go through all of these, but there are a lot of projects that are applying in this current period of post-disaster recovery, um, both things that have been long, longer running aspects, uh, and then others that have uh, are clear opportunities related to the post-disaster recovery dynamic um, Nathan and Matt talked a little bit about uh, some of the projects, the very near-term recovery projects that should hopefully uh, provide functionality and access back to Westcliff. But there's also longer-term considerations that need to start now in order for those projects to get approved over in the coming uh, couple of years. Next up. <clears throat> so uh, next slide, please. So in this uh, consideration process, we also have uh, methods for prioritizing projects we're following in the roadmap process, including um, 
you know, after three years, uh, how these projects should be prioritized, including uh, regulatory funding and adopted policy dynamics, right? The city council has made decisions around specific policies on Westcliff. We need to acknowledge that moving forward, but also acknowledge that there's uh, opportunities for funding and resources to come from our federal and state partners if we uh, reorient or reprioritize certain projects and programs to get funded now. Um, and so that's certainly part of the dynamic whether policies and projects contribute to the long-term vision of Westcliff, and this is a big part of this, there are all of these really significant documents that apply to this long-term vision of Westcliff that are oftentimes captured in a silo. So one of the things we're looking at doing is really weaving these visions together into a cohesive vision of Westcliff that staff can support, the council can support, the community can support, um, and it makes a very clear uh, priority around what the community is working towards. Uh, we have the emergency dynamic and then uh, the time frames that have been outlined in prior documents that related to Westcliff, including the 15 up to 15, the 15 to 30 years and 30 years plus. Uh, these, are, um, uh, these are time frames that uh, the reality of the city council, right, you're looking at financing, financials, the capital improvement program, and how you're going to deploy your own resources in connection to the resources that are available coming from external entities. So really looking at those time frames in context of the funding that's available both inside the city and long-term in the city too, um, and outside the city as well. So long-term projects, they may require prioritization now. You know, for example, um, there's organizations and communities around the state that have chosen to move right of way. Not saying that's gonna be the case here, but that's not a one-year process. That's a 10 to 20 year process. And if that were to be a part of the dynamic, You'd want to start that now if you wanted to see something significant occur right away, utility right away, any type of uh, organiza uh, organizational change that requires multi-jurisdictional partnerships and decision making um, takes a very long time. Uh, and then leveraging triggers to make sure that the policy dynamic that's in place uh, in the moment is responsive to the actual environmental conditions on the ground. And that is a, a, a very uh, challenging uh, component of living on a dynamic coast, right? Uh, the coast changes, weather systems impact our coast, <laughs> and our policies also need to keep up with some of those changes to make sure we're reflecting the reality on the ground. Next slide. And uh, of course, uh, right now is a really interesting point in uh, Santa Cruz history. You all have multiple uh, policy and program documents taking place uh, right now, including the capital improvement program, an update to the local hazard mitigation plan, the emergency coastal development permit responding to the storms of December and January and February now, and a local coastal program amendment. And these are all being done concurrently with the roadmap process. So when we talk about the need to kind of bring, bring a unifying vision together across multiple documents, this is one of the things we're talking about is making sure that these documents talk to each other through the vision that the roadmap is, is helping to establish. Next slide. So how does the city coordinate, right? This isn't a small issue, and I think that sometimes there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes, and um, it's important to recognize that there are, per the prior slide and, and Nathan and Matt's presentation, there are a lot of projects happening concurrently out there right now, and there needed to be strong coordination internally at the city. So in addition to the uh, ongoing community conversations, there's also a 16-person uh, working group at the city, led, led out of the city manager's office, to make sure the different departments are working together and not against each other. And um, that's a really powerful vehicle to move initiatives forward. And each of them have particular roles to play in coordinating with external agencies at the state and federal level. The, there's a pending grant application to the Silver Jackets, which is a inter, uh, state and federal interagency task force basically designated to do emergency response and tackle vexing issues at the community level. So we've worked with the Army Corps of Engineers, we being the Royal We of uh, City Staff and the consultant team have worked with uh, US Army Corps of Engineers, DWR and the other state and federal partners to put in an application to have their assistance in helping us think through what are these next steps, what are the state and federal resources that are gonna be available, available now, available in the future, that we can bring into the community to think through what these next steps are. And that's tied to, but somewhat independent, they might write independent of each other, is a technical assistance through the federal resource marketplace. And so that would be a matchmaking process where the state and federal uh, friends that are involved in Silver Jackets 
would be helping us to connect directly to resources uh, that are available now. And so the decisions on those two projects won't take place until the next fiscal year in the federal government. So that'll be in August, likely that we'll hear July or August. We're really excited about it. The, the indications are pretty positive. Um, but in, with any application, we always have to you know, consider that there, it may not be approved. So as a backup to that, we've been building direct relationships with each of those state and federal agencies that may be involved in that organization um, through Silver Jackets and uh, hopefully being able to leverage those relationships independently. And then concurrently with that, we're exploring possible interagency partnerships across both the land and ocean side, acknowledging uh, the jurisdiction of the city only goes so far, and some of the solutions to the long-term risks uh, faced on Westcliff also will need to address our federal and state partners that operate in the bay and the ocean. Um, yeah, so next steps. So in May and June, we're looking at incorporating feedback from this council meeting, but also continuing uh, assessing those policy prioritization and funding options, which you have not seen yet. So there is a pretty significant amount of work that you haven't seen yet that's in process. Uh, ongoing federal and state interagency coordination to build that pathway to the resources and funding that uh, we know is available. And then um, a few more uh, uh, outreach meetings and then incorporating feedback from from those meetings into the process and bringing it back in August uh, so that is a an accelerated a, a pace of <laughs> change in this roadmap document so I'd like to hand it over to maybe uh, Matt Huffaker if you wanted to add anything else to that okay he was leaning forward so I just assumed <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you any I can take any questions thank you very much uh, I suspect that we can now ask questions to all of the presenters. Let me ask if there are questions or comments. Vice Mayor is recognized. Thank you for the super comprehensive um, presentation. I really appreciate that. My question, you said something, and I, and I do appreciate how quickly you went through, but I don't know what this is. You said move right away. What does that mean? Is that like utilities and things like that, like moving goals? Right, it's just an example of a policy that would uh, require uh, a number of years of coordination. It wasn't meant to be specific to any particular uh, physical asset on Westcliff. But yes, it, it would be a right of way on uh, sidewalks, utilities, uh, sewer, um, any, anything that would require moving uh, where physical infrastructure is placed that the city or some other entity manages on behalf of the community. Thank you, that was my, yep. that was my question. Other questions? Ms. Contari Johnson. Yeah, thank you for that presentation. Um, this is a question for you, Nathan. Um, let's see, you were talking about the erosion repairs and a milestone timeline of mid-October, but if we don't meet that timeline, something happens with the match, and I wasn't able to track what you were saying. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the question. So, uh, <clears throat> so I believe it's 270 days after the initial uh, disaster was declared we're able to if you're able to reconstruct the damages make the repairs within the, that date that FEMA or FHWA would reimburse those repairs up to 100 percent okay and so we're under this funding timeline based off of when the disaster actually occurred and then we've already submitted all of our forms we're trying to get in line with with both FEMA and FHWA and if we don't meet that 270 day mark it doesn't mean we're not eligible for the funding. It's just that the local match would then be required of about 12, 12 and a half percent in order to still get those uh, disaster grant funds. And um, so I have a follow up to that. So you were saying we were waiting for damage assessment, we we're waiting a response to our damage assessment forms in order to move forward with the repairs. Um, who who is responding to our damage assessment forms? Is, is it FHWA? That's correct. Yeah, we, we have damage assessment forms submitted both with FHWA as well as FEMA, but we are really pushing more on FHWA as those really more are for the roadway and pathway repairs. So it's in their hands for us to meet the 270 days because we're waiting for them to respond so we can move on with it. I'm, I'm just making sure I'm following, okay. Yeah, it's a typical process where we go out and do the assessment. We do this initial damage assessments, IDE forms. We, that kind of sees if we're, uh, the sites kind of initially qualify. And then we have these subsequent follow-up meetings where then we actually kind of have a project manager. A damage assessment form is then done with someone on site. It's submitted, which is the current step that we're at. 
but then we still need to wait from FHWA to actually say, yes, these sites do qualify, which is kind of the current holding pattern that we're in right now. Okay, T two more quick follow-ups. Um, once we get the okay and move forward, how long do we anticipate those erosion repairs will take? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the design right now, the concept design we have for the infill wall project, which is what we're proposing to do, um, is just that at level as a concept design. Mm -hmm. um, we would likely take the project out to bid. We would come back to council uh, for authorization to proceed with the bidding of those projects. But as far as the construction timeline itself, um, I think it would to be dependent on the procurement and the materials as well, but construction actually on site, I would hope would, I don't, maybe four weeks uh, as an estimation at this point, mm -hmm. um, but I'd have to come back uh, to you guys to give you a better update on that. Okay, um, and I'm sure you're doing everything that needs to be done to encourage FHWA to respond to the assessment, but if there's anything more we can do as a council, I don't know. I don't believe so at this time. We've we've been working with Caltrans, our partners uh, at the local assistance level, who help program the funding through FHWA. And so we were instructed to fill out those forms as quickly as we could, and we did, and we got in line. And so now we're waiting for that initial response. But I, I'm happy to try to follow up, and we, we, we do continue to try to follow up with both those agencies, FEMA and FHWA, uh, to keep us in line to make sure that we're hopefully next. Vice Mayor. Sorry, I have a follow-up to her question. Is there a way to like pre-authorize going out to bid, given that we're hearing this? Any way to, for us to expedite things, given the there's been some discussions. I've been talking with the city manager about that and the, about potentially trying to uh, allocate funds. We are as a part of a budget process identifying funds. Um, you'll see that in, in our uh, hearings uh, tomorrow, and then in the budget adoption on June thirteenth. But we are proposing to put. Uh, funds into the West Cliff Stabilization Project as well as create a new project for the Bethany Curve Culvert because that project itself is just so much different than the other infill walls that are being proposed at those other four locations. I guess just my concern is the July recess and so I wouldn't want it to be held up on that. Is that a possibility or no? I appreciate the question, uh, Councilmember Golder. And as Nathan's describing, we're, we are exploring leveraging every opportunity to expedite these projects outside of our traditional, um, somewhat cumbersome at times procurement process for these public works projects. If that did necessitate us scheduling a special meeting, we would, of course, work to do so so that we wouldn't lose uh, the month of July if it came to it. Councilmember Brenner. Thank you. Thank you for the um, presentation, the information. Um, and I think I have a question for whoever can answer um, regarding the outreach and community um, input. I'm also thinking in terms of uh, visitors to the area and how um, we're reaching and communicating with visitors. And I know there's also, earlier we had the presentation regarding beach safety and uh, there was mention of a tower out at Lighthouse and, and really making sure that visitors are safe. But I'm wondering how that's incorporated into this work with, with the West Club. Yeah, right now we've we've heard a lot from people most like directly impacted, I think, by this. So that's why our goal uh, in the next few weeks, uh, Claire and I will be out on West Cliff, uh, actually talking to people who are using it. So I'm assuming that would kind of capture that visitor group. We're going to be out there in an afternoon and on a weekend to try to capture that group. Uh, and then also go out on the wharf uh, during an event um, just to kind of capture the broader community, I think, there. So I think those, those are right now our ideas for how to grab those sort of, you know, broader community. But if there's more ideas, we'd definitely like to hear them. Yeah, I guess, I mean, and that's great. I know um, I was speaking to a couple who was visiting and they come every year to Santa Cruz and one of their favorite spots is West Cliff Drive. I mean, it's really, as mentioned, it's our, it's one of our parks in a sense. It's such a iconic area that people visit and use in different ways. And, um, you know, there's been a huge shift and change in 
in the area and how people are able to use it and and thinking also how we're reaching visitors in letting them know about this and and so they're they're also able to be prepared for alternative ways of transportation as you spoke earlier and also to have opportunity for input hey. Um, I'll add to what Matt Starkey was talking about on the transportation side of it. And also to note that um, the data that our transportation captures and the consulting partner that we're working with captures, is it doesn't care where you're from. So what, if, you, if you're walking on West Cliff or we're capturing you, you could be from anywhere. So we're getting usage and access through that means as well, which is really um, a great mechanism. The other thing is um, we are working with community partners to reach into different parts of our community, whether that's the high schools and the different generations, as well as um, a survey that will be coming out shortly. And I believe Save West Cliff could um, talk to that when they come up during their public comment portion. And then we're also going to be leveraging um, outreach programs that we have in the climate action and sustainability and health and all policies um, pieces where we're going to go out in the summertime, in the August and the fall timeframe, and we'll leverage those outreach conversations as well and include West Cliff as part of them, so those. Thank you. Um, I wonder also organizations like Visit Santa Cruz um, could be helpful in that. And I know Council Member Watkins and I sit on that uh, board. And um, thank you for mentioning the data points and incorporating, for example, peak weekend, um, Memorial Day weekend this weekend. I think that's really important. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Other questions or comments? This would be the opportunity for members of the public to come forward and make comments on this agenda item. Uh, by prior arrangement in a timely manner, Mr. Ramadan has been granted eight minutes to make a presentation on behalf of Save Westcliff. Mr. Ramadan, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. And uh, I wanted to just say thank you to Matt Huffiger, Laura, and the team at Farrell, and they have been doing some yeoman's work here, so appreciate all of your work. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to start out by just saying that um, Hillary's not going to be able to join us today, which is really a bummer. Uh, her mum's really sick all of a sudden, so uh, I'm going to be carrying this uh, solo. So you'll have to just imagine Hillary standing on my shoulder or next to me, okay? Um, but uh, first of all, we want to say we kind of hear the concerns about traffic, like honestly. Um, and we're probably going to hear more about it today. Um, we all live with those traffic issues too. Uh, my wife, Christine, is worried whenever she walks our daughter along the pedestrian path, for example. She's terrified that she's going to get hit by a one-wheeler or any bike, and, which will knock our daughter, Lorena's wheelchair. And it's, these concerns are real. These are, these are deeply personal, and they impact the way that we all access Westcliff. But they're not the problem. They are a ramification of a different problem. We all want access to our beloved and iconic Westcliff. Cars, bikes, pedestrians, scooters, e-bikes, dogs, you name it. We just don't have sufficient face space for our collective commitments. And on January 5th, it all became very real, right? We lost our pedestrian and bike path. We lost half our road. The damage was called, caused by the real problem that we need to focus on. And it's not a problem on land over which the city has jurisdiction. That's not the problem. In fact, it comes from the other side of the high tide line, the ocean side. And to help us all understand this ocean threat that we're facing, we, Save Westcliff and a whole bunch of people, 
put together a coffee table resource book called Westcliff, Beloved and Iconic, a Visual Record. This is the book. Okay. Some of you have seen earlier versions of this when we shared it at the uh, community meeting recently. Bonnie, I'm going to hand this to you as part of the record. Um, and we're submitting it as part of our testimony today. Um, we expect this book to be broadly available in local bookstores and on our website at savewestcliff.com. And in this book, we use historical aerial photographs to help us come to terms with the loss that we have suffered on Westcliff over the last 100 years. It's been substantial. You've got to internalize this. It has been substantial. In the book, we also explain this ocean threat in more detail, backed by some of the greatest scientists of our time. This threat is not sea level rise, although it has a role to play. The threat comes from bomb cyclones, or so-called West Coast hurricanes, powered by atmospheric rivers. When these hurricanes come from the west or the southwest, we're in big trouble. These west storms caused 76% of the damage to Westcliff. And January 5th was one of those storms. So were the storms during the Super El Nino years of 1983-84, and 1997-98. Dr. Gary Griggs from UCSC and Dr. Kurt Stolazi from US Geological Survey have been writing about this threat for decades. Unfortunately, we haven't been listening to him. And if you're paying attention to NOAA and our scientific community right now, you will know that many are expecting a super El Nino for this winter. Sea temperatures in the Pacific right now are the hottest on record ever. Which means more atmospheric rivers, more bomb cyclones, and yes, more of the dreaded west cells. We have to get real about this ocean threat, people. We absolutely have to get real about it. And we're kind of done with the decades of indecision about who owns what and that's, that's, we've got to go past that quick. So today, we are demanding some action. And my notes say here to read our request is former Mayor Hillary Bryant. She's not able to do that, so I'm going to do my very best for Hillary. And this is all council speak, so please stay with me. We are asking council to issue the following directives to staff today. Number one. Instruct staff to move expeditiously to restore access to Westcliff. The three-year plan as circulated as part of today's agenda should be immediately prioritized and activated with external funding. We need a completed plan and active projects by August 2023 to reduce the risk of losing access entirely. We are less concerned about the one-way, two-way debate than we are about the no-way situation. No access is a disaster for the whole community. If you, if you think the traffic in the neighborhood is bad now, wait until there's no access. Please get these emergency res, repairs green-lighted as soon as possible to allow the city to demonstrate that they can execute on these repairs. That's number one. Number two, provide the city manager, Matt Huffaker, and his very capable Laura Schmidt and the entire city staff the direction and permission to work with the community to develop a 50-year roadmap. We've got to get our eyes above the horizon here. We are encouraged by the initial start from the dynamic coast section of the draft that Michael presented. We must have the courage and conviction to collectively reimagine how we access our beloved and iconic Westcliff for generations to come. Please give staff and Farrell on the confidence to take a long-term view to use nature-based solutions to mitigate the West, the West swell threat and expand access and recreation in the Westcliff recreational area. Let's also set an aggressive deadline, a final draft for review by fall of 23, so we don't drift into another decade of indecision. And the final point, number three, perhaps the most important, the city of Santa Cruz cannot do this alone. No matter what you say and do, you can't solve this problem, people. 
So we need to build a holistic solution that covers not only the land side of the equation, but also the ocean side, which is where the threat's coming from. We must have a strong coalition of agencies, nonprofits, and funders to solve this multi-jurisdictional challenge. Please direct staff and Farallon team to actively engage with state and federal interagencies to determine a partner to lead on the ocean side and enable us to work collectively and simultaneously on this effort from both sides, the ocean and the land. Let's have the framework for a coalition plan in front of everybody here by August of this year. Please issue these directives today. Time is running out. Our biggest concern is we're too late. Thank you. Mr. Ramadan, thank you and the other members of Save Westcliff. We, uh, we do miss uh, Ms. Bryant here today on either side of the dais. This would be the opportunity for others who wish to comment to do so. And while you're signing up there, let me ask if, uh, let me ask if, uh, do we have anyone online? Yep. What we're going to do, come on forward, we're going to alternate. Yep. We'll listen to this gentleman, then someone online, then someone with us, then someone online. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Andrea. Um, really uh, resonate a lot of the urgency about um, reimagining Westcliff. I liked a lot of the things that I heard. One thing that I heard is that we just don't have space, and yet we're arguing about one way or two way. And uh, in my mind, uh, to have access for pedestrians, for cyclists, for dogs, for e-bikes, and of course for cars, the one way is the obvious solution, because the uh, cars are the least space efficient, but we can have access for them if we run it but one way. Um, as a resident of the west side, I think that that's really what's going to benefit the community as a whole the most. And um, that's basically my two cents I just wanted to jump in with. Thank you so much for coming here this afternoon. We'll now take someone online. Person online, good afternoon. Hi, I think that's me. My name is Tammy. I also live on the west side on a tiny street called Clark Avenue between Woodrow and Columbus, kind of between West Cliffs and Pelton. So I am right in the impact zone of the traffic. Um, I'm wondering about getting more signage for people, letting them know where it's closed. Because it seems to me that they're not, if somebody's visiting, they're not realizing where exactly Westcliff is closed. So there's a lot of people making illegal U-turns, which is very, very unsafe for pedestrians, bikes, people in cars. Um, it's like all of a sudden people are driving and then they just come up on this and they have nowhere to go and they just make all these crazy U-turns in the middle of the street. Um, so I think that that's my main thing right now is just it's it's it feels very unsafe. Um, in addition, cars are parking on these roads now where they weren't before. Again, adding to the um, the scariness of when people make the U-turns. So it would just be earlier, more signage, more heavier signage, so it stays, so people can't move them. Anyway, I very much appreciate your time. Take care. Well, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. Good afternoon, Mr. Myberg. Good afternoon, Mayor Cayley, Council. Uh, there's thank two you. points that I would like to uh, just suggest to the City Council. One is I would like to continue advocating for a roundabout somewhere before, um, maybe after its speech. Um, it will both enhance a uh, um, the place, um, bring attention to the lighthouse field area, uh, allow cars to return on West Cliff rather than find their way through Clark Street or other neighborhood streets. Um, it will definitely, in the, t in the words of consultants in the past, uh, create a sense of place. Um, so it could be very attractive and small 
and uh, really would enhance uh, both the area plus the traffic flow, allow people to return, especially tourists. Um, they don't have to drive all the way down West Cliff to find their way back. Uh, the second point is really advocacy for uh, building on what uh, El Ramadan spoke about, and that is to engage the state and federal government in this. And I'm sort of wondering whether a delegation has met with John Laird, our state senator, who previously was in charge of natural resources under the Brown administration. Um, I'm sure he has uh, something to uh, deliver. Uh, helpful, at least, and also uh, Congressman Jimmy Panetta. I think they should be drawn into this at this point while it's definitely on everyone's radar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Myberg. Ms. Bush, someone else online? Yes. Good afternoon, person online. Yeah, this is Garrett. Hey, uh, while there certainly has been a horrific rate of erosion over long periods of time near Woodrow Westcliff, the narrative surrounding this still seems to me perhaps it doesn't reflect the basic erosion facts as known, still prioritizes trigger reactions, not proactive actions, values recreation and nature over protecting assets, wants to actively discourage the freedom to travel by car, even if it diverts traffic to side streets, still seems like a managed retreat philosophy, all under the catch-all mantra of climate change. I'll simply state my opinion, opinion once again, Managed retreat is the very last ditch action when no other actions are left that have any benefit. We are not there yet. The vast bulk of erosion at Mitchell's uh, Cove over the last hundred years occurred before armoring. Armoring most certainly has worked well to slow it down. Many studies over decades and the most accurate recent LIDAR studies agree on some basic facts. Over short time spans like a decade, measurements show more than half of all California cliffs show no erosion at all. The other half of cliffs, and in Santa Cruz in particular, also usually show a minor erosion in the range of one to two inches a year. Most of the really serious erosion occurs in very infrequent random ultra-powerful storms. The storms are getting more powerful or frequent. That's not a fact yet, but climate change hysteria. All erosion should be seen as a matter of exceeding breakage thresholds. If sufficiently hardened or if the natural hardness of cliffs is greater than the force of water, there is no erosion, none. Erosion occurs in difficult to predict cycles. If these man-made structures don't last forever, if that was a reason not to build, nothing would ever get built. Save Westcliff seems to make a convincing case that all the area around Woodrow is far more particularly vulnerable to certain kinds of storms, and therefore it merits a much better protection, you know, more so than planned even maybe. Uh, not all cliffs are equal that way or expensive that way, and identification and proactive management of the most vulnerable cliff portions is needed. This is a city mostly consisting of private and public assets, and it's not a nature preserve, no matter how much some people would like it to be. I value people, their needs, and properties above sand. I agree damage can be put back better than before, and Mitchell's Cove seems to demand it, or it will disappear. If the city beyond some other entity paying for it doesn't seem to want to accept uh, protecting assets as part of its mission, I predict this will become a nastier but far too late political conversation if any more assets fall into the sea. I strongly disagree with a draft that includes any design of thresholds that automatically invoke so-called managed retreat, actually a cut and run philosophy, when what I call holding the line is still a viable option. The line for now is the seaward side of West Cliff Path. We have no more inches to give away. What kind of traffic and use is another lesser matter, but I would point out bikes already have access now. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley and council members, uh, Gillian Greenside. Um, I'd like to uh, express very strong support and a shout out to the public works engineers and staff who are working to fix the damage. Frankly, I think all of your resources and support should be in that direction. Uh, the rest, the consultants, the long vision for Westcliff, I find to be a distraction. And I think uh, the message should be, fix the damage. And I was very impressed with the senior engineer who was quoted in the press right at the outset of this uh, disaster, saying that um, the, the armoring, the riprap that had been more recently put in, 
stood up to this storm. Where the damage occurred was riprap from the 90s that had not been maintained. Now, to me, the conclusion there is quite clear. We need to, we, it, it can be maintained and it should be, and I think that should be your energy going forward. Um, uh, and the, the uh, infill wall, etc. I would say as fast as possible. When we get into this more frou-frou area of a long-term vision, I think that there's some uh, <laughs> uh, problems with that approach because it is, um, it, some people feel very strongly about one way, um, others feel very strongly about two-way, and that is just going to come clashing uh, in a public process if you don't focus on the main issue, which is fix the damage, open the roadway. If you then want to have that debate, okay. But I think everybody should be aware that if you make the traffic one way, you can talk, you know, till the cows come home about traffic calming. But the impact on certain areas of the Lower West Side will be dramatic and there will be pushback. And you basically, it's a safety issue. There are three schools that are on the other side of Delaware and children go to those three schools and have to cross Delaware. If traffic gets diverted down Delaware because you've made it one way, you're going to have a real serious safety problem to figure out. So... Um, I just, I'm very impressed with our public works. I think they do a, a sort of a bit of a hidden job. And uh, the comment that when something like this happens again, which seems to be driving a lot of energy, I think that is debatable. I think our public works with funding, with the agencies can repair this in a manner that it won't happen again. That's what I'd like to see you concentrate on. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Greenside. Ms. Bush, someone else online? Good afternoon, person online. Good afternoon, my name is Nancy and I was asked to speak today regarding traffic calming efforts on the streets adjacent to the hard closure of Westcliff Drive at Bethany Creek Greenbelt. Um, I live on Oxford Way and a large uh, group of my neighbors came together in late January to talk with the city about measures that could be undertaken to mitigate and calm the huge increase in number of vehicles, noise, speeding, and other traffic violations on our quiet residential street. The impact of the closure um, of Westcliff Drive has essentially been a life-changing experience for those of us who live on the streets that are close to the closure and one-way pilot between Columbia and Woodrow. Westcliff Drive is an arterial road with a high traffic load and we are feeling this throughout the Lower West Side. Having said that, I wanna say that working with the city's transportation manager, Mark, Matt Starkey, and transportation planner, Claire Galagoli, has been great. Um, I've worked with them directly on mitigation efforts for Oxford, but I've also worked with them and had the opportunity to observe their work with neighboring groups. They've been responsive to neighbors' concerns and appear committed to coming up with solutions that will address the significant traffic issues we're all experiencing. It's been a pleasure to work with them both. Installation of the traffic barriers and accompanying signs on Oxford Way is planned for this week. We are very appreciative and we look forward to an improvement in the traffic situation on our street and eventually the other streets in our neighborhood. Some neighbors have expressed concerns that the barriers as designed will not be robust enough. However, staff is committed to reevaluate the project if necessary. We look forward to continuing our work with the city staff to monitor the pilot program and make adjustments if they are called for. And again, we're very um, appreciative and grateful for the effort that has been undertaken so far. Finally, I want to thank the council members, particularly Vice Mayor Golder and Council Member Kalantari Johnson, who have supported this work and focused staff resources towards traffic calming in the neighbors, I'm sorry, in the neighborhoods directly impacted by the West Cliff Drive closure. There have been significant steps forward, but there's a long way to go to ensure the quality of life for residents on the lower west side. We look forward to your support moving forward as well. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you. 
<clears throat> my name is John Edmonds. I live on West Cliff in the so-called single lane uh, proposed area. Um, and I, I just have two quick suggestions. I'm really directed at Nathan. I appreciate the work you guys are doing. Um, one is that I think you're going to display, if you go to a single lane, you're actually displacing a fair amount of parking. And there's parking spaces, and then also the people could park before or next to the houses. So if you count all of that up, my only suggestion to you is you ask yourself, where's that parking? Where, where should it go? Should it go to the end at Natural Bridges, some other parking lots that are over you know, on the other side uh, near the lighthouse? I, I don't know what the solution for that is, but that's something we're thinking about because it's going to make the given area there more congested when people, you know, tons of people flood into the area and want to park somewhere. The other thing I would suggest to you, um, in terms of uh, lead time and trying to get to this 270-day, you, you know, it's very tight. I would think you'd have to begin construction by the end of August if you're going to be done by mid-October, and that just gives you like a two-week buffer if your timeline's correct. So um, uh, if you're going to have the materials by then, if you're going to have the equipment lined up, you, know, you may need to make deposits. There may be some things the city could decide to do to go ahead and procure those things or put the, put the money down for them before you've actually let the contracts go no. You would have to, you, know, you could explore that. That's one way to try to keep yourself on a schedule and a timeline that, you know, that might work. Um, but I think there are people who are very interested, and you'll get a lot of applause from a lot of the comments that have been made today if you can make progress on those four locations uh, by that time frame. Uh, and it will demonstrate to people that you're, you're actively taking action as opposed to we want to study for this for the next 270 days, which is, I think, is what we've all thought we heard. <laughs> and that would, so that's, that would be great. Those are my two suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, sir, very much. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? Nobody else. No one else online. This would be the last call for anyone who wishes to present testimony or make comments on this item. Seeing and hearing none, the matter is back before the council. The mayor will be glad to entertain a motion. Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I sent the motion to you, Bonnie. And I'll read it. Um, so this is slightly amended from staff's recommendations. A motion to receive an update on citywide Westcliff work, including infrastructure, transportation, and the development of a roadmap for resilient and accessible Westcliff. And kick off community review of the in-process roadmap to collect additional input and provide an updated draft of the res a resilient Westcliff accessible to all roadmap to City Council by end of August 2023 that includes activation of projects listed in the post-disaster projects zero, zero to three years. And the third part, through a multi-agency approach, utilize the policy concepts named in the dynamic coast section of the draft roadmap, including nature-based solutions, to develop the beyond the three years section to include a 50-year plan by end of 2023. Second by the Vice Mayor. You may open on your motion. Great, thank you. Um, I want to first acknowledge and thank Public Works staff and all the departments that have put a tremendous amount of effort and work into getting us to where we are now. And we heard from the public comments, so it just has not gone unnoticed. Um, and we've seen, we've seen the differences in the neighborhoods, we've seen the differences on Westcliff. If you're not there every day, maybe you don't notice it, but we've noticed it. Um, that what you presented to us was really thorough. And my slightly amended motion really integrates what you've put before us in terms of what you're committed to, what you've already started, and um, the path that you know is best to get us to where we need to go. Uh, Vice Mayor Golder and I, um, of course, have, have talked to community members and wanted to really explicitly call out the urgency and timeline that, again, you named, it, named in your presen presentation, but we want it as part of the motion. Um, and the collaboration w that this will take and the multi-jurisdiction and agencies this will take to help us accomplish our goals. Um, let's see, what else did I want to say? I, I just want to recognize that this is a respond to the immediate, which we've been doing and we have to continue to do, and a the holistic picture of what we see before us in the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So um, I'm really happy to, to support the direction that staff has put before us. Um, want to thank you again for the work you've done. And I want to thank the community members who are here today, whether you spoke or not, are online, um, who came to the garage backyard meetings. We went to a few of them. Uh, your voice 
has helped us shape what what you see before you. I mean, we have amazing experts, but it's also important to listen to the experiences of those who are living it and experiencing it every day. Bringing those together is how we have a good product in front of us. So I think with that, I'll just I'll, I'll say thank you to everyone again. And I'm looking forward to hearing back from you all at the end of August to see where we should go next. Thank you. The vice mayor is recognized. Thank you. Um, yeah, Council Member Kalantari Johnson and I have been out at four different backyard meetings and had hundreds of emails, phone calls, conversations with people. And I think the interesting thing about this issue is I think it's one issue in town where I think literally everybody's on the same page from Jillian to Garrett to everybody with opposite political local signs normally wants to fix Westcliff because everybody loves it. And I think at this point in time, there's no need to even discuss one way, two way. I think um, that is something for further uh, debate and discussion and I'm sure there will be someday. But right now, the sense of urgency in the community is real. And I think um, I really want to appreciate everybody that put together that community meeting at London Nelson. When was that? A couple weeks ago. I think it was the most well attended community meeting. It was so efficiently run. Um, that it, it, it allowed for maximum engagement and exchange of information. And I heard a lot of super positive feedback from everybody that attended. Um, and so I, th I, I also want to really thank uh, Claire and Matt Starkey for the direct outreach you've done in neighborhoods and the super responsive um, uh, solutions you've come up with to really unique problems that are happening in specific neighborhoods and locations. And so I have nothing, like Nancy said, nothing but confidence in that in you guys moving forward through this process. Um, I really love that you added the long-term piece in there, although I know you've, you've thought about it. I know it's something that we don't need to think about today, but thinking 50 years into the future and really, and I was looking at the, the vision statement for um, the Army Corps of Engineers, and it says, engineering solutions to our nation's toughest challenges. And so I feel like this is one of those things. And so this is maybe not our nation's toughest challenge, but it is a local tough challenge right now that I think, um, aside from homelessness and housing, is one that we, um, we, we, we have a sense of urgency to unite and address. Um, and I really, I just really want to thank everyone at Save Westcliff, every single member of the public that's reached out to us or done something to support this. And um, I'm super excited to see what you guys start to do moving forward. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Further, Council Member Brown. I'll just quickly say uh, that I, I too support, will support the motion. I appreciate the attention to this longer term vision. I also am, uh, I just, I do wanna say, I'm cognizant of the concerns that Ms. Greensight um, mentioned and I, I do worry about the workload for you all. Um, so I, I did want to just ask if um, the end of this year feels realistic to come back um, uh, with this number three. Um, n not because I, I don't think it's, ur I, mean, I think this is all of it's urgent, and I, but I do want to make sure that the immediate needs are really the priority. I'm not suggesting that you, you're not already clear about that, but I wanted to just see if, um, you know, if this timeline seems doable at your end. I uh, appreciate the sensitivity to that, uh, Council Member Brown, and I'll, I'll jump in, and Laura may have something to add, but we, we're comfortable with that time frame. This is a all hands on deck, full speed ahead, um, both in terms of the immediate actions that are needed, but as well as um, really flushing out a long-term vision for Westcliff, and we're, we're comfortable with that timetable. It does really reflect um, work that's already underway and the, the time frame that we had in, plan, uh, had in mind. And if it may just, I'll just make one last comment, um, <laughs> cause us to have to start diving into those thornier questions on an accelerated timeline as well. Um, and so let's do it. Thanks. <laughs> Council Member Watkins is recognized. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate the questions. I appreciate the motion naturally the work as well as the community input. I guess as we move forward with number three on the, um, on the proposed motion, is if, the, if we could look at that as a template for uh, future planning and consideration, I think 
that area naturally is an area we want to have uh, targeted, and we know that this existential threat of climate change, warming oceans, um, are going to impact other areas. And so as we look at what we're learning through this process, is that something that we can create as a framework that could be applied potentially to other um, issues that may arise or will likely arise moving forward. So it doesn't need to be an answer, but it just may be a consideration as, as we're thinking holistically as a city with our planning. Councilmember Bruner is recognized. Thank you. Um, my question has been asked and uh, regarding the 50-year plan by August 2023. My eyes and December 2023 still to to come up with a 50-year plan by the end of this year seems like a. Um, a goal that would require a lot of capacity and I just um, also am glad to hear that um, it it's it seems doable and realistic and I want to thank Farallon strategies um, you also referenced Westcliff uh, being a public amenity accessible for all and that in your um, work you are pulling from the parks master plan and all the other plans that already has a lot of community input public input and um so thank you for pulling from that um, to create the roadmap. and i think that's a great starting point so um, really we're not starting from scratch ground zero so um, I see you shaking your head. Yes, great. Um, <laughs> um, and also, uh, just thank you for um, laying out your methods for prioritization. Um, I think there's a lot of balancing act, and and thank you, Council Member Watkins, for bringing up. I do. Um, uh, there have been a couple of comments to me about equity and a lot of um, uh, there is a um, kind of perception that West Cliff is where all the six million dollar homes are and therefore that's why it's a city priority and um, and to really think about what we've learned with this area and how it can apply citywide with any other areas and any other urgent um, areas that can be affected in in ways that we are addressing this so i think that's really important to um, just mention and keep in mind um, and uh, the there was uh, i want to just quickly ask there were a couple public comments made so one was about signage and um, Hopefully we can address more signage, better signage, heavier signage was met mentioned um, so that, again, visitors that come to the area and not familiar with street closures and where it's closed um, aren't making unsafe illegal U-turns, as mentioned. Um, so hopefully that can be directed to um, staff to figure out. And um, um, I know that Farallon uh, also uh, mentioned the state and federal um, uh, supports and resources in that whole plan. So um, there was a comment about you know engaging those uh, legislators, uh, Jimmy Panetta, Congressman Jimmy Panetta, Senator John Laird, and I'm sure that's all part of the work that's already underway, but um, just wanted to make sure that was included. So thank you so much for all of your work on this, and I really appreciate appreciate the updates, um, especially since I haven't been to the meetings. And thank you for bringing this book. Um, I hope there's a coffee table version coming soon. Maybe funds can help repair. Um, there's some amazing historical photographs and aerial shots over the years from the 1800s on. So um, this is pretty amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Further on this, a couple of thoughts. One is, uh, I think I'll need a bigger coffee table. <laughs> uh, 
on on point, uh, the vice mayor and I, as the mayor and the city vice mayor and senior administration, we meet on an annual basis with our federal and state legislative delegation. And when we had that meeting with our federal delegation, Congress Member Panetta, this was uh, one of the top three items that we discussed at some length with them. And uh, in a subsequent meeting with Senator Laird and Assembly Member uh, Gail Pellerin, we likewise went over these issues because, of course, they are state and federally funded as we move along in this, made this one of our top three asks as well. Uh, and they were quite receptive and responsive to this. I'm, this is a completely minor issue. I am wondering if the maker of the motion on the second point that you raised, this is a completely minor issue, if you would strike the words kick off and insert the word initiate. Kick off is just a slightly informal term for the serious nature of what we're doing here. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Further questions or comments? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Terry Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and sworded. Thank all of you who are here on this item. We appreciate it. My guess is we're going to get to know you a lot better over the next few months. We are going to do the following. We are going to take a very brief 10-minute recess, very brief 10-minute recess. When we come back, those of you who are here on this city serve item, we will take you up immediately. 10-minute recess. Council is back in session for its May 23rd, 2023 regular meeting. In order to go forward, we will move backwards at this time, and we are going to return to item two. This is a, uh, an opportunity to recognize the outstanding work of CityServe and National Volunteer Week. Uh, we are very blessed in this community to not only have many, many folks who volunteer their time, talent, and money to the good works of volunteer organizations and nonprofits throughout our community, which make it a stronger, healthier, safer, and better community in which to live. Uh, we want to acknowledge the city serve volunteers who give their time and commitment to those in the community in the city of Santa Cruz. And uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, Mr. Shamoun, uh, City Serve Program Coordinator. Welcome you to the microphone. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for all the good work. And I want to say hello to everybody's friend, Karen Delaney, for all of your work for so very many years. And it's great to have you in chambers. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, uh, Council members. My name is John Shimon, and I am the City Serve Program Coordinator with the Volunteer Center of Santa Cruz for the City of Santa Cruz. This program places uh, volunteers within the city, including City Hall, the Mayor's Office, and Parks and Recreation, along with many other departments in the city. Uh, these placements are both uh, short-term, uh, meaning uh, special events, uh, also long-term volunteers that we, uh, we have here at the city. Thank you. Uh, currently, we have placed over 250 volunteers in several departments, giving over 1,300 hours of their time, and this is just from January of this year to our current time, so an amazing job that they do. Uh, the individuals we are honoring today are committed to the improvement and beautification of our community here in Santa Cruz. 
Uh, we thank them for their dedication and willingness to serve the city of Santa Cruz, despite the many challenges that we all have faced recently. Um, thank you, volunteers. I want to say personally, thank you very much, and you are very much appreciated. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce Ms. Karen Delaney, uh, the Execu uh, Executive Director of the Volunteer Center of Santa Cruz County, who will assist Mayor Keeley as they highlight each of the volunteer honorees that are here today. Thank you, everyone. Ms. Delaney, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor. Uh, how, long, how long have you been doing this? Me, personally? Yes. Uh, <laughs> 37 years. I thought it was a minute. I thought it was a <laughs> and, minute. And um, we've had this partnership with the city for 30 years. And, um, you know, Johnny was just saying we had to close down the volunteer programs during COVID. So in the nine months since we've reopened CityServe, we've had over 300 volunteers in regular placements. And Parks and Rec has had over 1,000 volunteers connected to come do outdoor projects. So it is a smart, no, no city has to invest in making sure that volunteers are engaged in their community, but boy, is it a smart move for you. Because not only is every penny you invest returned five times over in the value of labor, but this, these folks are passionate about their cities. They're ambassadors for the good work your staff does. Um, with my geek hat on, Here's what we know about regular volunteering. People who volunteer are healthier, happier, and they live two years longer than people who don't volunteer. And there's particular mental health benefits. Volunteering and getting out and connecting with your community is one of the best ways to overcome isolation. And coming out of COVID, that's an epidemic right now. Businesses who volunteer and encourage their employees to volunteer have lower absentee rates, higher retention rates, and better engagement for their employees. Communities with high volunteer rates, and we are proud to say Santa Cruz has a higher than average volunteer rate for the state of California. Communities with higher volunteer rates have higher voting rates, more donations to um, nonprofits, they have higher property values, and just it's one of those things that knits the community together. And in a time when we're not only trying to deal with really important weighty issues, but we have had some, it's a time where there's a great pulling apart of people in public space, mm -hmm. right? Where people do feel disconnected coming out of COVID, where people, social media and some of the impacts of the way people talk to each other, we feel like we're more at odds. When people meet each other and actually work together towards a common goal, that restores democracy, that restores civic Pride that restores our ability to work on the same team. And like you were saying in the last item, agree. To, sometimes we agree, sometimes we disagree. But these folks in CityServe, more than 1,300 of them so far this year, love their city. And so we are really pleased that you have partnered with us for all these years. And we hope it goes on for another, another 50. Um, we are going to be honoring three people today, one of them is perhaps not here because he's out volunteering right now. I was talking to his partner. <laughs> but um, I believe that the way we're going to do this is the mayor and council members are going to read, and I will hand people their certificates. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Karen. You are an absolute gift in our community, and thank you for the fine work of helping place folks in city government. I think we are stronger and better when that happens. So thank you so much. I believe our first recipient that you're going to acknowledge is Paul Martin, is that right? And if we can have the gentleman come on up. Now listen. Now, now listen to this, uh, Paul Martin. Uh, Paul Martin, Mr. Martin, you're not going to escape that easily. Come over here. Now, hang on just a second. Let me tell Hello, people. Hello, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> let me tell people a little bit about you. So, uh, Paul is engaged in the graffiti vandalization removal project. In other words, uh, that notion that if you can get graffiti removed within about a day of when it goes up, 
uh, the incidents go down. And the gentleman has been doing this for, hold on to your hats, 25 years, <laughs> 20 hours a week, 20,000 volunteer hours in our community. God love you, that is great work and it is something we don't see every day is because of your fine work. We would <laughs> love it if you would make, you would make some remarks. Uh, well, I'll try to keep it all positive here. Uh, I would love to see some consequences for the people that are doing all this, uh, but I, I wouldn't appreciate the town near as much if it was just like it could get if, if it didn't get removed. Uh, I would, like I say, I'm going to try to keep it all positive here. Um, on YouTube, there's a, a, several good videos called Graffiti Downtown Oakland. If you look at these YouTube uh, videos, you'll see what it could be here, and it is depressing up there. But yeah, uh, thank you. Yes, uh, I do it because I don't like graffiti. <laughs> well, and I, I worked with Karen in the county program back when they had a county program, it, uh, and Norm did too. Um, thank you for the recognition. It is. Uh, an ongoing, I just saw four tags on the way here. I want to try to get in the way back. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, very, very much. <laughs> Norm Nelson is also one of the folks we want to, uh, we want to acknowledge. He works alongside Paul. Uh, he gives an hour every Sunday and has accumulated 500 hours of volunteer service, uh, also helping us uh, be as graffiti-free as possible, and that has uh, a wide, wide range of beneficial effects in our community, and uh, we thank the gentleman greatly. Is he here with us today? Not today. Norm is not here, okay. but um, Paul is going to hand deliver. Going to hand it off to him? Okay. <laughs> If it, would help, if it would help him feel welcome, we could all scribble something on it, you know, if you would like us to. Uh, but seriously, thank you so much, and thanks to your buddy for helping out so dug on much. It's just great. Yeah. <laughs> well, we certainly appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Suzette McMillan, I hope, is here. There we go. There she is. Volunteering every week with Collection Management Services in Santa Cruz uh, and uh, at the public library. She participates in ongoing projects such as diagnosing and mending library damaged media items. In addition, she works independently with library vendors, compiling lists of needed media, ordering replacements. She saved the library a tremendous amount of money and time by giving damaged materials a second life instead of immediately discarding them. This is so wonderful of you. I just can't thank you enough. This is terribly kind of you to generate your, gener excuse me, kind and generous of you to donate your time for such a positive cause. Congratulations, and I would invite you to next time. Well, Ms. McMillan, we'll never have a, we'll never forget a word you had to say. Uh, <laughs> we certainly do thank you and, and encourage you to continue your commitment. Ms. Delaney? In closing, we want to say we're looking forward to seeing you out at Volunteer Projects. And I want to have a special thanks to Johnny and Christina Thurston, our volunteer engagement team. Um, this year's been hopping besides restarting these volunteer programs. They have been our point people for community cleanup, so they were the folks who were out with the muck out crews in Paradise Park and down in Pajaro and still managed to be able to engage volunteers here. Um, so we are just really pleased to be able to continue to find a way to connect the community. And my one request, since everybody's having a love fest here, is um, I really appreciate taking the time to thank volunteers. And one of the things we can do, all of you can do, all of us can do, is when we're out in the community speaking, just take a moment wherever you are and have a shout out to the people who are out there, mm -hmm. not just talking about problems, mm -hmm. 
but actually taking action to solve problems. Because there's a lot, 1,300 folks are out there every year working, putting sweat equity into our beloved community. And it's lovely that they have this one day, but I think in terms of repairing that social space and getting a new generation to value that and join, just simply calling them out and having them raise their hands, because they're not the folks who are gonna come up and say a lot during pub. They're probably never gonna come Mm. and say anything to you during their two, three minutes, because instead they're out there making life better for folks. So for those of us who do have a mic, it's a simple thing that we can do at every minute, at every meeting. Hey, who here is a volunteer for whatever? Raise your hand. Thank you. Because there are so many solutions already happening. It's just that the folks who are doing them don't necessarily get the mics. So thank you. Karen Delaney, thank you, and thank all of the volunteers. Thank you to your staff as well. We, we are a better community because of it. Thank you all so very, very much. <laughs> we are now going to move to our 2024 proposed, <laughs> excuse me, oral communication. <laughs> I knew that look. I fight took <laughs> five months, but I know the look now. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Bush. Uh, this would be the opportunity. We're under oral communication. This is the opportunity for anyone to address us on a matter under our jurisdiction, but not on today's agenda. You will have a couple of minutes to do so. Would you like to do so? Come on up. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley and council members. Well, Karen is a hard act to follow, but it's nice to speak to you when we're all on a, a high note. My name is Kate Hindenkamp. I am the Operations Manager at the Community Action Board Immigration Project. And I'm here today to invite you all to celebrate with us Community Action Month, which is in May every year. But first, I want to take a moment just to thank you. I want to thank the council and the county for including CAB's immigration project in the core funding cycle this past year. Thanks to your support, we have been able to launch a new office in the city of Santa Cruz, where we are now providing our full spectrum of free and very low cost immigration legal services, which include uh, DACA renewals, green card renewals, citizenship applications, legal consultations, and family and humanitarian based applications for legal permanent residency. Um, and we're all, we're providing all of those things now in, in the city of Santa Cruz, which we've never been able to do before and no other nonprofit has, has offered that before. Uh, and our site is at 501 Soquel Avenue, just down the hill from Ristorante Italiano. And we're sharing the space with two other longtime CAB programs you may be familiar with, the Rental Assistance Program and also the Day Worker Center, which moved from Live Oak and is now in, in the city. So we're really excited. It's a new hub in North County for CAB, and we're serving residents of the city of Santa Cruz as well as surrounding neighborhoods. Look out later this year for invitation. We'll do an open house at that site, and we would love to have you join us. So now I want to step back to talk about Community Action Month. As I mentioned, all over the country, May is Community Action Month. And you may not be aware that CAB is actually a part of a nationwide network of community action programs. We're in all 50 states and US territories. There's over 1,000 programs in almost every county in the nation. Um, and we're working together, dedicated to eliminating poverty and creating social change. And I'd like to invite you to join us uh, in assisting low-income families to achieve economic security and well-being. And we have a couple of specific asks of you. The first is um, continuing to partner with CAB on initiatives and programs that make a positive impact on those we serve, including low-income farm workers, day workers, youth, seniors, and families. I'd also like to ask you to be a champion for efforts that support greater equity in our community, which I know many of you are. And I just have to do a little shout out to Council Member Watkins to thank you for speaking at my child's graduation from OSS High School today. <laughs> Whee, we did it. <laughs> um, I know that's one way that she supports equity in our community, and it means a lot. 
Um, I, I also invite you to learn more about CAB's programs and to schedule a visit with us, especially at the 501 Soquel site um, to, to see our programs in action. And finally, I'd like to ask you to consider personally donating, volunteering, and spreading the word with your family and friends about the problems of poverty and how CAB is addressing and how all of us are addressing solutions through direct services and social change. And if you'd like to learn more about CAB, our website is cabinc.org. And just want to thank you for your time, your attention, and your partnership. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have someone online. Not yet. We do not have someone online. Good afternoon, sir. Hey, uh, Brad Snyder. Um, uh, I, I have to ask, is this, this public comment on the volunteer uh, item or just no, general? It, this is uh, okay, so yeah, I thought it was normally more at five. Sorry. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, I have something to say. Uh, let's see. Uh, the, uh, uh, the thing I touched on uh, at a former prior meeting about uh, the, uh, the point uh, when, you, when you're going uh, past the river from Main Beach between Seabright and the, that, that, that adjustment of land that, that, you know, people love to walk on, but there's just no safety uh, type railing. Uh, and it's been that way for maybe a decade. I can't, I can't remember the exact year that that, uh, for one reason or another, was taken out. Um, I think a lot of people in the community, if it was discussed, you know, um, real, uh, real directly, uh, you know, like what, what should be done there, I think a lot of people would agree that um, having a safety railing and letting people go down there uh, I just remember this one instance, uh, a, a gentleman, uh, he had uh, crutches because he'd recently like broken a, a bone in his leg or something. And he was just sitting there and he's just looking out over it. And this is back when you could walk out. And, you know, his friend asked him, he's like, what, do you, what do you think you're going to do? I think I'm going to go out to the point. I just thought about it. Like, it's a very healing thing walking out there. And it, it was, a, you know, like, you know, what uh, exactly 29.3 percent of our you know entire economy is based on tourism but like when people come here you know going out there is a really neat interesting cool thing so that's my opinion uh today thank you so much anyone on line no uh, miss brunner under oral communication <laughs> yes okay. there was someone who was unable to uh uh speak at oral communication so i just wanted to convey their message on, on if that's okay please proceed okay um so let's see this is regarding um and maybe i think other there everybody else might have been um contacted as well but there was a concern from a community member regarding a letter to the editor in the good times that she wanted to um, bring up and um, speak to the concern of um, the the anonymous um, hateful speech is is what was written um, and uh, the effect it has in the community and harm it creates for especially the queer and trans community right now where nationwide um, there's huge public safety concerns. And so they wanted to bring that concern to our community and they were um, really, um, uh, upset about that here in the community and the choice that it was published in this way um, without a dialogue or context. And so I wanted to just suggest that the Health and All Policy uh, Committee could discuss that further perhaps or, or um, get back to the community member through that lens. Um, and so, yeah. Thank you. Anyone else under oral communication? We do have someone online. The person online, you are recognized. Yes, yeah, sir. This is Garrett. Uh, I've never thought national problems like homelessness, income inequality, or uh, inflation uh, are the city's mission or its business to solve, especially using methods of full-on socialism. It doesn't take a genius to understand if the city offers outside subsidies compared to neighboring cities or certain kinds of excess nonprofit presences, 
The city will import, as it has, ever-increasing subsidized poverty into the city with lower city revenues. Housing bonds are outrageously expensive to start with because at today's rates, half the cost is interest money going to the banks and not to purchase whatever the bonds were intended for. Also, if either the city or welfare exclusion property tax deadbeat nonprofits buy a private property or in a partnership, it reduces the property tax role, forcing governments to seek more taxes in every way possible to fund the existing services the extra property tax deadbeats get for free. If the county wants to turn Santa Cruz into the designated permanent county dump for homeless and Section 8 welfare, a la Jesse Street methods, uh, that can be a little too much love support depending on how much and where these people come from. The latest housing bond idea of the government to help assist the public in bringing a household bond measure is a mockery of the differences in law regarding initiatives of the public versus that of the legislators to raise taxes for special purposes. It is a sneaky, ethically void end around everything, end around Prop 13, end around a two-third vote requirement, and a rushed front-running evasion of a proposition requiring government reasonableness of taxes and fees. If the massively failed Socialist Measure M and vacant home tax initiatives qualified, so will this. I will save my basic thoughts on the details of a ballot measure for another opportunity to speak, but basically the public needs to get their max money's worth, and there are ways to do it uh, if you are willing to do your part. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Anyone else who's with us? Anyone else online? We've completed with oral communication. We will move to consideration and a presentation of the 2023-24 fiscal year budget. Mr. Hoffaker. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, members of the community. It's my pleasure to briefly kick off uh, the start of our 2024 fiscal year budget briefings over this afternoon and uh, throughout your day tomorrow. So thank you for the time and attention to this important topic. Um, I did want to share that over the past two budget cycles, we've really made a concerted effort to demystify what is now a half billion with a B uh, annual operating budget across all of our funds and departments. Um, and as you all have in front of you, an over 544 page budget document to be exact, uh, through a process of really creating opportunities for um, all employees to uh, have an opportunity to understand our budget, uh, to be part of uh, the budget decision-making process um, and have more regular communications both with um, our employees and members of the community uh, to take a really informed approach to uh, building out uh, what we believe to be a very thoughtful set of recommendations before you uh, this afternoon. So with that, I did want to start by thanking our finance team, our department heads, um, all of our uh, department budget leads. Uh, there were many uh, team members in our organization that were part of building out uh, this comprehensive budget that you have in front of you this evening. You have a slide deck, sorry. It is the CM budget presentation. One moment, please. It'll, it'll be more interesting if there's slides. <laughs> What would we do without Bonnie and Laura? Thank you. <laughs> Good news is we don't have to find out. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so as we all know, uh, the budget was developed with a backdrop of tremendous uncertainty and challenges throughout uh, this past year. We spent quite a bit of time this afternoon talking about uh, the significant damage and toll that the 
Um, accelerating climate change and storm impacts we've had on our community, just as one example. Um, oh, can you go back one slide? Very fine. There you go. Um, we also continue to emerge from uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and move towards a path of recovery. We've been navigating uh, nearly half a century high inflation and the toll that that's had on our economy, uh, along with um, ongoing economic uncertainty as we look at, uh, we look at the horizon. Um, and yet, throughout the process, um, I'm incredibly proud of the way in which our city team, our city council, have been able to, to really step up uh, in the moment and continue to provide critical services to our community uh, throughout these challenges. Next slide. So we don't have time this afternoon to really run through um, all the great work that's, ha that's happened over this past fiscal year, but I did want to take just a moment to highlight um, some of the major efforts that have been underway over the course of this past year. Uh, that includes um, really concerted effort towards uh, modernizing and building out our organizational capacity across all of our departments and moving through our all-in shaping our future um, review of a number of service programs um, with support from our city employees. As I mentioned earlier, moving through storm response and recovery efforts, really having an all hands on deck, full speed ahead uh, work on our West Cliff recreational area, as well as the tremendous amount of work that happened across all of our city departments through the storm events from having our, uh, our water staff repairing water mains uh, to clearing storm drains uh, to continuing uh, to keep our community safe uh, through what was a, a very challenging uh, month and a half of storms. Um, as we've also celebrated um, over this past uh, eight-year arena cycle, uh, Santa Cruz is uh, amongst a very small group of jurisdictions across California. In fact, only 6% of jurisdictions in the state of California that has uh, reached all of our regional housing need allocation targets in every income category and exceeded many of those as well. Uh, so we're excited for this cycle ahead, uh, but certainly worth pausing to celebrate that great work that's underway. Um, and uh, we are entering into a phase of a number of very exciting downtown projects that are underway, including long-range planning efforts with the downtown expa expansion plan, uh, groundbreaking of the La Bahia project, approval of the downtown um, and affordable housing library project uh, approvals, um, and the list goes on and on. So excited to see uh, really um, our, our downtown moving into the future uh, with some very exciting projects. Um, our homelessness response team continues to do tremendous work, uh, really focusing on upstream solutions to homelessness in ways that we've not been able to achieve in the past, uh, implementing our homeless uh, action plan and uh, continuing uh, to connect uh, unhoused individuals in our community with, with services. Um, we also, uh, as part of a hearing just recently with the California Coastal Commission, received approval of the oversized vehicle ordinance and in tandem with that, there's been really important work around standing up safe parking programs. In fact, a model that we hope can be scaled to other parts of the state. Um, great work underway um, on that front. And we continue to um, move forward with implementation with the council's recent approval of the 2030 Climate Action Plan. This year's budget was developed with three lenses, inform, invest, and innovate. Uh, the first acknowledges our commitment to transparency and wanting, wanting to ensure that our staff, community, local businesses, and council understand the budget, how decisions are being made, and have opportunities to weigh in throughout the process. We plan to continue to prioritize and invest in our people, modernize our services, and develop intentional long-range strategies to invest in our infrastructure needs. And lastly, as we approach all of this work, uh, we have a commitment to innovation in the delivery of our services and strategic investments, as well as exploring additional sustainable revenue streams. And I know the council and uh, many of our staff have been engaged in those efforts. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over uh, to Elizabeth Cavill, who's gonna take the next uh, portion of our budget hearings and appreciate uh, the council's time. Ms. Cabell, good Hello. afternoon. Hello. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. 
I'm Elizabeth Cabell, the Finance Director. Um, today, I'd like to start by um, looking at our fiscal year 2024 budget. And as you have the 544-page document, I'll try and condense that into 10 minutes. <laughs> um, and we'll start by reviewing the budget process, the focus and themes that guided development of the budget, and then dive into an examination of the general fund. We'll take a high-level look at, um, well, we'll look, dive in and look in detail at the general fund, um, then take a high-level look at the proposed capital investment program as well as the citywide operating budget, and conclude with looking at what happens, what we're projecting for after fiscal year 24, and then um, take, bring it back to you for comments and any questions. Ms. Campbell, if I might, uh, for purposes of us administering our business here, we are, if I understand it, we are going to go through essentially six items here. The overview, the public comment, economic development and housing, planning, community development, city attorney's office, and homelessness response. Is that correct, sir? That's correct. Okay, ma'am, correct. Okay, my guess is that doesn't get done in 20 minutes. We are at just about 5 o'clock, and for purposes of a nutrition augmentation meeting. Um, so I suspect council members are going to want to have a bite to eat and so that uh, the departments can also plan on when will their presentation be here. Uh, I'm going to guess that not counting the uh, a dinner break, we're going to be here for three or three and a half or so hours. Is that a fair estimate? Anybody have an estimate on that? Laura Schmidt has an estimate. Uh, well, there we go. Ms. Schmidt, good evening. Thank you, Mayor. Before you factor in public comment, we had estimated about 2.5 hours, so you deduct Matt's 10 minutes. So we have about two hours and 20 minutes, along with a nutritional supplemental conversation meeting, uh, should that need to take place. Nutrition augmentation. Nutrition augmentation. Yes. Uh, all right, just government speak. Yes, we, we will do that. How about we do this? Is, would this work for folks? Uh, I don't think there's any way we're going to power through this without a break at all. So let's do this. Let's take your overview, public comment, take a break, come back, hear the four departments. Everybody okay with that? Anybody have an objection to that? Ms. Cavill, good evening. So the budget process began in October and has been a team effort. Representatives from each department met with the finance budget team bi-weekly. The culmination of those meetings is the presentation of the budget book containing not just proposed budgets for each fund and department, but also information about the city, the budget process, goals, accomplishments, performance metrics, and the citywide staffing plan. The final step in the process of budget up is, is budget adoption, which is on the calendar for the first council meeting in June. The focus continues to be on the re-envisioned Santa Cruz recovery plan introduced in February of 2021. The strategy has three primary elements, fiscal sustainability, downtown and business revitalization, and infrastructure. In fiscal year 23, our budget themes were recovery, rebuilding, refocusing. In fiscal year 24, we look to the next steps to inform, invest, and innovate. These themes, along with the focus areas previously mentioned, serve to guide the budget process. Innovation has been especially important this year as we maintain status quo discretionary budgets despite inflationary increases in many supplies and services. Departments were asked to absorb many of these increases to examine their budgets and determine how to do more without additional funding. We are beginning the second phase of our long-range financial planning project, which culminates in the development of our fiscal sustainability plan. A key part of that project is focused on the long-term investment in people and infrastructure to ensure a sustainable future for our community. We have several new elements in the budget this year, and these were presented to the budget team early in the process so that departments had time to review and be involved in the implementation. So specifically, what's new in the fiscal year 24 budget? 
We have, we've implemented a new cost allocation plan that, developed, that replaces the one developed in 2012. The new plan uses various distribution bases, things like agenda items, FTE, work orders, budgets, et cetera, to allocate the costs of central service departments, such as HR, finance, IT, out to the operating departments, such as public works, economic development, um, and water. We've also budgeted vacancy savings across all activities based on a seven-year average. Prior to fiscal year 24, we only included vacancy savings in the general fund budget, and it was not broken out by department or activity. Our new methodology includes all funds, all activities, and provides departments with a more accurate representation of personnel costs. We've seen significant increases in liability and property insurance costs in fiscal year 23, the general fund absorbed 2.3 million of, these, of this increase. In fiscal year 24, our risk division worked with the actuary to allocate these cost increases over all departments and all funds. Finally, we've made a change to the annual $5 million transfer from the general fund to the capital investment program fund for new projects. Because we are in the middle of the development of our long-range financial plan, much of which is focused on addressing the over $350 million in unfunded CIP projects, we decided to pause this transfer for fiscal year 24. This gives us the opportunity to finish our long-range financial plan, to focus on the progress of current projects, formally close out fiscal year 23, and come back to Council at mid-year to request general fund dollars for CIP projects. Now looking specifically at the general fund, revenue is represented in this chart by the blue bars and the expenses are the gold shading in the background there. After a deficit in fiscal year 20, you can see that our revenues exceeded expenses in both 21 and 22. This was due to the receipt of one-time ARPA revenues and a surge in tourism and visitor-related taxes such as sales tax, transient occupancy tax, and admissions tax. The high expenses exp projected for fiscal year 23 are due to $11.2 million of carry forwards from fiscal year 22. This $11.2 million represents resources that are committed through purchase orders or projects and are held in a committed fund balance. Any deficit at the end of fiscal year 23 will be covered by this committed fund balance. We will not have to dip into our reserves. For fiscal year 24, we are proposing a revenue budget of $132.1 million and an expenditure budget of $133.6 million, with a $1.5 million budget deficit to be covered by fund balance. This chart shows revenue from our top tax sources, as well as the category of fees and charges from 2019 through 2000, what we're pr proposing for 2024. After dips in fiscal year 20, as expected, everything has re it's returned to pre-pandemic levels, all of our major revenue sources. For expenditures, this table, there's a, I have a couple of ways of representing the expenditure side of things. This table compares how we expect to end fiscal year 23 with what we are proposing in the fiscal year 24 budget. The category of personnel services shows an 11% increase year over year, which is a result of more accurate budgeting of vacancies, as I mentioned earlier, and increased health, benefit, and pension costs, as well as new contracts with five bargaining units. The large increase in the supplies and services category is due to an accounting change in the recording of cost allocation charges between general fund departments. Prior to fiscal year 24, we only booked cost allocation between funds, such as water, refuse, parking, et cetera, and the general fund. We did not book cost allocation charges between general fund departments because it all netted to zero. We're changing that practice in fiscal year 24 to more accurately reflect the true cost of service for each department. The fiscal year 24 budget reflects $10 million in service revenue to central service departments like finance, HR, IT. Um, and an addition, and $10 million in service expenses to the operating departments. So this all nets out to zero, but it looks like there's an increase on both sides. If you exclude that $10 million that's in there for um, cost allocation charges, you can see that the, the department services and supplies are at a status quo budget of about $33 million. This chart is another way of looking at 
the, um, actually I should probably talk some more about these numbers. Um, for the ca capital outlay, another number that's di different from um, 23 and 24, the capital outlay re represents the carry forward of multi-year projects and many of those commitments or any of them that are not spent in 23 will be carried forward into 24. The most notable difference between fiscal year 23 and the 24 budget is the transfers to the CIP and streets funds. I talked a little bit about the $5 million um, previously, but the $10.4 million that's in fiscal year expected for fiscal year 23 includes $6 million transferred to the CIP fund, $1.1 million to the CIP streets fund, and another $3.3 million in project carry forwards. In fiscal year 24, we only budgeted $2 million. $1 million is going to the CIP fund and $1 million to the CIP streets fund. So that's why there's such a significant difference there. Back to this one. Um, another way of representing or showing the 133.6 million in expenditures, proposed expenditures for 24, this is chart shows it by department. An important part of our fiscal sustainability plan is building up our reserves. The Government Finance Officers Association, or GFOA, recommends having two months operating expenditures or just under 17% in unrestricted reserves. You often hear us talk about fund balance and reserves together, but they really are two separate things. Our fund balance in the operating general fund primarily consists of those committed resources I spoke about earlier, that 11 million of projects and POs that are committed, that have been committed for specific purposes. And, most, and any of those that are not spent will be carried forward into the next year. Our current policy requires that any fund balance above and beyond those commitments be set aside for unforeseen operating needs, basically an operating reserve. Our goal is for this to be 5% of general fund budgeted operating expenditures. Fiscal year 22 was the first year that we ended the year with enough of a surplus to have an operating reserve. And right now that reserve is about 5.26 million. Our stabilization fund holds two reserves, our pension reserve and our emergency stab stabilization reserve. Both reserves have specific purposes. The emergency reserve can be used to sustain general operations in cases of a declared emergency, and the pension reserve is an IRS Section 115 trust that can only be used to cover costs associated with employee pension benefits. The purple line represents our reserve goal which based on the proposed 24 budget is close to 19 million. While the chart seems to indicate that we are over that goal in fiscal years 22 and 23, the pension reserve, that burgundy bar there at the top, is restricted for a specific purpose, so we are still short of having two months expenditures and unrestricted reserves. Our stabilization reserve policy was established in 2013 so as part of the development of our long-range financial plan, we plan to do a comprehensive review of our reserves and we'll be bringing updated policies to you for approval um, in the upcoming year. Our capital investment program for fiscal year 24, we're proposing $132.2 million in projects. Um, at close to $65 million, the enterprise funds, which is the biggest blue bar there, um, and the smaller slide, the smaller pie over there is all the enterprise funds broken out. So that represents about 65 million, almost half of that 132 million. The general CIP fund is another 50 million. And then we have um, two special revenue funds, gas tax and the clean beaches special revenue funds, and our IT and street CIP funds, which are a little bit smaller slices there. The funding sources for these projects are varied. Um, and consists of federal and state, federal, state, and local grants, but also includes Measure D, Successor Agency, FEMA, ADBG, lots of other things. Citywide, our operating budget is 303 million, and as Matt mentioned, with all of this put together, we're getting close to that half a billion dollar mark. Um, the largest operating um, budget is the general fund, followed by all of our, our five enterprise funds. So looking ahead to 2024 and beyond, we expect expenses to continue to exceed revenues and are continuing to look for innovative opportunities and sound investment approaches to ensure the city's vibrancy and stability into the future. 
The Council Ad Hoc Budget and Revenue Committee continues to meet and focus on new revenue opportunities, including ballot measures for 2024. We've engaged a consultant to work on a cost recovery fee study, and we continue to pursue and leverage state and federal funding opportunities. Given our um, increasing expenses, what does the future look like as far as reserves? Um, fiscal years 22, 23, and even going into 24 are pretty stable based on the large influx that we received from ARPA money in 22 we're, and our committed fund balance. Our reserves, we don't project having to dip into them in 23 and even into 24. But as you look at 25, 26, and moving forward, you can see 25, we start to dip into our um, operating reserve. And then 26, we start to draw down our pension reserve. So by 28, both of those reserves, um, as we continue to go, would be depleted. On that not so happy note. Um, <laughs> Thank you for your time, and um, and let me know. I've got the budget team is here as well. If there are any questions or anything else that um, I can clarify. Thank you very much for that presentation. Thanks to the city manager and your team, as well as yours, Ms. Cavill, for putting this budget document together. I think it is very readable, very accessible, even for non-budget folks. And I think that's a for public agencies, that's terribly important to do. Not everyone does that. Not nearly everyone does that. So thank you, Mr. City Manager. Thank you. Questions or comments? Okay. I will... Uh, excuse me. I just have one. Madam Vice Mayor. This, at this, at, this isn't meant to sound rhetorical, but I'm actually asking this. If there's $13 million we're getting from gas tax, do we have a plan for what we'll use if we go all electric for vehicles? to augment that? Or is it something the, so the Finance Committee can think about? It's a challenge. This is actually something, you may know more about this, but this is actually something that the state government is wrestling with quite a bit right now, is how to, uh, essentially, is that reducing what is it they increase and what do they charge you for exactly in that regard? But I suspect the city manager has more information. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the mayor is correct, and I appreciate the question, Councilmember Golder, because it has been a, a eroding uh, revenue base uh, for quite some time now as vehicles become more efficient. Yeah. Uh, and obviously the shift now to, to all, all electric uh, and the ma state mandates that are coming along with it. So there's quite a bit of discussion in Sacramento around what that model could look like in the future as we look at the future of transportation, but something we need to pay attention to, for sure. Ms. Cavill, if you would, I suspect that anything is fair game before we get into departments. So this is the, okay. this is the, the general topic of, of the introduction to the budget. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Take a look at page, uh, what for me anyway is page 45. This would be the property tax trend and the sales tax trend. That, oh. It's, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's page 45 on mine anyway. Right, yes. Are we there? We're there. Very good. Thank you. Uh, the, we, we know a couple of things are true on property taxes. Uh, at an absolute minimum, the revenue we receive should go up 2% every year simply on the Prop 13 principle of going up with the market, but no greater than 2% a year. The second contributing factor to any projection on increase in property taxes, as I understand it, would be reassessments upon resale or new construction. So I'm wondering, uh, this looks as if uh, you are projecting property taxes to come in slightly lower, and uh, that as the former county treasurer, I. I wonder about that and how we would project that. So our property tax actually includes not it includes property tax, but also RPTTF funds that are that come through, as well as secured supplemental and the fees are all encompassed in there. So we did have a decrease in RPTTF, RPTTF, 
of about 200,000. So that's one reason that it went down. There was also projected in 23 a decrease in um, the secured as well and an increase in fees. So, um, so, so not, the, not the big property tax, but yes, there was projected um, to be a decrease in, not significant, I think it was about 100,000. So those, so in other words, our property tax includes more than just the actual property. It's got the secured, the right. unsecured, and the RPTTF and the fees are all in there. Uh, the county's proposed budget on, with regard to property tax um, forecasting looks different than this. So I know they get a different share. I understand that. Um, let me move to sales tax for a second. Uh, again, you're showing sales tax declining very marginally, certainly very marginally. And I'm wondering about that insofar as we're having increased economic activity during the upcoming budget year quite a bit, actually, uh, will come online, I believe. I'm interested in understanding then how we would project sales tax to come in lower. So part of this, we did have actually have a meeting with um, HDLR consultants this morning. And part of that is the way that, um, especially with Amazon and some of the larger um, companies, how the ta sales tax is coming in, there's been some differences in the way that's being reported, some reporting differences. Um, I think also the other reason that we project, we're projecting it to stay pretty stable, at least for the next year or so, is there was that huge spike in 22 as everybody started shopping again. Right. And we definitely don't expect that to continue. That was an anomaly. So I think that what we're really seeing is it to sort of level out. Um, so I don't think that, I mean, we do have, we're, we are projecting a small decrease there, but overall, I think what we're really going to see is that things will be fairly consistent. We're not, I mean, there, there'll be little bumps in the next, um, probably in 25 and 26, but not as, not as much as we saw in 22. That's interesting to me in the following regard. Uh, unlike some communities, even some cities our size, we don't have, uh, for example, a lot of auto dealers uh, where you get a sale and boy, that sales tax is a chunk. You know, we have to sell like, you know, 5,000 trinkets downtown to, you know, get even close. So we're, my point is not to disparage that, it's to say that we are different. Uh, every community is different, but we don't have what I would call large sales tax generators where somebody goes in and makes a purchase and the sales tax is several thousand dollars on it. Much more likely that a high purchase, high end purchase in our community might have a few hundred dollars in sales tax on it. So uh, the reason I raise that is that this notion that people came out of the gate and spent a lot of money, I think that's it's undeniably true. The facts support that. but. For us, which is not a high volume in terms of individual purpose, uh, purchases, we, we have a, a different reliance. We have a very large denominator across which sales tax is spread as opposed to a narrower one but a higher numerator. So I'm wondering if that holds up. So it looks like I'm looking at the projections that we have going out for 24, 25, and 26, and this is by category. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, so as you mentioned, auto is the one that's going up. Construction's gonna be going down. Um, overall, what we're projecting from fiscal year, especially 26 forward, is about a 2.5% increase overall. Um, so I think that, yeah, again, there's, a, there's some ups and downs in the, um, in the categories, but I do think that Overall, it's going to, we're, you know, we're projecting that kind of 2% is going to be that range of, of increase moving forward. I do think, by the way, on your answer to these first two questions, that I, I very much support the idea of being, it's the only conservative bone in my body, but be conservative on your revenue estimates and not being conservative on your expenditure estimates will serve us all well over time. Uh, the utility users tax trend, that uh, does uh, raise the issue of what could possibly result this year, or in the budget year, what could possibly be the result of a, or the cause rather, of a reduction in the utility user's tax? 
And off the top of my head, I don't know. I'd have okay. to get Maybe back, you get to, back to us before the end of hearings tomorrow okay. with, with that. Thank you. Um, the transient occupancy tax trend is also of interest. I know we're bringing on, I believe, four new-ish or remodeled and reopened hotels uh, in the uh, fiscal in the budget year that will start on July 1st, um, and this is a, a fairly small looks looks to me like maybe there's a less than a million dollar maybe 750,000 I'm not sure what it is and 750,000 or so in increased revenue there on TOT. What, what assumptions are you making about those new hotels? So we ha well, the, we have big hotels, um, Cruise and La Bahia coming online 25 and 28. Yes, understood. So, right. um, and then here, I think um, the assumptions are based on the um, the information that we, Economic Development has a consultant that we work with with uh, our long range financial plan, um, based on room rates and the occupancy. And I think a lot of it too is, again, that sort of leveling out from 22. So we had a large increase. We don't expect that, or 20, yeah, going into yeah, 23. Right, right. Um, so we don't expect that um, large leap to continue. So um, I'll have to, I don't know, again, exactly what the number of new rooms is, but that should that is all figured in there. And based on um, what the projections are for travel, average daily roommate, and things like that. Okay. So. Well, I'm not going to argue with their experts, certainly, because I'm not one. Uh, but I will say again, I think this is a conservative TOT estimate given the nature of two of the hotels that came online this year and will be in next year's and they contributed very, very little this fiscal year that we're in right now. But adding them in for next year, uh, they're, in our town, they would be considered somewhat upscale. And so I, I'm interested in that number. And part of this, too, is, is the projections are including the possibility of a recession. So I think that part of what we're, we're looking at is that things may not. Um, and this, you know, again, looking at all the trends that have happened in the past, what we expect to happen in the future, that's sort of some of where those, the, um, those numbers are coming from as well. Let me ask you a quick couple of questions on the fee side of life. Uh, we have, uh, you, you showed a slide of the uh, uh, various uh, enterprise funds that we have in the city, and those have fees associated with largely covering uh, the expenses within those enterprise funds. Is that correct? Exactly. Uh, do we collect 100% of the cost, or do we subsidize any of those enterprise funds with general fund? None of those are subsidized. They're 100 percent covered by fees. Yeah. Thank you. There's no transfer over. Thank you. If you'll bear with me for just one second on this. Thank you. Um, what? Uh, excuse me. What? Uh, what assumptions are you making on our workers' compensation fund? I'd, I have to check with Ross and um, HR okay. on that. So get back to me know. on that one, or not to me. We get back to the council on that. Thank you. Um, during mid-year budget discussions, you were kind enough to agree to provide the council with a. Uh, a statement or a, a report is overstating it. Uh, uh, you provided a document on May the 10th on sales tax. So the context was we were discussing street vendors and they were required to have a business license and a sales tax remittance document. Uh, my recollection is that we require uh, street vendors to display their business license, we do not necessarily require that they display their sales tax uh, document. Um, we'll, we'll visit that later on in these hearings, I suspect. But the issue of how much revenue might be captured if every street vendor was required to actually have 
and remit sales tax, that it would get us about $17,500. It's really a rather de minimis amount. And, and you, you think that that holds up? Based on, the, and as you can see, we've had five that have reported. So kind of based on those numbers. Um, and also it's, they're required to display their seller's permit which in order to get a seller's permit, you have to have a business license and the sell and, and the, um, they're required, I'm sorry, required to display their sidewalk vending permit, which in order to get that, you have to have a business license and a CDTFA seller's permit. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that I, I don't know if 17,500 for every single vendor is, um, is an accurate estimate, but I feel if anything, it's on the high side. And so I think that if we were to, you know, Estimate well, that that's um, yeah. Well, I, or I'm, I'm it, sorry, not seven. It's fifteen. It, it, fifteen thousand two hundred. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> sorry. I'd be so, quite happy if it was seventy yes. thousand per vendor. That would make me. But very, total very revenue. Happy. But I mean, so we're, that's based on saying that each each vendor brings in approximately fifteen thousand dollars. There you go. So that's kind of the which I felt was a little bit, if anything, kind of high. So if we're saying that that would be 17,500 total in sales tax revenue versus the 3,000 that we've received so far. Okay. I have a, thank you for that. I have a question on the city manager. City manager at uh, uh, one of our council meetings, I don't know, probably a month, month and a half ago, we were, the council was doing some work with regard to um, improvements, uh, safety improvements on Laurel Street heading up towards California, as I recall. And uh, I pegged on a, uh, uh, a request, which uh, Mr. Condotti was kind enough to say he thought it was relevant enough we could, uh, we, we could go with it. And that was for the Public Works Department to report back during budget hearings on the 10 most, uh, on the 10 busiest intersections and what could be done to make sure those are as safe as possible. Uh, currently, uh, oftentimes at those, we have folks who are uh, sitting on those and uh, uh, seeking contributions from folks or whatever it might be. It seems wholly unsafe to do that, both for the people on the median as well as uh, people who are other pedestrians as well and folks who are riding bikes, motorcycles, cars, anything else. Uh, I, I have not as yet received that. Will we receive that prior to the public works budget being undertaken here? I uh, appreciate the question, Mayor Keeley, and we do uh, remember the original direction and the intent, intent behind it when it comes to the safety of our medians and intersections. It is something that our transportation team within Public Works uh, would be tasked with. Uh, much of their attention, as we were discussing earlier today, has been um, on Westcliff. Um, so I'll have to circle back with them to, to see whether or not they have uh, that proposal ready as part of this discussion. I don't know that offhand. Um, okay. What would be irrespective of how ready they are, we need a report back. Even, okay. even if it's, it, it, I understand they're very busy. We'll get a report back. If we need more, we can work on that. Yes, there will be a, a report back. Thank you very much. Those conclude my initial comments, generally speaking, on the budget. Councilmember Brown is recognized. Thank you. Um, I just have uh, m m some of my questions about um, projections on next year's revenues for different tax sources were answered. So I just have one question, and it's on it's page 62. Um, I'm just trying to understand the interfund and interagency charges item, which is a significant increase. I, I, I just notice really big changes. Um, and I'm wondering what, like, if we could just get a sense of what that is about. It's because we're going from 5 million to 18 million in interagency and interfund charges. It's the cost allocation. It's, so it's, so you're, you're changing the cost allocation to um, help save, uh, anyway. Okay, yeah, no, no, got no. it, I got it, it. So it's just that it was never recorded before. So what we have is there's an increase on the expense side, but there's a corresponding increase on the revenue side. So it's netting. So you're seeing this large increase here, but there's also a corresponding. Yeah, I so noticed that. And so it's just about the allocations. Oh, yeah, there's not yeah, something yeah. new. Okay, got yeah. it. Other than that, yeah, nothing new. Further initial questions? No? Seeing here, none. Mr. City Manager. 
we, uh, oh, excuse me, microphone. Uh, so what we can do is, uh, are we prepared to take a break at this point? Would we be ready if we, would we be ready to take a break at this point? We could. Are you finished with your initial comments and presentation, Ms. Cavill? Okay. Uh, let me ask if there are folks, we're going to take public comment and then we will take a brief recess for a, a dinner break. Let me ask if there is anyone with us in chambers this evening who would like to make a comment on the proposed 2023-24 fiscal year city budget. Ms. Bush, do we have someone online? Certainly. Good evening. Yeah, hi, this is Garrett. Hey, my, my stomach's grumbling too. Uh, anyway, I question your 64,075 city population data figure. The 22 uh, census data says it's 61,800 as of uh, July 22 with a two year decline. But hey, as with a lot of government numbers, who's double checking or counting? I mentioned because the ratio of the city's headcount growth versus a declining public population growth rate has been going up for a long time. The population peaked here in 2020 and is now in actual decline as long-term growth rates have been declining for decades. Despite the media propaganda telling us the students returning to in-room learning is some real growth. Uh, the real negative population growth rate compares unfavorably and unsustainably to the plus 1.1% headcount rise for the city next year. There is a portion of what the city does that does represent actual work, for example, CIP that creates asset wealth but the number of people buying that is going down, as well as the portion that doesn't produce wealth is going up. I did not see uh, the total city residents' public debt, also yearly payment obligations uh, with a year-over-year -year history. And I think you should start including all the public debt in, in your report, all the city bonds and all the city public utility debt, everything in a chart. Uh, you do know what current and total future bond and utility debt costs are. I'll bet very soon the public debt will have increased over an extra billion dollars or so in just the last few and the next few years. I see even with rising property and sales tax revenue, higher TOT tax, and it would seem an onslaught of fee increases, the general fund will decline once again. Uh, the part where you budgeted starting to fund an effective reserve fund target with months of operating reserve uh, wasn't all that clear to me, uh, but I do congratulate you on not spending every single cent you could have running the general fund dry. I'm not an accountant, but the massive discrepancy between the much lower bottom line of the summary of other projected revenues and compared to other projected expenses doesn't seem like a favorable trend that could continue every year and more so for the general fund. However, you should take this as a compliment. It's better than I expected and not so different than where the city was projected to be now last year. Uh, since annually the other revenue and expenses now dwarf the general fund, I comment here in principle about citizen loyalty. The city should provide what the citizens need, want, and are willing to pay for. But when you take the big outside money who pays, uh, you're really doing what they need, want, and are willing to pay for. Those desires might not be the same. And things like, I don't know, I think the rail trail example comes to mind. Some people mistakenly think the government is the embodiment of the people, but it is not. Instead, it is more like a huge monopoly of force with its own agendas, its own problems, its own desires and wants, its own self-interest, its own narratives and beliefs. And the only check on that beside the courts is the elected representatives who supposedly act as proxy for the people. We know that uh, model is a disaster at the immoral and corrupt federal level with its war hawk neocons, what me worry, debt inflation idiots, climate change, COVID, globalist totalitarians, et cetera. My possible uh, foolish hope is that it could possibly work at the local level. Um, Thank you, Mr. Phillip. Anyone else online? All right. Uh, what we will do at this, excuse me, what we will do at this point is take a break for 30 minutes. Let's call that. We'll be back at 6 o'clock. Stand in recess until 6 p.m.
The Santa Cruz City Council is back in session for its May 23rd, 2023 meeting. We are entertaining a discussion of the 23-24 fiscal year budget. At this point, we are at the departmental budget for the Economic Development and Housing Department. And uh, you can find that at page 105 on the, uh, in the proposed budget. Ms. Lipson, good evening. Good evening, Mayor. Welcome it's to Chambers again. Thank you. It's my pleasure to present the uh, fiscal year 24 um, economic development and housing budget. So I'm gonna first start off by just briefly going through our core services organizational chart, some of our achievements, and then I'll get into the budget. Okay, um, so our core services are business services, um, which you typically expect for economic development, but we also have our housing development um, division, which includes housing development creation, preservation, we also do infrastructure development and asset management and manage all the city's leases, and we also have arts and culture. There's a few things that are a little hard to categorize within these. Um, graffiti removal, um, you can put that into business services, um, also asset management, um, and then our housing successor, which is the successor agency to the redevelopment. Um, basic business services, this of course is the Botanic and Lux opening, which is such a great event. Um, permitting and technical assistance, promotion of small and local businesses, um, collaboration citywide and regional economic development initiatives um, during the pandemic, certainly some really good regional collaboration. Um, connecting businesses with local talent, we like to really promote local, local support of businesses and really connecting among um, different local entrepreneurs, um, with groups like Santa Cruz Works, et cetera. Um, promoting business growth and retention, financing and incentives, beautification and site selection are some of the things that we provide as some of our core business services. On the affordable housing side, um, creation and assistance, partnering on the actual creation of and development of new affordable housing projects, providing key funding um, for projects in the community, and of course, de developing the agreements and the regulatory agreements for housing projects in the community as well. We also focus on affordable housing preservation, which includes monitoring and administering of affordable housing units throughout the city, um, and connecting residents with housing resources and other organizations um, within the community. And then finally, on the uh, housing and community development side, we administer the CDBG and home funds um, around the city. <coughs> Infrastructure development, um, project planning for city-sponsored projects, um, this is the full, the full, you know, sort of scale of things from the beginning of the project management through completion and construction and occupancy of projects. Um, we do quite a bit of grant seeking and funding support. I'll get a little more into that later. And then we do project review and concept consulting for a lot of private projects along the way as well. Uh, on the asset management side, um, master planning for city properties, promoting vitality, um, of economic engines, maintaining city assets. As I mentioned, we do and manage over 80 leases and license agreements across the city. We also um, work on acquisitions and dispositions um, within the city, purchase of opportunity sites, Sky Park. Um, currently, we're working on that, Caltrans, um, a few others I'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, leasing and assets, we have both the former redevelopment agency assets, so Del Mar Theater, you know, some of the east side parking lots, some of the assets that are, uh, you know, a little, a little unusual, um, as well as all of our commercial spaces in our parking garages around, around the city. And then we also have some former redevelopment housing assets as well. Clicker is not wanting to move forward. <laughs> There we go, okay. Arts and culture, um, last one. Uh, public arts program, we have a mural matching grant program. We also have some sponsorships of murals. This, of course, is one of the um, seawalls. Um, we have the graphic traffic signal boxes. That's one of my former favorites. Um, and then the scrap program, Santa Cruz Recycled Art. We also do sponsorships and projects um, with uh, support of community groups um, in public places and promoting um, the art of business, both with the ED side and the business side, and work a lot with Arts Council and other arts organizations in the community. 
Um, this is hard to read at this distance. This is our organizational chart, and um, I'm just so pleased this year that we are fully staffed. This is like the first time in I think maybe a decade that we've been fully staffed, and really just in time. Um, because we have so many projects underway and so many initiatives from our affordable housing projects that we're working on in the downtown um, to a number of major sort of business initiatives and um, you know support um, as we're moving forward with an expansion hopefully which will come before you next month of the downtown district assessment um, we just have a lot of work underway and still doing the pandemic recovery and assisting businesses. So um, it's a really critical time to have a full team, and it's such a great team. I feel like we have, and I've said this so many times before, but it's so true, you know, a small but mighty team. And the whole city team across across the city is is just exceptional, and I feel that, you know, doubly so, of course, about our ED and housing team. And I'll just take this time to acknowledge actually the folks that worked on preparing our budget this year. I have uh, Kathy Mintz, um, who's online to help answer any questions, and um, Jennifer Shelton, who really pulled together a lot of the PowerPoint and a lot of the backup um, this year, as well as Tiffany Lake, um, who is also very familiar with our budget. And so just a, a great team all around, but it really was a whole department effort for all the contributions and accomplishments into this year's budget. We also have, and I should just mention there, our new, our new folks um, are across both our housing division and um, our uh, business support division. So some of you know Josie Buchanan, um, formerly with uh, the Business Council and then went to grad school and now she's back in our department. We're so happy that she's here. Katie Ferraro is also part of our business support team. Emily Watkins on our, on our housing side. Um, and Jennifer Shelton um, on as a management analyst, and then Lindsay Nelson as well as our admin. So that's our full sort of complement that we've had being able to get full to staff this year, which is pretty exciting. And now I want to talk a little bit about our 2023 accomplishments. Um, on our business services side, we developed and implemented um, the uh, Parklet ordinance, and that came before you recently. Was like a a fairly uh, involved process, and I really appreciate the council support and the subcommittee as we went through that. And uh, recently, you also approved our Parkland Incentive Program, so we're really excited to have that application out and to have that program to really offset the cost of getting those public parklets going forward. Um, Midtown Fridays, we've expanded the weekly summer block party. We've made some permanent improvements on the east side parking lot, so we're really excited for that. Um, this year and um, looking forward to that going forward on our downtown pops program our vacant storefront activation We've supported four businesses through short-term leases. We've graduated two businesses into permanent long-term leases and another two graduated from the program So we really have had some success in that um, program um, on the housing uh, development and preservation side uh, we've completed just recently our HUD annual action plan um, we've submitted a pro-housing designation application, so we're waiting to hear back on that, but we do feel like we've scored really well, and we really did that also with the support of the planning department. Um, and then we are just busy um, both administering and coordinating the grants, applying for more grants. Um, we've received in the last sort of 18 months uh, $65.5 million in grants, um, largely to go towards our affordable housing projects in the downtown, and um, secured, um, particularly with... Um, Congressman Panetta's um, support, the $4 million in earmarks between Pack Station North and the library projects. So we're really grateful and appreciative of all the grant support we've had for our housing development. This, of course, is uh, Emily and, and Jessica at our housing kickoff event that was at Cabrillo as part of Affordable Housing Month um, talking about our, our projects. And then we also recently submitted applications for our infill infrastructure grant. Um, and another affordable housing, sustainable community funding for the downtown library affordable um, mixed use project. So we're pretty excited. It's almost like another 45 million outstanding um, that we're waiting to hear back on. Um, on the infrastructure development and asset management side, um, we have secured entitlements for the downtown library affordable housing project. Thank you for, for really helping us move that project forward and sort of getting to a place where we have a lot of the really great sustainable features in that project as well as, as the daycare um, and the library. So that 35,000 does not include some of the elements of the roof deck and some of those in that, in that square footage. Um, Del Mar Theater, we finished a renovation. It was that historic building. It was a 
it was quite an effort. It was more so than we realized initially with some of the wiring um, once we got into, into the building, but that is often the case with historic buildings. But we now have Childish in there as one of our pop-ups, and they're just doing so great. So we're extending that um, downtown. It's such a, such a great store. And then on the wharf, we just recently launched our first pop-up with Humble C, um, which is doing really well. And of course, the uh, revised and recirculated EIR for the wharf. On the arts and culture side, accomplishments, we approved 15 applications through our CARD. This is a city arts and recovery design program, completed three projects, and executed nine sponsorship agreements. We also, with the Arts Commission support, launched three initiatives to activate public spaces um, to promote the creative economy, and that's including, whoops, that's including the Wharf Master Plan. Um, building partnerships, there's a number of really important partnerships on the, in the arts areas and arts organizations. Um, such groups as UCSC performers and nonprofit service providers, uh, Andrew Perchin's project that some of you were involved in, you know, really working with housed and unhoused residents with artists through projects to promote communication. I mean, all of these are so important, and the Arts Commission is really committed and dedicated to working with us and making sure that uh, we are looking throughout with that equity lens throughout the throughout the city, and it's a really great uh, great partnership. Okay, now moving into the budget, a budget overview you can see before you. Um, a couple just notables um, that are just a little bit different this year. The, if you look at the uh, affordable housing trust fund, that 21%, that's largely um, our permanent local housing allocation. That's a relatively new state program. If you actually look at the corresponding line item, um, affordable housing trust fund, you'll see that's 587000 so that's actually fairly small, and some years it's more like 140-ish that we receive from the state. So it's not a sustainable source of long-term affordable housing funding. And so even though it looks like a big part of our operating revenues here, when you put it in context, it's really not very much for all the programs that we administer. Um, we used to have the funding source redevelopment. Um, uh, we had $2.5 million a year um, in the year that it was terminated that um, we've been really effective in, in leveraging grant funds, um, but those aren't sustainable ongoing funding sources, so there is a real need there. Um, budget overview, operating expenses. Okay, this is a little bit, um, it looks a little different this, this year as well, and I, I, I want to explain, explain that. Um, if you look on the right-hand side, um, you'll see the top line housing community development, 15 million. That's because that's actually showing us the expenditures as loans for the grants that were that we received, and we're loaning them into the affordable housing projects, even those that were part of our partners, and we're doing the residual receipt loans because those are typically what you've leveraged for being able to secure state and federal funding. Um, so we have those in our project. It be, then becomes a big part of our budget as we move forward. Also wanted to mention that our um, percent for art funds are not reflected in this. In this, that's roughly two hundred thirty thousand, and um, we don't have the tenant improvement contributions for the wharf. That we take a small percentage of wharf leases to be able to reinvest that in uh, related tenant improvements on the wharf is not reflected in this budget. Um, housing projects, this is just to put this in context of some of the projects on non-CIP that we're working on this year, and you can see um, some of the funding sources for these that um, we've secured. The uh, local housing trust, trust fund or grant applications that we applied for through the state. The affordable housing trust fund is our funding source, um, and that is for housing and LUFIs that, you know, that we collect over time. It's not a reliable funding source. Um, and then home and home um, ARP funds that you can see and how they're allocated to each of those projects. And then our nine non-housing portfolio, um, I wanted to show this because um, these, we only have 380,000 in our CIP budget this year. So most of our funding is funding that's carried over and a good portion of it are bond funds related back to redevelopment for the projects that you see in front of you. We are actually moving forward now that we're fully staffed up and some of the other projects are moving forward. We can move forward on some of the supporting infrastructure. So downtown beautification infrastructure, we have a number of those things moving forward. We have the Ocean Street beautification. We have that survey underway and the, and the banners just went up asking the public to take the survey. So we'll have that up through the end of this month. And we've already had five, received 550 survey responses with some really great things about beautification and safety um, at that intersection. So we're really excited to move to move some of these forward this year. 
Um, funding efforts, oh, I mentioned this earlier. So grants in the pipeline. Um, we just submitted um, last week the state library grant um, for 10 million, the uh, affordable housing sustainable communities grant for 33 million, and a coastal conservancy grant for the wharf for 5 million. We on the right hand side, those are grants that we've received but aren't yet budgeted because we're finalizing those grant agreements. Um, that's another 54 million. Um, Impact on services, um, this is a good problem to have. We have so much underway. Uh, planning has it, the whole city has it. With all of these housing projects, we're really busy. Um, highlighting just uh, the, the, map, the map to show the housing projects. You know, there's over 31 housing projects in various stages of development in the city. You know, with that comes, uh, you know, a pretty considerable workload across the city, across all the departments. So that's something that, it, you know, in effect, it's a good problem to have. Uh, but it does mean that we're very busy. And as we do receive these grant funds to be able to administer the funds and move those projects forward, we may um, do some limited term positions related specifically to those grant funds for those projects in a way to, to make sure that we stay on track on budget with these projects going forward. Um, okay, now briefly, core services and context, um, business services, some of the things that we're doing, particularly in the downtown in the next year, I already mentioned the uh, CRM, the Downtown Management Corporation expansion, we, you, you can see in the lower right hand of expanding east and west to be able to absorb some of the new development to provide those services that the ambassadors provide. Um, and the, both the, uh, you know, beautification, outreach, um, and just really supporting the downtown and the downtown businesses. Um, also, we have the proposed hotel coming up. We have our outdoor dining. There's just a lot of projects that we're doing, some of them still sort of recovering from the pandemic as we transition into permanent parklets going um, next year. Um, development, um, these are just some of the projects that we're working on. The top three are ones that are our city projects, and then we're providing support um, to the other projects in the list. And I, I just would mention that for Riverfront um, Apartments, uh, Anton Pacific, for the Paseo, and for 530 Front Street. Some of the grant funds we have for infrastructure and the IIG grant will help pay for some of the public improvements that are around and be supporting those projects. Here's just a different view of just the amount of different projects that are going forward in the downtown. Um, arts and culture, um, some of the projects we're working on um, through the CARD program, you could see Kathleen Crocetti's Dancing Waters, you can see um, a number of projects on Anthony's Flight on the Stairs, um, the Awakening Nourishing Fires, and of course and through the Arts Master Plan, um, we have one of, the, one of my favorites when you see those sort of umbrals um, that on the right hand side, um, which is the Feast of Flowers by Jenny Ward. So these are all arts projects um, that we're moving forward in the next year. And with that, I'm available to answer any questions that you have. Let me see if there are questions by, excuse me, I thought I heard some. Uh, <laughs> questions by council members? Council Member Bruner. Thank you for that quick summary overview. Um, I think you, you briefly touched on it on the, the art projects and the, the, the budget. What did you say about the budget didn't reflect? I, I missed that part when you were speaking about art, the arts and culture. Maybe I misunderstood. Trying to think back what I said. Um, there are a few things in the budget. Oh, the percent for art pro, uh, projects and the way they're funded. Um, which are to the enterprise funds, but they reflect, didn't sh don't show up in our specific budget pages. Okay. And so 1% on those projects for other departments, projects that go forward are those enterprise funds. So you see the water fund and you'll see, the, you know, the wastewater and you'll see, you know, so those and parking has one as well. So those projects um, are part of their budget at enterprise fund, but we administer those going forward. Got it. Um, and I... Um, also had a question on the kiosk maintenance and um, the proposed uh, increase there. Are you able? It, um, I'm you looking at what? page 111. And if you don't know now, you can come back to that. Looking I'm at just my, wondering I'm looking if, at my if there are any line. projects in the pipeline for those. I know there has been. Well, we periodically do. We I know that we 
have a, a health and safety sort of state requirement for the triple sink. And so as they become vacant, if they don't already have them, we do that. Um, some they often need roof repairs. So as, as they come up and we are transitioning now, we do budget um, what we need to to bring the, the kiosks um, so that they, they're leasable going forward. Great. Right. I think, I think uh, also you may have been speaking about the revenues into the kiosk fund. And during COVID, we suspended the parklet uh, fees that the businesses were paying. And so we're going to see more revenue coming back as we begin to implement them later in the fall. Thanks. Thanks, Kathy. And yeah, just to point that out, when you look at the year end estimate um, for fiscal year 23, so we had a number of vacancies in two of the kiosks. And I, I know Councilmember Bruner, you know this well. Um, and uh, so we have moved forward now in, um, in putting forward basically a new solicitation RFP to refill those kiosks. But during the pandemic, um, just in trying to support and keep our businesses, particularly our kiosk businesses, which are typically um, startup businesses and new restaurants to really help support them, um, we did not collect rent on a lot of those. So this is reflective of the revenue and our projections for what we in a typical year have. Um, which is what we're proposing okay. for next year. That's good to know. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. And um, I, I have to comment on the, the art again and those visuals. And you know they, they say your your budget should reflect your priorities. And you know we have some very serious priorities. A lot of them are um, invisible to um, people. For example, our our water pipes and and <laughs> infrastructure, but for art, it is amazing, and I'm so happy that's um, part of our budget and our priorities as a city because it really supports artists who are often some of the lowest paid um, and struggling <laughs> um, professions, and um, and it just activates our city in such wonderful ways. So. Thank you for having that in your department. And Kathy Mintz, thank you for overseeing all of those programs um, as they come over the next year. I'm just really happy um, to, to see that we are a city that really finds ways, innovative ways to integrate art into everything. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Further questions, Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Thank you for that presentation, uh, Bonnie. I have a question and a comment um, on page 109 where the performance measures are listed. I'm trying to understand how to read the percentage change in downtown retail commercial vacancies, minus 1%. Can you just explain what that's actually saying? So we will have 1% less vacancies. Is that what that's saying? I believe that is what, what that is saying. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I was reading yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, because it could look like it's going in the in a different direction than what we want. But right, this, we will have one percent less vacancies. One percent fewer, and I will say our actual downtown vacancies are really low. Yeah, um, okay. so they were less than three percent. So it's this is actually a big goal to get to to modify that. But I, I think we're there with there's so much activity now and interest in the downtown, mm -hmm. um, even though there are, you know. One, um, one really not notable um, vacancy downtown, and mm -hmm. you know there are there's a lot of activity, and even those that are vacant now have leases, signed leases on them, and they're working on them, many of them. So it's pretty it's a pretty exciting time. Good. Okay, great. And then so to that point, um, the comment request I have is that um, I know there's a lot of work already happening around downtown revitalization and business district revitalization, and I'm glad to see and hear about the budget allocations for downtown alley improvements and Lower Pacific and Pacific Avenue. So I'm wondering if we could add that in the FY 2024 goals. Um, however, is the best way to articulate that, but business district downtown revitalization to sort of capture that, because I know the great work is already happening and will be happening into the new fiscal year. Happy to, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Brown. So, um, <clears throat> Council Member Kalantari Johnson asked my question related to the um, vacancy rate, so thank you for clarifying that. I, um, I'll just, while I have the floor, say it's amazing. Every year I kind of have this wonderful, warm feeling when we get your, um, your overviews and hear from you, and this year 
is no exception. And in particular, I want to call out the amazing work that you all have done to get affordable units um, built, get, you know, get, get in the pipeline and getting built. It's it's an it's just it, uh, you know I, I, it's incredible how, with the limited resources that we have, the small team that you have to be able to leverage all of these funds to bring it together and make these projects happen is just incredible work. So thank you, um, and and everything else as well. Yeah, thank you. And I I just want to acknowledge to our our housing program manager Jessica Dewitt. You know her background. Some of you know she worked for a nonprofit. You know affordable housing, numerous ones before coming to the city. And it's a real asset to have someone who has that experience. And um, it just makes our whole team very cohesive and. Um, and really be able to move these projects forward in a way. So we, and it's interesting because it's not just our housing team, you know, so we have, you know, on some of our projects side, we're moving housing projects forward and mixed use housing projects forward across our development managers as well. But we work across all the disciplines on getting these projects forward, so thank you. Ms. Watkins. Thank you, Mayor. Sure. And yeah, thank you, Bonnie, always, and your team for all the great work that you do. Um, I think my question is in regards to, I don't know how this would be reflected in the budget, but in regards to the warriors and all that they bring in terms of their economic vitality to our downtown, is that something that you can kind of be able to explain in some of the charts or not necessarily? Um, probably not in these budget pages, but I, I can share with you, and one thing that's not reflected here, um, and this goes into our public trust fund, is we receive approximately 350000 um, from the warriors on the pay, pay off of their loan every year. Additionally, we do receive the admissions tax. Um, we have a, um, a $1 per ticket uh, facility use fee that goes as well in, into um, our fund. So just, you know, from those original 2012 agreements, we have, I will say at this point, we've pretty much, they've more than paid off the loan. Um, the $4 million loan that we gave to them originally. And obviously the community benefits far exceed the monetary benefits that we received. But that was a question early on was, oh, we're giving this fund and this loan and we're using public funds and we'll never get that back. And in fact, we have um, more than made up for the original loan that we provided and the, and the uh, businesses that have been able to really support the Warriors and benefit from the Warriors, you know, the specials that they have on game night you know, the activity of people parking in the downtown, you know, walking to the Warriors and hopefully, you know, shopping and, and dining in our downtown has just been real true community benefits. Yeah, agreed. And I, I appreciate you speaking to that. Um, the other thing that was brought up with Elizabeth's presentation was the just sort of fear of recession. And I'm wondering how that might be factored into your budget as well. Yeah, I mean, our budget, you know, we're so much of our budget is non-general fund. You know, it's it's going with grants and many of the projects, um, and some of it is the CDBG funding and some of the home funding. So we're trying to offset as much as we can um, through other non-general fund sources. I think um, as far as you know, recession. I mean, that's more of our focus on sort of the business support side, sure. right? And that goes into some of our programs that we have with National Development Council for financial technical assistance with Small Business Development Center to provide free business consulting into, into the, you know, the community for Santa Cruz businesses and our Grow Santa Cruz Loan Program offering below market loans. So we're really focusing on some of those opportunities as well as like for our parklets, for our restaurants, being able to offset you know, a large portion of those costs of making those permanent parklets. So those are the types of things we focus on on, on that side. Um, okay, thanks. I think that. Great. Thank you. Ms. Lipscomb, on my page 111, top item, homelessness response, fund 6105 mm -hmm. uh, is zeroed out for the upcoming year, and that is a function of what? That was um, specific funding that we had um, provided in our budget as part of the um, American Rescue Plan funding that we had. And so we provided uh, cab rental assistance um, through the pandemic. So that was some specific funding we had for that that we provided as part of the homelessness response. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 
Ocean Street beautification. You elaborate on timing and what those elements might be. Yeah. So we have a survey out right now, and we're you know it's it's early or third week of Mar of May, and I think we'll keep it open um, to the end of May, early June. As I mentioned earlier, we've received over 557 responses as of today, and now that the banners are up, we expect to get even more. And we're asking for feedback on the primarily the intersection, but it's really our gateway. This is funding we put in the budget actually when redevelopment was terminated as one of our bond funds. And at that time, the Ocean Street beautification plan, sort of the, the Ocean Street corridor study was underway, and we knew we really do want to do an investment um, on Ocean Street. We're focused and working with a lot of the surrounding hotels um, right at that entryway on some safety and security measures, but also beautification, including some public art elements. We're working with public works and looking at the median um, and working with the hotels and getting feedback as well as some of the, the residential areas surrounding that. So uh, the survey is up. Um, we can make sure, I believe we have a link on our city website, um, but we can make sure the survey is up. Um, we're getting some great feedback um, from members of the community on what they would like to see there, even the sort of style of some of the improvements in the beautification. The, uh, let's, let's jump a couple of steps forward. That's completed. You've analyzed it. Would it be fair to think that sometime during the 23-24 fiscal year, there's actual work on the ground? I believe so. I believe we will be able to move move some elements of, of that plan um, forward in this next year. I will also say that this next year is the 100-year anniversary of the Giant Dipper. And so we've also been talking about, as this is our major gateway to the ocean and the boardwalk, um, we are talking about how to how to work with them. Um, we have, and it's been a little dormant during the pandemic, but a very active banner program. And so we're looking at also sort of kicking off some new banners. We're looking at sort of ocean ocean themed, and we have some amazing photographs of, um, of both of, of Westcliff, but of surfers. And you know, as we have the uh, the classic coming up again. Um, so we're looking at some of these as part of the beautification, at least along the banners. We completed the banner infrastructure a few years ago that does support these very large banners. So we're excited to put that underway this, this year as well. But we're hoping we can really get some of the intersection, um, or I should say the median near the, the, the intersection uh, addressed this year. Very good. Um, has anybody suggested putting a big yellow sign? <laughs> We'll move on. We'll move on. Are there other qu questions or comments? My members of the council. Yeah, certainly. It's just a thought. Um, the Ocean Street beautification project, um, that's when you come off the Highway 17 onto Ocean Street. I just noticed that it's listed under District 2 and it's marked on the map at Ocean and Broadway, or like Ocean near Broadway in this report. So um, it sounds like it's... it's it, it, The funding when we created it is actually all of Ocean Street, the idea. Um, certainly the commercial areas up to the highway was the intent. I think where we're focusing, at least initially, is the gateway. Right, right at the highway. That what you experience when you first come into Santa Cruz. For the, sir, just to uh, dovetail on um, the exciting project around the beautification is that we are also, and you'll hear from Nathan and Public Works related to uh, a planned pavement project for Ocean as well. So we're trying to coordinate this opportunity to just really enhance the experience that our community members and visitors have as they're coming in, really our main gateway into, into town. So I just, I guess I want clarification if on page 243, project number C512001, Department Economic Development, um, Ocean Street Beautification, what is that referring to? The gateway or something else? Bear with me. My yeah. my CIP I page is, and I, you're looking at CIP now, right? Yeah. Do not have page numbers on them, so I'm flipping flipping through. 
Um, it, it is the same thing that I just mentioned, though. It's it was originally budgeted with our there 2012. There it is on the screen. Thank you. So it says map number nine, Ocean Street beautification. Yeah, and I'm not as familiar with the exact district map to see where that is, but the intent of the Ocean Street beautification and the and the funding where it started is is all of Ocean Street. Of I would just say the commercial. It's not the um, where it connects all the way down to the river. It's the more upper ocean where you have the majority of the commercial, but all the way to the gateway. Can we have that reflected in the correct district, please, before the final budget? Thank you. We can certainly have that updated. Thank you. Thank you. For the questions and comments, without objection, that'll be requested to return on or before the final budget action so that that document will be corrected. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Any further questions or comments? Thank you so much. Your department does a great job. You're absolutely right. Small and mighty, but it, it, it is uh, a constant joy. Uh, the, the work that your department does for our city across so many dimensions under such extraordinary challenges with other levels of government, uh, the, your ability to leverage funds into our city, which is essentially bringing our tax dollars back home from Sacramento and Washington, D.C. It's not like it's somebody else's tax dollars. Those are our tax dollars, and you bring them back in so we can spend them in our community. And it's very much appreciated. Thank you, Ms. Lipscomb. Please thank all of your staff. Thank you. I will. They're a pleasure to work with, and I will say, actually, the entire city team is a pleasure to work with. Because we are such a small team, we really do rely on the partnerships and collaboration across all the city departments. So they make everything we do better and much easier and much more fun. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lipscomb. We're on uh, the fourth item here. This will be planning and community development. Mr. Butler, good evening. How are you, sir? Doing great. Thank you, good. Mayor Keeley, good. and good evening, Council. Um, Bonnie, thank you for pulling up the presentation. And um, I have with me this evening Vivian Pearson, and um, she'll be filling in for uh, part of the presentation on the budget, and also our assistant director, Eric, Eric Marlat, is here with us as well. Um, <clears throat> All right. I'm going to talk to you about our core services, our people, our achievements, our goals, and our budget, and Vivian will, will cover the budget section for us. And I want to start with our mission, which is enhancing the quality of life, safety, and civic pride for our community by providing land use and development guidance through responsive, respectful, and efficient public service. Our core services include land use development and community engagement. Those um, are primarily handled in our advanced planning, our current planning, and our building division. Um, we also focus on public health and safety, um, particularly in building plan check and inspection, where we're looking at structural integrity and escape and rescue and emergency lighting and a whole range of other safety measures. Um, we're looking at our rental housing stock and um, our existing building stock as part of both rental inspection and um, our code compliance functions. Um, we work with Tiffany Wise West on our climate action plan implementation, as well as we implement green building functions, all falling under that um, public health and safety component. And then, of course, we are always striving to improve our customer service, particularly as we move to online and digital services, while also recognizing that it's important to um, provide that face-to-face -face customer service at times as well. Here are a few pictures on the left and right of our team in action at our public information counter on the left and out in the field on the right, and then our code compliance team with some of the new safety gear that they just received, and um, some of the projects in various stages of construction, including the groundbreaking for the Jesse Street Apartments 50 affordable units in the bottom left there. Um, but um, we'll, we'll show a sampling of the other projects that we have underway in just a few moments. 
All right, we have 35 full-time staff members in the upcoming budget between our five divisions, administration, advanced planning, current planning, building and safety, and code and rental. And um, here are our team members that um, really make all the work happen and um, help deliver those services to our customers and make sure that our building stock in the city is safe. Moving on to the achievements. Matt mentioned this in his introduction, and um, we are really um, happy to have achieved the um, regional housing needs allocation um, numbers for our fifth cycle, which you can see here include 910 out of 1,715 units, or 53% of those units as affordable. Really great achievement there. And of course, while we are happy to celebrate that, we do have a lot of work ahead of us. When we look at our sixth cycle, those numbers are five times the numbers that we have for our current cycle. And if you, you look at that middle row, what we've done in the fifth cycle, <clears throat> you can see in the low income category, that's where we're actually closest to achieving um, if, if the same number of units were produced in the next eight and a half years as um, were produced in the prior eight and a half years, we're closest to achieving that low income category. So we've been doing good there. We're still short, 461 versus 562 that we need. But when you look at some of these other categories, like very low income, that has been the hardest to produce. And you can see we've got to quadruple the rate of production in the very low income category in order to accomplish our RENA targets for the next cycle. So I hope to be in front of you in eight years in saying that we have accomplished that, but it is a, a big task ahead of us. Just look me here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good news for us. <laughs> All right. Um, some of the other things um, as far as accomplishments go, um, we currently have over 2,600 units in the development pipeline. Uh, over 880 of those are affordable units, and about 224 of those are permanent supportive housing units. And these represent work at various stages of development from uh, initial uh, preliminary review application through construction. Some of these are falling in the current RENA cycle. Some of them will be hitting in the, um, the next RENA cycle. Um, and they represent work across multiple divisions and departments. Um, so uh, an example of um, the work that one of those divisions has done um, this fiscal year is in current planning, we're on track to approve about 800 residential units this year, including 189 deed restricted affordable units, numerous assisted living units and memory care units, and all of those across 85 discretionary permits. And here is a snapshot of, uh, or a sampling, I should say, of some of the larger projects that we're working on this year. All of these are gonna continue on to next fiscal year, but just this slide right here gives you an idea of both how busy we are in our department, as well as um, it really highlights the changing face of our city. And I want to acknowledge, um, as Bonnie was mentioning before me, this, the work that we're doing as a team is not occurring in a vacuum. Um, we have many departments that are working with us to help bring these projects forward. Um, public works, fire, water, economic development, of course, are all um, working on these projects. And um, I want to highlight that six of these projects up here are 100% affordable. And three of those are on city-owned property where our economic development and housing department is working, working hard to facilitate the production of those affordable housing units in conjunction with the rest of our development partners here at the city. Moving on to the statistics. Um, we're on track to approve a, over 1,650 building permits this year. We're on track to field over 11,500 phone calls and uh, walk-in customers. Uh, we're on track to um, have uh, nearly 10,000 inspections. Um, that um, includes about 2,400 in our code and rental 
division and about 7,400 in our building and safety division. And we have a, um, we've, uh, we're on track to have a building permit valuation of about 120, of over 120 million for the year. And I just want to point out that the actual valuation, um, the actual investment in our community that's coming through our building division um, is underrepresented by that figure. The actual figure is about two to three times what um, that 120 million is. So um, quite a lot of construction investment coming into our community right now. Um, some of the key policy work that we've done this year, we of course, um, completed the objective standards late last year. Um, we've been working hard on the downtown expansion plan, and um, we have um, our first draft of our housing element into the um, state HCD, Housing and Community Development Department, and we'll be bringing that back to the council later this calendar year for um, their approval. Um, we also did, finished our first season of sidewalk vending ordinance implementation last summer and have kicked it off this year as well. A uh, quick sampling of some of the key goals that we have um, coming up for this year. We've got a lot of them, but some of our top priorities, of course, are the housing element certification and our downtown plan expansion work. Um, we also are working on a new land management system. Our land management system is pretty antiquated and um, is no longer being serviced by the vendor. And so um, it's really critical that we're able to um, get this uh, system updated. We'll be bringing something um, before the council in the next month or so, both with respect to a contract request with a new vendor and also with a fee request to fund that uh, new uh, implementation. And then finally, um, customer service improvements are something that we're always seeking to implement. The land management system certainly falls into that. It will provide a lot more capability and more uh, opportunity for 24-7 service and access to our system, um, as well as just getting our staffing up to, um, uh, to, to filling the vac vacancies that we currently have so that we can provide that customer service. Um, handouts and brochures and web updates, of course, and then our increased digital presence and online processing uh, capabilities. And I will now turn it over to Vivian, who will present to you the details of our budget. Great. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, I'm pleased to share with you the planning department's budget of $9 million, and of the $9 million, we have about 66% allocated to personal services and 34% towards uh, supplies and services, with less than 1% towards capital outlay. Now, taking a deeper look at our $9 million, we have um, most of about 30% of it going towards our building and safety division followed by our planning administration of 28%, and the rest of the divisions and programs comprise of the remaining 42%. So you'll see the breakdown um, of our 9 million here. Now, taking a closer look at our revenues versus expenditures, so our green line here are focused on our revenues, and the two expenditure lines are the ones in orange, and then also personnel expenditures are in blue. So for revenue, um, the difference between this uh, upcoming fiscal year 24 compared to last year, uh, we see approximately, um, we're estimating a slight uh, revenue decrease of about half a million dollars. And that really um, could vary between different fiscal years, uh, depending on which of one of the projects go through uh, that will really impact our bottom line revenue. So it's a slight decrease. And then we will look into um, the expenditures for services and supplies. And so as Elizabeth has explained uh, in the finance departments, um, we are impacted by the uh, allocations. And so those are a lot of the increase that we're seeing about $900 million, um, uh, sorry, $900,000 that is going uh, to be impacting uh, the planning department's budget. And then for personnel, um, compared to last year, we um, had eliminated one position, and so you'll see that uh, slight decrease. And uh, Lee and I are here, are available for your questions. Thank you. Let me see if there are questions. Uh, a few. 
On page 173, uh, in terms of the numbers that I have, I don't know if that's it, but it, it would be your page, Accomplishments and Goals, for 23 Accomplishments. Okay. Good. Thank you, sir. Uh, the only one that has X's all across is the initiating the downtown plan expansion project community outreach and hearings. And then when you turn the page, it, the same concept is the only one that has X's all across the various dimensions. So my question and uh, is this, when will those community meetings begin with regard to the downtown expansion plan? Sure, thanks for that question, Mayor Keeley. Um, we've had some community meetings um, as part of the early um, parts of that process. And um, the next outreach, we actually have um, some community members that have been reaching out to our team individually. And so um, I, and, and we're going out to meet with them. So I would um, encourage any members of the community to reach out to our team if they've got questions in advance of those um, formal community meetings. We're happy to meet with folks and talk with them. Um, we do anticipate a uh, formal additional engagement effort this summer. Um, we also, recognizing um, the, um, uh, the vacation schedules that many folks have, that they might not be able to participate in those uh, in, a, in a large community meeting this summer. So we do anticipate having that same um, opportunity for people to participate online um, if they're not able to make that meeting, seeing as we want to keep the project moving forward. And um, so this summer, while we'll be going out, we'll also be offering that as a, a virtual opportunity to engage in the next stages of the project as well. I'd also note um, we will be back in front of the council in June related to this with a contract amendment. Um, the uh, additional direction that council provided earlier this year, we've been um, hard at work with the consultant to make sure that we can implement that. And um, that has um, created a need for us to, to bring that contract amendment back to the council to uh, uh, make sure that we can keep the rest of the project and have the funding for the rest of the project on track. Thank you, Mr. Butler. It does occur to me that what happens in the downtown expansion area is perhaps the most profound and significant change in our, in our history in 100 years in terms of one particular concentrated area downtown. I, I don't think it's, uh, I think I say this without fear of contradiction that there is uh, more than a little bit of public interest in what that's going to be. People are concerned, uh, is this going to be uh, something they, they like or don't like, and uh, we know that we don't have, frankly, a lot of options to doing this, uh, of, uh, concentrating much of our growth as required by the state of California to concentrate that south of Laurel so that we can have the lightest touch possible in the rest of the community, specifically in what we would call neighborhoods, uh, as opposed to the, the downtown expansion area. All of that leads me to say I, I would encourage you to uh, look at a uh, an additional, perhaps hybrid meeting. Uh, you have the first one in June, I think you said, or during the summer. Summer. And then another one maybe online at a later date. Um, please consider that second one being a hybrid meeting so folks can show up in person and participate on uh, electronically if they wish to. But that's your call, but I would uh, encourage you to do that. I think that the degree to which there's no surprises for the community on this, that this, as it's evolving, they can see that happening, can provide their input. I think it's also very important for us to be clear with the public that uh, this is not something that came to our mind and we're doing this uh, completely of our own volition, and that this is a response to that significantly increased arena number that you pointed to in your presentation and also uh, what the consequences are now of not doing that. Uh, who would be in charge? We know the answer to that, but I think it will be helpful to continually educate the public on 
this. This is a brand new world for us. You can we can only imagine what a new world it is for uh, folks in our community who aren't steeped in land use planning and that kind of thing, or state law, or shifts in who's in control of land use and all that business. So I think it'll be helpful if if you would consider that. Let me ask you to take a look at page. 176 in our in the budget which is the budget summary expenditures and resources you tell me when you're there yep, you're yeah. there now thank you sir on the uh, I did notice that on planning administration that it goes up from roughly a million dollars to 2.5 million dollars uh, the line for planning administration maybe you could share with us why that two plus fold increases there Sure, I think um, I, I would guess that that is um, related to some of the, um, the uh, carryover expenses that, uh, or the uh, expenses that Elizabeth was speaking to with respect to services, but I'll ask Rather than Vivian, yes, I'll ask Vivian, I bet that she knows the answer. My former graduate student will have a good answer, I suspect, mm, good evening. Yes, a former student of uh, Mayor Keeley, actually, so. Um, yes, yeah, so that accounts for about the $900,000 um, that uh, the increase that we had. So specifically, those line items would include uh, the legal serv. These are all internal. So legal services, um, we have the informational um, the, from the IT team, and then EOC services. Um, so these are very internal charges that Elizabeth had mentioned that now are being charged for each department. So it does seem alarming that there's a $900,000 increase, um, but those are just simply internal charges. Where would those have been reflected prior to the new allocation, cost allocation measure? Where would that be allocated? Because somebody absorbs it in their budget. Ms. Cavill, good afternoon again. Excuse me, good evening. Good evening. Um, so we did not, those were not in there at all prior. So what was happening, so right now, so what was happening in say fiscal year 23 is those charges, like that's basically what planning is paying for the attorney, for finance, for HR. And then those, the revenues for those are going to those other general fund departments. So it just Good. netted to zero. Understood. So where were those previously when we didn't do cost allocation that way? Or did we always do cost allocation? We always, we, up until 24, the only cost allocation that came into the general fund was from the enterprise funds. Anything within the general fund, we did not do it by department at all. So it was not reflected. So, so I mean, the net's the same. It's still zero. But we did not have, we did not charge planning, nor did, like, HR or finance receive revenue. This is a good change, then, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, it is, definitely. It shows exactly the cost of services, so which we didn't have before. There is a hide the ball. Not that anybody was trying to, but it's not transparent. This is transparent. Thank Agreed. you for that. Mm -hmm. Let me ask on... Uh, Mr. Butler, on current planning, which appears to actually be a number that goes down, uh, which surprises me on the expenditure side, the current planning number would go down given the rise in activity or the volume of activity that you were suggesting would be the case in the new budget year. You tell me why that's the case. So it does not involve any uh, personnel changes. I'll ask Vivian to see if she can outline the specific uh, numbers. I, I expect it's related to some of our um, services that we're um, providing there. Thank you. So for current planning, obviously, it's a very busy division. Um, and so we made some adjustments um, to the services that we have for consultants. And so we um, did make a slight reduction over there. I'm, I'm not sure I understand what you just said. I'm sorry. Say it again. Explain it to me again. There was a reduction in our consultant services, um, and so we made modifications in that area. Is the uh, uh, thank you? Uh, is current planning? Uh, these are folks who come in and want a building permit and that kind of thing. Is that right or not right? No. Um, well. It's before the building permit stage. 
So the items that come before you are the entitlement stage, and those are typically the current planners that are presenting the um, development proposals. Um, and current planning processes, those the design permits, the use permits, the coastal permits, and so forth. And then subsequently, they go to our building division. And our building division um, processes the actual building permits. So building and safety is where the processing of building permits takes place. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Also, in coordination, you know, planning confirms that they're consistent with the rules, and Public Works reviews those, make sure that they're consistent. Same thing with fire and water and so forth. Is that a 100% fee recovery system? That is not at this point. We do believe that um, there is an opportunity to um, provide, a, to, to receive additional revenue. We have a request for proposals out right now to update our fee schedule. And um, we've coordinated with um, our other development partners to include them as well so that we have a uh, comprehensive analysis of um, water, fire, public works, uh, parks, and our building division fees so that we can come closer to cost recovery. What is the, if, if you know, or if you could provide us before we take final budget actions in June, uh, what the general fund contribution is that if, if it is not a full cost recovery system, what the general fund subsidy is? So roughly for the department, I don't have that broken down by division, but I can tell you for the department, um, we are um, around seven, actually I can uh, pull up the specific number, um, but around seven or $800,000. So if we look here. Let me ask um, you about that because that's, uh, look, stay on that same page. When it's resources by fund, it says $3.6 million general fund uh, contribution to your department. Uh, I understand that's not broken down by individual activity, but if you took that, I'm assuming that $3.6 million, which was $4 million this year, and it's intriguing to me that it would be going down, which I like, uh, but this, we still have $3.6 million. Some portion of that is underwriting the building operation which could be 100% cost recovery. Am I right on that? Yes, so um, we would, I do not anticipate that we would get back to full cost recovery for our entire department. And so I just Understood. looked, it's about- Understood on that. Yeah, because we have, we have a number of uh, activities, our code enforcement activities, for example. Let me, let me slow yeah. you down. Sure. I understand all that. Okay, I'm, great. I'm trying to focus in on the building mm -hmm. where someone comes in, asks for a discretionary permit, whether it's to replace a water heater or build a house or anything else. That's a discretionary act. Here it is. You get it. Uh, you pay us a certain amount. We hand you the piece of paper. You're good to go. We go out. We follow up with an inspection. Everything's fine or not, <laughs> but assume everything's fine. That particular activity is an activity which primarily benefits the applicant and the permit holder. So my question becomes, within that activity, that series of activities that, as I understand it, is housed in your department inside the building department, do we have or can we acquire a number that tells us today, before you do your study, before you come back, what is the general fund underwriting of the building side of your activity? Yeah, absolutely. We can get that information Thank to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll be doing that also as part of the fee study. But I said we'll be doing that also as part of the fee study, but we're happy to, to pull that information. Thank um, you very much. And, and get that for you. Thank you, Mr. Butler. I appreciate that. Sidewalk vending program. Uh, the, uh, the proposal here is to go from, uh, you know, over the years, it's been 30, about $3,000, then nothing, then 205000 then almost 200000 now 139000 uh, That's a lot of variation. What, what accounts for this variation? So we just implemented the um, sidewalk vending uh, last year for the first time. There was also a budget amendment um, uh, that some of the, some of the funds um, that we were anticipating to include in the um, current fiscal year did not get uh, pulled over. And so we, um, uh, we added those in at the mid-year. 
Um, and then um, we are also, um, we've got a better understanding of how much additional staffing we need to support that. So um, learning from last year, we've identified here's when we need that coverage, here's um, when we can stop it in the fall when the, the activity um, slows down. And so all of that has informed where we're at. Also, um, we're staffing up in our division so that we can cover some of that work as well instead of going to a consultant. Thank you. Uh, take a look, uh, uh, I'm on the same page, and the very last item under your resources by fund is the Child Care Impact Fee Fund, which is going from $125,000 to $16,000. It seems like a precipitous drop in the income, and I'm channeling my inner council member Watkins when I answer you this <laughs> question. <laughs> I think just sitting next to you, you I can feel it. inclined <laughs> to want to ask child care <laughs> questions. <laughs> Mr. Butler. I believe the biggest reason for that um, anticipated number um, versus what we're seeing is that the um, large majority of the projects that we have seen coming in have been 100% affordable and we have exempted 100% afford we've exempted affordable units from the child care impact fee. Um, we did just receive, um, we just have, we just had a large market rate project come in. Um, I don't have the uh, specifics in terms of what that child care fund was, but the Front Riverfront project um, just pulled building permits and began construction. And so we will have a bump in that number. The council will recall um, that we're dedicating that um, to the um, child care facility that we have in the library as the, the first step, and then we'll proceed back to the um, uh, facilities study that would then inform where we invest those monies in the future. Uh. Thank you, Mr. Butler. I appreciate it. Any other questions or comments? I have an addition. I just Ms. wanted to Watkins. build off that question. Thank you, Mayor, in terms of the child care impact fee, because I did have that question. So if I, I just want to make sure I'm following you correctly in that the $100,000, which I recall was what the Front Street Project had identified as the child care impact fee that they would be contributing. Are you suggesting that that goes, is, is, is part of the 125000 for this year? year we will, we will have that alloc or, or accounted for in this fiscal year. This fiscal year. year. Yes. And you're not projecting any additional uh, child care impact fees from future developments coming forward for next fiscal year? Um, it will, it'll just depend on when some of those larger projects, particularly the market rate projects hit. Um, you know, it's, it's fairly small for the, um, you know, the everyday projects that we see, and um, a, a large part of our budget is dependent upon the, as as is the case with the child care impact fee as well, when large projects end up pulling building permits. And what would those projects be, given the slide that you presented, if you don't mind? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take a look and. That would um, be considered contribute contributing projects to that fee. So I would anticipate that this coming year um, we have um, we'll have Coral Street. That's 120 units, but it's 100% affordable, so we won't get the. Um, That's not oh, right. Um, we will have. Um, I would anticipate this coming fiscal year um, the Delaware Edition, um, which is about 160 units. Okay. So um, I do anticipate getting um, that. They um, are in for building permits right now and are indicating that they want to move forward expeditiously. The other one, um, well, the library is 100% um, affordable, so that wouldn't. Um, those are, that's the, the main big project that I, I see pulling building permits that is not 100% affordable. In the next fiscal year? Yep. Okay. I mean, that's interesting in terms of the narrative also within the community about what's being developed, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's important to specify that. Um, thank you for that. I just had one additional question. In terms of the Green Building Educational Resource Fund, I see an increase with that, and I'm wondering if you can um, help us understand what that's for. Sure. The, the council may recall that um, we um, increased that um, Green Building Fund um, and, uh, or the Green Building Fee, I should say, and we actually um, did a broader cost allocation because there are more of us that are working on that than just the one individual. 
So it was originally allocated to that one individual's work. And really, as we've implemented that program, it's our inspectors, a portion of the inspector's time that are out there doing those inspections. It's Tiffany Wise West and myself and Eric Marlatt, our assistant director, and others, um, our advanced planning team working on building electrification and so forth. So there's a small percentage of a number of people that were not previously allocated, and that's reflected in the increase here. That's great. I mean, I think that's appropriate, so I appreciate the context. Um, I guess my last question is, and I know you mentioned the consultant's fee kind of being a reduction, and I'm wondering in terms of just like where we are in terms of like the, um, I don't know if it's seasonal or, that's, that's not the right word, but the, the continuum of having assessments and nexus studies conducted, where are we on that spectrum? And is that, a, are we not involving consultants at this time because we are already kind of caught up on some of the information that we need or? So it, thank you for that question. It actually varies by division. Um, so the, um, the current planning division, um, my recollection is we did have a slight reduction in that. Um, but if uh, we have a current planning project that comes through and we need to, for example, um, consult with our um, uh, outside counsel, um, uh, Sabrina Teller uh, with Remy Moose Manley, for example, who you all have seen, um, those costs are actually reimbursed by the developers. Um, and so we charge the developers for those costs. And therefore, we've got that budget allocated, but if we need to um, increase that budget, it would be associated with a, uh, a uh, corresponding increase in revenues that are coming from that current planning. So we were, uh, we were comfortable reducing that um, consultant budget because um, particularly in current planning, those are gonna be um, directly um, uh, reimbursed. Whereas in advanced planning, for example, we have, uh, we have a lot of consultant work that we've got going on and uh, between the housing element and the downtown plan expansion. And so, and same thing with our, our building division. We're expecting substantial amounts of additional consultant work as we're getting these big projects in. We're often, almost, for the big projects, almost universally sending those out to a third party plan checker because in order to meet the turnaround times that we've established, um, they have the resources, separate plumbing reviewer mechanical, electrical, structural, versus um, our limited staff that can turn that around in the timelines that we want to provide the responses. Okay, I appreciate the, this, um, yeah, the identification of which division that falls under. And then just going back, sorry, really quickly to the child care impact fee, in that I remember um, us identifying a portion of the fee going to support the child care within the library project, but that was prior to the $100,000 coming in from the Front Street project. So I'm just curious where that is reconciled. So right now, um, I think the, um, the direction that we have from the council is to um, focus on that library affordable housing project. Um, what uh, we can do is, in coordination with uh, economic development as that project moves forward, we can provide the council and we will provide the council with an accounting of that. And the council will then be given the discretion to say, let's, let's dedicate this entire amount towards that or let's siphon off a portion of it and um, start on that facility study. So as we work with our economic development team, to um, progress that library affordable housing project forward. Um, we'll be returning to the council with updates and that'll be an opportunity for the council to weigh in at that time. Perfect. And no surprise, I'm supportive of that, so thank you. <laughs> thank you, council member. Council right. member Brown. Once again, waiting till the end means that my questions get answered. Um, but I did have one question or a, I guess a comment. I didn't see the housing element in our goal, in your department's goals. Um, maybe I missed it, but I'm just wondering if that was something that you, just because, duh, that's what we are, <laughs> we have to do that. Um, it's not here, but it seems like it's a major component of your work and um, it is gonna be a real accomplishment to get a certified housing element. So it felt like, it could be in there. I'm just wondering about that. Thank you for pointing that out. As you noticed on the slides we prepared, that was the very first thing exactly. that I mentioned. <laughs> and so we will certainly correct that before the final budget if it, with it Great. not being in thank there. You. So thank you. Further questions or comments? 
Thank you. That was my com my question as well. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Butler, thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, leave it to your recollection, although... I jotted down a few follow-ups. ...down some notes about some items you'll bring back to us on or before uh, the final adoption of the budget. That's correct. Thank you very we'll much. We'll provide you that information. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thanks to all of your team, everybody in planning. It is by far not the easiest activity to be engaged in. You meet folks who are on a wide range of uh, emotions on the spectrum. Uh, they have their property, they want to do something with it, or they've got some other problem, but uh, you deal with people in all kinds of circumstances. And the service orientation that you and your staff provide is so important because you are the face that many people see, and that's their interaction with government, our city government. So thanks to you, will you please pass on from all of us our thanks and appreciation to your staff. Will do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, he has legs. <laughs> I see three minutes here. I, <clears throat> I don't think I'll make it quite that fast. The city attorney is recognized to present his budget. Thank you, Mayor Keeley, members of the city council. It's my pleasure to um, present the city attorney's budget to you. I will say at the outset, though, that the budget has been prepared by the finance department. Uh, our role at the city is somewhat unique, and therefore our budget is a little bit unique, in that we are called upon to provide the legal services that the city needs in, in order to function. And that, of necessity, means that we uh, have to be a little bit flexible. Uh, the demands on our time vary depending upon who's sitting up here and what issues are confronting the city. And so we look at the budget as a useful uh, guide, um, but, but what we do is respond to the request for legal services that the city asks of us. Um, for that reason, I haven't prepared a list of accomplishments to cite, but I will say that as I listen to the very impressive uh, accomplishments that have been brought forward, um, by the uh, planning department and, and by economic development, uh, and that will be coming forward over the course of the budget hearings. Um, I'm proud to say that we've had a, a significant role in, in most, if not all, of the significant projects and, initi and initiatives that have been undertaken by the city. Um, so I am going to move Are you, are you controlling the slides? Is this the button? It's the only one we're interested in, so you can go back to it. <laughs> uh, the, the, the mission of the city attorney uh, office is uh, that we are committed to providing excellent legal services consistent with the highest professional and ethical standards with the goal of protecting and advancing the city's interests in serving the people of Santa Cruz. Uh, our functions uh, our, one, we provide an advisory function in which our office provides advice to the council, boards, commissions, and city staff. Uh, we work on ordinances, resolutions, contracts, leases, and other legal documents. Uh, and we review documents prepared by all of the other departments. We're charged by the city charter with reviewing and signing off on every single contract that the city enters into. I sign my name to contracts probably three or four times a day. Um, we also work very closely with the uh, city clerk and the police department in responding to the uh, just inundation of Public Records Act requests that they get uh, on a regular basis. Um, as you know, the, the Public Records Act provides a broad, very uh, challenging uh, obligation on the part of cities to search for, provide records. We have to go through those and make sure both that we are responding adequately and that we are uh, culling or um, omitting things that are privileged or not subject to disclosure under the Public Records Act. The litigation function of the office, uh, we defend the city in state and federal court, either with attorneys in our office or through the supervision of outside counsel. 
Uh, our caseload is diverse. <clears throat> it includes personal injury cases, property damages, contract disputes, uh, land use, constitutional, and other specialized litigation. We've developed a particular expertise in seeking workplace violence restraining orders uh, on behalf of city staff when they are threatened by, uh, by outside sources. Um, under fairly recent changes to state law, they provide us with a mechanism to do that, as well as assist the police department uh, in seeking gun violence restraining orders. Uh, we, uh, at the request of the police department, um, we seek to protect the community by taking dangerous weapons uh, from individuals who should not be in possession of them. We also represent <clears throat> the city and the people of the state of California <clears throat> in munico uh, municipal code misdemeanors, criminal matters. Our prosecutors are dedicated to promoting and improving public safety and the quality of life in Santa Cruz through fair, compassionate, and effective administration of justice. Uh, we work closely with the risk management uh, department and city departments to eliminate or mitigate potential risk and preserve public property and resources and minimize potential city liability. Uh, we are staffed by 14 attorneys, uh, roughly 11 full-time equivalent attorneys. Uh, I want to say that um, at this time, we are, in terms of the number of lawyers in our office, the largest law firm in Santa Cruz County uh, private law firm, that is. Uh, the Public Defender's Office, County Council have, have more attorneys and, and the DA's office, but in terms of private law firms. Uh, to be clear, we don't spend 11 full-time equivalents on providing legal services to the city alone. We represent a number of other public agencies in the area, including uh, San Mateo County, uh, Monterey County, and, and here in Santa Cruz County. Um, the ability to represent multiple agencies also provides us with uh, efficiency in, in really learning from the work we do for other agencies and more efficiently providing that assistance to the city and vice versa. So just very briefly, our um, plan for the coming year is Nothing um, uh, really extraordinary. We hope to continue to provide timely, accurate, and practical legal advice and perform legal support for uh, negotiating and drafting all legal documents and supporting services required by the council and all city departments, including key council priorities like uh, the March 2024 affordable housing bond or affordable housing measure. Let me correct that. Uh, and the recently approved uh, oversized vehicle ordinance. Uh, we seek to, con to keep abreast of continually changing legal and regulatory landscapes and maintain systems to provide the council, boards, commissions, and departments with timely and practical information on changes in the law to facilitate compliance and implement best practices. Uh, we will work with the planning and economic development departments to provide legal support on all aspects uh, of the legal issues uh, that arise from major development projects, including the library affordable housing project, we hope a new Warriors Arena, and of course, the, um, the downtown expansion plan. Um, we will continue to provide open government advice and training, including Brown Act, Public Records Act, conflicts of interest, and ethics training uh, for city staff and city officials. We will continue to work with the city clerk and the police department to provide legal support in reviewing and responding to the myriad of PRA requests we receive every year and to improve our efficiency and responsiveness in, in dealing with those matters. We created a special Public Records Act team a couple of years ago that is dedicated to receiving and distributing the work uh, that, so that we have people who are regularly uh, involved in handling those matters and achieve efficiency in so doing. Uh, we will continue to assist the police department to ensure our officers are properly trained to effectively enforce our laws while respecting the civil rights of our community members and continue to vigorously defend the city in litigation 
while working to resolve matters in the most efficient and cost-effective manner uh, possible. And we will continue to oversee the work of outside counsel to ensure that the city is being well represented in matters where specialized expertise is needed. So this is in your budget packet. Um, this is a status quo budget. Uh, it's interesting to note that fiscal year 2022, the actual expenditures of city attorney's services were significantly higher than this past year, as well as what's proposed for uh, the upcoming year. I did note in preparing for this meeting that the 16, 1.614 uh, is almost the same amount that was budgeted for city attorney legal services in uh, 2020, fiscal year 2021. And of that, approximately 60% is, um, is general legal services, our day-to-day -day advisory work, uh, our day-to-day -day contract ordinance drafting, um, attendance at meetings, whatnot, and about the, uh, th the other third, or approximately the other third, is uh, either litigation or code enforcement. And several years ago, and sort of consistent with what the Finance Department has done with regard to breaking down costs according to department, we started tracking our time that was attributable to the different uh, billing categories that we've created. You'll note that the, the largest uh, use of our resources has been the city council. Um, I, I think a couple of comments are, are noteworthy here. One is that um, unlike all of the other departments, we don't spend hours in regularly scheduled meetings with the planning department or public works or the police department. So that's a significant cost that the city incurs. Uh, and, it, and it skews the city council uh, category to some extent. Uh, secondly, a lot of the work that the other departments are doing are what we consider work on behalf of the city council. And so sometimes we'll be working on an item that might relate to homelessness. We'll charge it to the city council category because it's in response to a directive from the city council, even though we're working with city manager's office, police department, or another department on those matters. You see that there is a significant expenditure of city resources on Public Records Act issues, and that is simply a function of uh, the state law and the burdens it places on the city, particularly the people who are doing the Lord's work in the city clerk's department, um, and, and people who submit sometimes requests that are either spite requests or uh, unnecessarily overbroad and demanding. City manager's office as well, uh, we, we work very closely with and therefore devote a significant amount of city resources to that. And then planning, economic development, water, public works, parks and rec, PD and fire gradually uh, go down. We did have a category for uh, uh, work that we did in connection with the various emergencies that have confronted the city over the past couple of years. So. This is a rough breakdown. It's not completely accurate, but uh, I just want to give you a sense of how those resources are being expended. And at this point, I am happy. Oh, one, one more is this chart shows a, um, a comparison of similar, similarly sized cities and their city attorney budgets. This is actually information that was uh, put out by the city of Berkeley when they commissioned a study to look at their city attorney's department and figure out if they were um, getting cost-effective legal services. And you can see, based on these cities, they're mostly larger than the city of Santa Cruz, but on a per capita basis, the city of Santa Cruz gets a pretty good bang for its buck, I would say. And with that, I am, uh, again, pleased to be able to present our uh, budget to you today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you, Mr. Condotti. Thank you so much. Uh, the uh, If you would take a look at uh, your budget page, if you would bring that back up. 
there, there we go. Sir. The, uh, the number that jumps off the page is the net general fund cost, which I think is a celebratory moment for us. But uh, let me understand uh, how this is going from uh, $1.5 million over several years to $54,000 in the upcoming fiscal year. I think, but I will let um, the finance director speak to that. Okay. It's the same reason that you've seen other expenditures allocated to departments. We're um, the work that we've done has been. I don't doubt that, but I, okay. I, I want to see this. I want to hear. Thank you. Ms. Cavill, good afternoon. Good evening, rather, yes. Um, yes, yeah, so, so we had, as we mentioned before, we did not do any allocation within the departments before, any general fund departments. And right. so now that we're doing that, you're going to see huge differences in the services. So, yes, that is what's, what's causing that. So that is, is a happy moment here in city attorney land, but somewhere another... $1.3 million is going to be spread across other departments. So given the chart that Mr. Condotti showed us in terms of who uses how much of their service, I'm assuming that you allocate based on use. Exactly. So well, we then that makes me ask the question about the city. Well, it does. It just makes me ask the question when we get to the city council's budget, we're going to have a question about that because I don't think it's reflected there. So we'll talk about that when we get to the city council budget. If we're the largest single user as a department of the gentleman of, of the city attorney's resources, then it doesn't reflect that in the city council budget that's proposed. And just really quickly, I can answer that. We have an uh, OMB compliant cost allocation plan, and as part of being OMB compliant, and that we do that for grant purposes, city council elections, are those specific um, fees we do not do not receive um, do not receive that cost allocation. So, and that's so that's part of, that's part of that. We had a choice when we were doing the, the um, cost allocation plan. Do we want to be OMB compliant so that which makes us a little more competitive when we're trying to do grants and things? Or do we not? So this was the first year. Again, we're kind of trying to figure out exactly what makes sense, but that's why. City council expenses in particular are exempt from, are not part of the own being compliant plan. So that's why you're not going to see that on the city council, which means it's spread out over everybody else. We'll revisit this topic, but thank you very much for that answer. That's very elucidating. I, I, I do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Mr. City Attorney, let me see if other council members have other questions. Council Member Watkins is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. I actually, I don't know if this would be for you, Elizabeth, or Matt, but I'm just wondering if there's a way to quantify how um, much is also spent on outside council attorney fees in addition to what we spend on your legal fees as well. And I don't track that information. I assume so. Safe, but um, I'm sure that. The short answer is yes. Uh, we're happy to provide that information, and we do we do track that by department related to what services are being provided by uh, ABC versus outside counsel. Yeah, I think I mean I'd be personally interested in what we're spending on legal fees in general. So, thank you. Other questions or comments, Ms. Brown. Um, I'm, I'm very much interested in that information as well. Um, so thank you for raising it. I just want to make a comment here because you you showed us the. Compar comparisons across different jurisdictions, but there's also um, kind of a historical view here, and having been on the council for a while, I, I want to say that I recognize that you, your office has been providing these services without a significant increase in the contract amount, right? So, so our, so in-house, you know, city employees um, get, according to our our um, contracts, you know, raises, and and that happens within your firm, and you figure that out internally, and it just it struck me when you said it a couple of years back that um, the way that you're managing this contract is really a huge benefit for us. So um, I I wanted to, in addition to thanking you for all the work you do and kind of the um, the roller coaster that it can sometimes be, um, that you're you're really um, doing us an incredible service. I appreciate that. You might recall from the meeting we had back, I think, in January that the council uh, approved a contract amendment and a CPI adjustment. We've actually had a provision in our contract that allows CPI adjustments 
since 2017. Uh, but, but just given the financial circumstances that we're confronting the city, we, we did not make those adjustments on an annual basis. Um, now the legal climate is changing and it's getting very hard to attract really good lawyers. And so I suspect going forward, we will be asking for or implementing uh, an annual CPI adjustment, just so we can keep up with the market. Further questions, comments on the city attorney's budget? Mr. Gennady, thank you very much. We will see you in June. Uh, I think I speak for everyone here. We thank you for all of the work that you do and those members of your staff who you bring into closed session uh, and provide us with uh, good advice and counsel. I want to thank you personally for your assistance uh, in preparing for and undertaking conversations with the University of California at Santa Cruz and the Office of the President of the University of California. Uh, we hope that uh, that will bear fruit as we move along. Uh, if it doesn't, it sure isn't your fault, that's for sure. I know whose it is. Uh, but thank, thank you very, uh, all kidding aside, thank you very much for your work. If I could make work. just one parting comment, I just want to say that <clears throat> my firm has actually represented the city of Santa Cruz since 1964. And during that time, uh, I am the third person from the law firm that was established by Rod Atchison to serve as your city attorney uh, in over 60 years. Um, it has been really the professional privilege of my life to work for and serve the community in which uh, I moved with my wife in 1993 and we've raised our family here. And so to be part of this community and to be able to provide um, this public service has really just been a professional privilege of mine. And so I really do appreciate it. It shows, sir. Thank, Thank you very, you. very much. We will move on to the sixth and final item for this evening, which is the homelessness response. <clears throat> Ms. Murphy, good evening. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council Members. I'll be presenting the homeless response budget, and I have with me Larry and Wally to help present today. So let's see. I start with feel the power. <laughs> okay. A brief agenda of what we'll be going over uh, this evening. We'll be reviewing the homeless response action plan, the California 14 state grant. ARPA funding as well, the citywide homeless response budget and expenditures, our fiscal year 23 achievements. We'll talk about the grant fund carryover for FY24 and our goals for the following year. I'd like, oh, that's gonna be tough to read. Well, I'd like to start off with just recognizing that just recently the city of Santa Cruz uh, City Council undertook uh, strategic planning in April. And if one of the uh, stated goals was a homeless response. Well, this is difficult to read. I will just read the, the goal. The goal statement, working with the county, move toward positive outcomes in homelessness response, safety, and health, balancing the interests of persons who are unhoused in the business and the business community. I bring forward the, the strategic plan focus because it is tied to uh, the budget and the budget goals. We believe that the proposed FY24 budget will work towards achieving the goals as stated. In March of 22, the city adopted the Homeless Response Action Plan to guide the city's efforts on homelessness over the next three years. And in particular, implemented two major council policies. The CSSO, which was adopted in June of 2021, which is the Camping Services Standards Ordinance, which required 150 emergency shelter beds. In addition, the council also adopted in November of 2021, the OVO, the Oversized Vehicle Ordinance, which required as a portion of that program, the safe parking. This, the Homeless Response Action Plan incorporates those directives. The Homeless Response Action Plan was funded by one-time funding, the California 14 million, and 4.7 of ARPA funds. This is important to keep in mind as we work through the, the homeless response program. There were five key action areas identified in the plan. Basic support services, K-12 
care and stewardship, community safety, building capacity and partnerships, and permanent affordable and supportive services. The city received the 14 million of state funding one time and 4.7 of the ARPA funds to implement the Homeless Response Action Plan for a total of 18.7 million. To date, the city has spent 12.6 million, which leaves a carry forward of 6 million. I will go into further detail about the expenditures and the carryover later in the presentation. The reason for the carryovers, the, the unspent funds, is that not all the funds were able to be spent due to staffing capacity issues, our ability to undertake all of the projects, process, bid process, locating facilities, obtaining service providers. And again, it results in a six million carryover, which again, I will discuss in detail. Ms. Murphy, could you pause for just a second? I, uh, are, are you showing us slides and documents that are not in our budget? I am because, as you will see, the homeless response in my next slide will, is spread out multiple departments. So this is uh, compiling all of the expenditures across the departments. If, if you don't mind, I'll show you in the next slide, and I'll hopefully answer your questions. Thank you. And as the mayor just uh, pointed out, you won't see the entire program because the funding, while uh, large, the, the 18 million was budgeted in several departments and it crosses multiple fiscal years. So as you see in this slide, the, the different departments, the city manager's office, the public works department, the police department, and economic development, which you had pointed out earlier in, during Bonnie's presentation. Just to accumulate you to this slide, there are several years of which that grant funding has been spent. And in FY22, started tracking these funds, and 1.269 million was spent primarily on the Benchlands sanctioned camp, and we started ramping up the HRT, the Homeless Response Team. In FY23, you notice the large increase in funding. Again, those were the grant funds. Primarily were budgeted in the city manager's office. They were also budgeted in public works and police department and the economic development. Those funds primarily for the city manager's office had to do with implementing our, the homeless response action plan, specifically our safe sleeping programs, including the armory, the safe parking programs, 1220, the staffing, which is our outreach workers, a homeless response manager, a homeless response coordinator. It also entails uh, encampment cleanup and support and what we call partnerships. The public works department is all primarily staffing for our homeless response team. And I have another slide which I will go over further of the staffing. The police department, again, that's primarily all staffing and those are our two, CSO, two CSOs. And economic development, that was for the, um, the rental assistance programs that was one-time funding. I keep bringing up one-time funding because it's very important as we move into FY24. But to round out FY23, the funds were also not only in the general fund, which is what you see there, and if you refer to the pages in the Public Works Department and the Police Department and Economic Development Department, you will see those line items. The CIP also received 8.5 million for projects. Those projects included the Coral Street Hygiene Bay project, the purchase of the Coral Street property, and pre-design for the Navigation Center, and the Benchlands closure. And again, as you can see in FY23 versus the actuals, not all funds have been spent, which results in the six million that I will be talking about later of carry forward. Of note, in, for FY24, as we move forward, those one-time funds are not here. What you see here is solely general fund. The six million that is, again, we will address later, is what we call carry forward and is not captured here. The funding in FY24 is primarily all staffing. It includes, again, the Homeless Response Action Team, the CSOs, 
and the staffing for the um, outreach workers and homeless response team, as well as our contribution to the, um, the COC, the continuum of care. I'd like to just detail a little bit more about the 12.6 million in, a, in categories I think are very important. If you look at this chart, you'll see of the 12.6, 4.6 million was used for permanent supportive housing activities. And 5 million we utilized for temporary shelters. The combination of that is 80, approximately 80% went to housing and support services for the homeless. 1.2 million was for the homeless response team. The 150,000 that was Bonnie, which she again disclosed about the housing assistance programs. 1.4 went to encampment services and cleanup. That includes the bench lands. And then just 100,000 for consultants. And what that was for is uh, the mobile crisis response consultant. And then we just recently uh, have a contract with a lobbyist, which will just be getting started to help us uh, work with our, our other coastal par uh, partners and cities just like us to help get us some much needed legislative support. I just want to add of note, not included in our numbers, but I think it's important to point out that's not captured in the homeless response budget, which I think you correctly identified as uh, 6105. That's, that's the magic number. So those programs, just to point out, that do reach out into the homeless services world is our downtown streets team, the HOPES team, which is the Homeless Outreach Proactive Engagement and Services team, our downtown outreach workers, and our mental health liaisons. I also wanted to note that these were not included uh, in any of the core funding. I'd like to, again, but it's a little difficult to see, to highlight the accomplishments that have been achieved. I think they're very uh, worthy of, of discussing. First of all, the dedicated homeless response team and I have them in three silos, again, because they're funded in three different departments. So you can see, I'll begin on the left with the, myself, the homeless response manager, the coordinator, our outreach specialist, and, and our communication specialist, Susie, which I, I failed to mention earlier. And then within the public works department, this is where the boots on the ground, well, I'm sorry, outreach workers, they're all boots on the ground, but this is where our HRT uh, field response team, are the crews, are within Public Works Department. We have the uh, senior crew leader, we have a supervisor, we have three HR field crew workers. And in the police department, we have the two community service officers. And the reason I have the, the sergeant little box out there was just recently the police department has been able to assign a sergeant to oversee um, the community service officers and solely dedicate uh, that person's time to homeless response, and we will capture that going forward, but it's not captured in this budget. I'd like to highlight some of the action plan accomplishments. Obviously, we implemented the three-year homeless response action plan. We've provided shelter to over 400 individuals. We've supported the rehousing of 62 formerly unhoused individuals. We've opened the city overlook, 135 capacity. We established the 1220 River Street Trans Transitional Community Camp for the capacity of 30 individuals. We've also established the city's safe parking program. We safely and humanely closed the bench lands. We also opened the severe weather shelter. We had it open for 19 evenings. We purchased the property on Coral Street for the potential navigation center. We began the Coral Street visioning project. We recently retained a legislative advocate to form those partnerships. We provided 150,000 in tenant-based rental assistance to low-income families to prevent, to prevent eviction. We recently issued a, the pre-development grant. Uh, this is to provide financial support for uh, individuals to compete for state and federal funding. We also had the contract with the integrated health response team a lot of accomplishments. Good job, Larry. <laughs> now, what we haven't been able to complete, and this is where the six million um, 
comes into play. So what we haven't yet been able to implement is the shelter infrastructure, which is the funding for the pallet shelters at Housing Matters. We have not been able to complete or start the RV dump station, the storage facility program, which was part of the CSSO ordinance. There was also funding for additional transitional camp, the navigation center pre-design phase, and establishing an additional indoor shelter facility. And the six million, that is the carryover, which is an administrative action that will happen at the end of the year. And that's why you don't see that number populate in FY24 general fund. What staff, what we're recommending here this evening is to reallocate that six million from the projects in the previous slide. We're recommending reallocating to support several important programs and not fund the other planned initiatives. What are those recommendations? What you'll see in this, this slide here is on the left hand side are programs uh, that have not been completed. And then also in the yellow are the programs that we're asking you to reallocate the six million to fund. That's the middle column with the dollars, the reallocation of the current remaining funds. And then the final column is what will not be funded if you accept my recommendation. We think it's very important to continue to fund the city overlook at the armory at 4.8 million. Continue funding the, the implementation of the storage program as it relates to the CSSO program. Continue the funding of the 1220 River Street. Continue funding of the staff, uh, the safe parking, all three tiers. Additional funding for the encampment response and cleanup, and funding for the severe weather shelter. As you well know, that again, the 14 million and the ARPA fundings, the 4.7 was one-time funding. So in order to continue these programs, we are asking to, for the reallocation of the remaining funds. It's a difficult choice when you look to the what's not going to be funded, which includes the shelter, the pallet shelters at, for Housing Matters the RV dump station, an additional transitional community camp, the navigation center phase two, additional alternative shelter, indoor shelter, and a mobile crisis response. We will have an opportunity to look again at what funding opportunities might be available at mid-year. We are still waiting to hear about the encampment uh, grants, we still have not heard of, of those funds if they were awarded. It's three million for uh, six, excuse me, six million for two years. So there will be an opportunity, hopefully, uh, to revisit. And finally, what are our goals in conclusion? Reduce the impacts of encampments. Continue to support temporary shelter programs in accordance with the CSSO and the OVO. Continue to provide much needed outreach services to create a, weather, a severe weather shelter program in coordination with the county, create the storage program, continue the safe parking program in accordance with the OVO, in the future potentially implementing the integrated health response team, which is the mobile crisis response, and finally obtain sustainable funding sources. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Let's see if there are questions. Ms. Collintari Johnson. Thank you for the presentation, putting it all in one place, and for all of the incredible work. Um, I have questions and comments. I wonder if we can see that slide with the pie chart that shows what percentage goes to what. Um, Took a picture of it. I'm more than happy to provide email the PowerPoint as well. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's it's the um, got the 12.6 in the middle. Yeah. Do you want me to do it, Julia? Or do you? There it is. There it is. Yeah. Just I think it's really worth noting that the majority <laughs> of this is really going towards services and supports. Um, 
And this is something that I would like us as a city to communicate. We often get folks who um, comment and criticize the work we are not doing or that we're investing our dollars in um, enforcement. And this chart shows the facts of what we are investing in our dollars and our efforts and our um, city workers to help us do as a city. So that's, I guess, just a comment that we really should be showing this chart everywhere um, because it's it's just so clear. There's no arguing with this. So thank you for that. Um, I did have questions about the budget that you presented and some of the pieces that we'll have to pause on. Um, the pallet shelters, my, I, I'm trying to like go back to a couple years because it's been a couple years since some of these specifics came up. My understanding was that there were resources with um, housing matters and with the county to kind of bring it all together and do the pallet shelters and that we wouldn't be doing that on our own. So if, if somebody could speak to the pallet shelters, because I thought like we had space at housing matters and we had some of the pallet shelters and it was just a matter of getting the shelters and, and then putting them in place. Right. So we do have a partnership with the county and housing matters. Hmm. And there is where the former River Street um, um, shelter was. Is the, was the plan. We would provide the pallet shelters and the county would provide the support services and housing matters would manage it. So it was a combination of all three. And it's not that this project will be gone. We're hoping that we'll be able to qualify for the, um, the funding for the encampment grants and then we can use that for the armory and then pull that money out and use it for the infrastructure. Okay, and so in terms of our partners, um, well, I guess we, we, we would be the purchasers of the physical pallet shelter, so the rest of it can't happen. That's right. Okay, so are, are our partners, are, are they aware of what is being proposed before us, and have they provided feedback? They, it's been proposed. We've had let them know, um, but without any outcome of not not being able to say for sure whether what the council's decision was going to be, but yes, this this will be, this is a hard choice. This would yeah, be sure. a very difficult one not to fund. Okay, okay, and then um, the safe parking, um, so this is just saying that the, for, for the safe parking program, it's just the RV dump station component of it. Is that, that's my right. understanding that, right? Okay, and then what was the phase two of navigation center? That's the pre-design piece, uh, pre-development piece. Sorry, I am not planning. A good figure of the planning piece of how that works. I'll let you do that part of the description. Yes, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Thanks for the question, uh, Council Member Kalatar and Johnson. Uh, within the uh, allocation plan we had for the California 14 million, we set aside $600,000 to do the pre-design work uh, around the, the navigation center concept. So $3 million was dedicated for the acquisition of Coral, uh, 123 Coral Street for a potential navigation center, but then also setting aside funds that could support the pre-development to be able to be positioned to do the larger term uh, capital project. Okay, got it, thank you. Um, and then I have a question, maybe it's for you, Larry, I don't know. Um, what is the distinction between the additional transitional community camp and the alternative additional shelter? I can't remember what's the difference between those two. Right. Yes, yeah, so in, in the original plan, we um, budgeted for, to have two transitional community camps, you know, so the first one being uh, 1220 River that's been in operation since January of 2022. We've had plans to do a second one. so. That's the first piece. Mm -hmm. The additional um, shelter um, has been is really a new opportunity that's been considered um, how we can expand that shelter capacity. And so one was potentially the city could have um, a partnership around the former outdoor world property oh, okay. that could be used, okay. right? Um, and so that's a budget concept that's been on the table, but given the, the priority projects that that didn't, um, that wasn't prioritized at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right, just two more comments. Um, I did see that the Board of Supervisors uh, maybe last week approved additional funding 
or AFC to continue with their safe parking. Um, I don't know the details of it, if it's just their sort of vehicle parking or RV parking, but um, if we haven't already, it would be great to um, coordinate with the county and see how AFC is, is going to be expanding their services. Um, and it would be great if it was in alignment with the city's safe parking three-tier program and not just sort of on its own. I mean, I know we communicate um, and coordinate with AFC, but in this particular instance, I don't know if we have or not. So that if we haven't, uh, I would like us to like to see us do that. Uh, okay, and then and then I think just the last thing I'll say is, um, and I'll just I'll keep saying this. I'm I'm really pleased to see the shift and investment we've made as a city. Um, I'm pleased to see that we are, there's a proposal for us to continue it and that, that we have reached a capacity in terms of not just our budget, but our people power and the, our ability to respond. Um, setting up infrastructure is absolutely within our role, but I would look to our partners at the county to do the service provision. And so I'll just keep hammering at that. And I know that we're working on it, but um, Again, I'm, I'm committed and invested in continuing to do this, but we have to look at a sustainability plan, which includes the county picking up the services provision of what we're proposing here. Thank you. Me, uh, that slide that's up there right now is quite helpful, uh, I think. Uh, let me make sure I understand, state grants the city of Santa Cruz, together with ARPA, twenty million dollars. Is that right? Together? About eighteen. Yeah, eighteen. Eighteen million. Mm -hmm. And of that eighteen, we're going to. Sp we've already spent some, presumably, and more than a little bit. And the proposal for this coming fiscal year is to spend another six million of that. Is that correct? That, that essentially that's correct. So we didn't spend all of the funds in yeah. what we thought we would do in 23. So we're going to push over what we call carry forward yeah. the six million into FY 24, and this is how we're proposing to spend it. Okay, and this six million that we're carrying forward, uh, when we spend that, we will have spent all of the money. That's correct. Okay, so. Let's go through these. So, for example, the City Overlook Armory, $4.8 million number, I'm assuming, help me if I'm wrong on this, that that's all operations. Yes. Or virtually all operations. Okay. So, if we find ourselves sitting here one year from now and we want to continue the Overlook Armory, we have to find $4.8 million in the absence of the state or federal government sending us $4.8 million. That's correct. Okay. It's going to be true on the storage program, 1220 River Street, safe parking, encampment response. All those are the same answer. All the same answer. So we just got a ruling from the State Coastal Commission that in order to effectuate our oversized vehicle ordinance, we will need to have a three-tier safe parking program in addition to some other activities. So whether we like it or don't like it, as a condition of having that, which is a one-year permit, we're gonna to have to come up with half a million dollars of city money to keep a safe parking program if we wanna have the oversized vehicle ordinance still in place. That's correct. Okay, and the severe winter shelter where it says new, so we did a little bit of that during this calendar year, during the event of the disaster itself. Take a minute and describe what the severe winter shelter would be going forward, because as I understood it, we had the Civic for a couple of nights, mm -hmm. and then, in effect, the county said that'll be just enough of that on their part and they decided to go do other things and absent their presence there we couldn't operate that ourselves but we did operate the depot park and a couple of other places for folks to go is that right you are correct okay so then on you're the doing severe, my job for me 
<laughs> well, no, I'm just, I'm just making sure I understand. You, you're very clear in your presentation, I, so I, I don't doubt that. Uh, the severe weather shelter, then, $142,000. We would do what with that if we authorize that? So that would take care of costs for um, wherever we have the location. Let's say at one time we had it at the vets. We have to pay for that. That would pay for the operator as well and all the services that go with it, not just the operator. We fed people. We didn't just... Uh, house those individuals for the night. We had a lot of um, folks come and seek services, whether it was we provide them blankets, uh, again, food, uh, and shelter. So that's what the cost would be for. And this is, a, this is an actual physical place. Yes, well, determining where we would operate it, that's another story. Would it be the Civic? Would it be the uh, Vets Hall? Would it be Depot? Uh, that operational portion? We, we need to work that out. This appears to be a bit, not, not a massive, but a bit of a change in maybe an unwritten policy here, which is that the city was, was willing to step up in the heat of the moment. But when that died down and other weather arrived not nearly as severe, the city made a decision uh, for example, relative to the Civic, to not open the Civic again, because we felt that at Depot Park and other places, for those folks who chose shelter, we could provide it for them. Is that right? Yes. If we do that again, assuming that we're in this world of unpredictability, but when we have these atmospheric rivers, we are going to have serious problems. After the fiscal year that's upcoming, if we want to continue that, we come up with this money. That's correct. So that's essentially everything in this $6 million column. Yes. It's going to go away. Let me ask you about the, about the city overlook and armory, uh, which is now at full capacity. Who do we contract with on that? We contract with the Salvation Army. They're the operator mm -hmm. of the program. And what are the terms and conditions of that operating agreement? Well, you'll be getting that contract in about one month, and we can review it in great detail together. We're just you give me a general idea of what it is. Maybe our friend? He's the, the, the contract administrator. So the contract with Salvation Army for the present year is approximately $4 million. I forget the exact amount, but that's to serve 135 people at capacity. It provides for staffing. It includes uh, two to three meals a day. I think they're actually doing three meals a day now, even though the contract is for two. It includes a transportation program that shuttles uh, uh, participants from uh, up at the armory down to HBHB and to central uh, Santa Cruz to be able to access services. Um, and those are the principal kind of elements of the scope of work. Do That's true. There's, yeah, I mean, we have all the whole, exactly the hygiene and sanitation infrastructure, shower trailer, porta potties, hand washing stations uh, as well. Do people need some kind of referral? In, or, or to the Overlook Campground uh, or the Armory before arriving, or can people arrive there with their RV to park or seeking space inside the Armory or seeking to camp at the Overlook Campground? Uh, a referral is required for, for both the programs you referenced. So for the Safe Sleeping Program, uh, which is operated by the Salvation Army, referral comes from our city outreach staff who engage people that are in unsheltered and living in encampments throughout the city um, on a regular basis. And so that's the referral mechanism into that program. Uh, the safe parking program, Tier 3, the 24-7 extended with case management that's operated by the Free Guide also at the Armory. Similarly, there is a process where the Free Guide staff is doing outreach to people that are living in their vehicles or are connected. So people who are living in their vehicles can outreach to them as well. But there is a process to identify who uh, participates in that program, and there's participation agreements that are required. Thank you. So if someone was to uh, walk up uh, that rather steep road, but if they were to walk there and didn't have such a referral, uh, from one of these entities, and they said, I'm homeless, I'm cold, I'm hungry, 
uh, do you have a, a space for me? They would be told, turn around, go away, go get a referral. I think in practice, the way it would happen is that the staff at South Asian Army who work regularly with our outreach staff, as well as our homeless services coordinator, um, they would make a referral to our team and connect them with that team to get them engaged in that process rather than simply uh, turning them away and um, telling them to get a referral through another mechanism. They would make that connection to that referral. And could that person stay there until such time as a connection was made and a referral was a referral was approved and or would they be asked to step aside and you'd get back to them when they had a space for them? So that's an interesting question. We haven't had that scenario through my conversations with the uh, Salvation Army in that process is something that we've developed a standard procedure for. So I I can't comment on that specificity, but I can check with Salvation Army staff to see if that situation has ever arised. Are you satisfied that the contract is uh, being appropriately administered? Yes. I think, I, you know, first and foremost, just acknowledging the onset that this is difficult and challenging work to do. Um, and I think that... Um, uh, Certainly, uh, there's difficulties in running a shelter in that process, but in terms of the work that the Salvation Army has done to be able to stand up that shelter and provide those services um, has been effective. And I think we reported at the last quarterly update about housing successes they've received. It can kind of demonstrate some efficacy. Thank you. Ms. Murphy, you indicated that a legislative advocate has been retained um, to do some work for us. I'm wondering if you can tell us who that is, what work they're supposed to be doing, and what the results of that have been. Precision advocacy. We just completed the contract process. We're going to do a kickoff meeting in a couple of weeks. Uh, the intent is to provo uh, provide us with a, a coalition to help build a coalition that will help us of like-minded organizations, agencies that have similar issues that we do, cities basically cities, particularly on the coastal region, to help us form a group that can advocate for, whether it's increased funding, funding that comes directly to the cities, behavioral health, more accountability for the counties, a number of different initiatives that we've outlined that we'd like for them to be working on. Is that, uh, did that contract come to us or was that below our? It's below yes, your threshold. Sir. Okay, can you provide that before the end of the budget hearings? Thank you very much, appreciate it. Other questions or comments, Ms. Brown? Thank you. Um, I, I just want to follow up on the overlook item because I'm, <clears throat> um, I'm sharing the concerns of um, the mayor and I imagine my other colleagues uh, about the kind of endpoint for this, right? I mean, we're, 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 we've got a lot of things happening and, and I w would say, yes, it's great and we kind of are maxed out and other agencies need to step up and do their part. Um, with respect to the armory contract in particular, I know we've talked about this and um, there's, a cons there's a challenge because finding an operator is very difficult. And, um, and this is $35,000 a year per person. So, you know, I just feel like if we're um, if we're going to consider being in this business for the longer haul, that we really should spend some put our heads together to figure out how to provide these services at um, a lower price point. There are um, shelter programs and transitional camp programs out there all over the place that that operate on a much leaner budget than this and provide those services and can be effective. And um, I don't mean to disparage in any way the Salvation Army when I say this, but it's it's $35,000 a person. I mean, <laughs> so it, it just feels like, I mean, no matter what we do, that's not sustainable. Um, have you talked at all about um, as you're, you know, trying to develop other potential operators, you found the free guide for uh, the parking program. Um, it's still pretty big ticket, but much lower cost per per, per um, vehicle, right? Um, and and so and so therefore per you know 
family or if, if a vehicle comes with more than one person, how many people are served. So just um, wondering, and I, we don't need to have a big conversation about this, but I, I want to note it here and <laughs> ask you if that's something you're thinking about. Uh, I know we're kind of in triage mode here, but, um, but this seems like if we don't do something, we're, we're just not going to be able to do anything. That's right. I, I think you point out a couple of different things that are, are completely accurate. I'm glad somebody else did the math. It, that is uh, true in accounting. Yeah. Uh, so looking to try to do an RFP in the future, if we were to continue in the future. We are in this triage emergency type mode that is very reactive. The, uh, the free guide is developing his program and hoping that we see his capacity grow and his capability to grow, which we're really encouraging. Um, safe parking program is still very, very expensive to operate. That tier three is extremely expensive. Uh, and, but it's less hands-on than what we have the need for when you're at the armory, where you need 24-hour staffing. You need multiple staff members there. We are providing a number of different services there. It's service, heavy service orientated. And I will tell you that the folks that work up there aren't making a killing. They're making 18 to $20 an hour, and then we have high turnover. So we're looking at the potential of actually a higher contract coming toward you than what you see here, because we need to have... They need to pay, we're encouraging them to pay their folks more and to hire more people. Uh, so I hear your concerns. It's, it's a business, there's just not operators, particularly this size and the amount of services we're providing that are willing to step forward. Council, the vice mayor is recognized. So I was doing the same math and then I broke it down a little more and then I looked and checked to confirm and um, we went to Fiji over Christmas, and at an all-inclusive resort that includes booze, you could you could go there cheaper per month. It's about almost twenty nine hundred a month per person. So I just am like a little blown away at the cost, and I'm like, holy moly! Like we're at the edge of a cliff. If this is all we have for one year, that thirty five thousand for one hundred and thirty five people, I'd rather give it to high school kids for a college scholarship. And I know that's not what we're talking about here, but I'm just kind of in sticker shock when I see this tonight before us, and so I don't have anything um, else to say that my colleagues haven't already said, but I'm extremely concerned about the cost of operating that facility, and I, I, um, I, I'm not offering to operate it for less, um, personally, <laughs> but, um, but I do think of what Council Member Brown said about putting our heads together and what, um, <clears throat> what you said about um, leveraging partnerships, but this is certainly not sustainable. And, and I had, guess I had hoped that whatever we spent this one-time funds on would be more infrastructure and, uh, you know, uh, investments and things like that. And so it's, I'm, I'm more uncomfortable. I'm just going to say that. May I, may I make a quick comment? Yeah. And to your point, that, that type of housing is very expensive with not huge outcomes that you see. And that is the very reason, one of the very reasons that there are nobody, there is, or nobody, that's terrible. There is nobody operating in that space of which the county is not operating in that space because one of the reasons is the intensive cost and, and not at the, the getting directly into housing. This is a transitional step. That's why um, it's, it's extremely, expensive and one of the reasons we had as a city needed to step into this space because there was nobody in this space anymore and mayor and council if i may just add to that very briefly i know you have a comment mayor i could see the wheels turning <laughs> um just to put a finer point on it as lisa's describing um the city of santa cruz is really the only jurisdiction in the county meeting temporary shelter needs exactly. period mm -hmm. it's expensive We've uh, shown, and I think that the work that Lisa's presented tonight is a testament to what we can accomplish when we have the resources to do so. But the proposal you have in front of you is essentially a stopgap for one additional year. So we have a lot of problem solving to do when it comes to meeting a very real need that's not going away with regards to providing interim temporary shelter and we would love to have more of a multi-jurisdictional approach to that work across the county. And yes, perhaps there are more efficient 
shelter models. Uh, we're certainly open to exploring those. Um, but one of the constraints we often meet in this work um, is that many of those models require um, additional sites, significantly more additional sites than what we're able to achieve with uh, the Overlook. And the number when you roll it all up, part of the reason why it's so high is we're paying for transportation back and forth multiple times throughout the day. It's a large offsite facil facility that has checked many of the boxes when it comes to having a site that's not gonna be met with a lot of the community opposition that these sites are often met with. Mm -hmm. But with that um, come many other expenses that we would love to avoid if we had more convenient locations that the community was willing to support. So more work to be done there. It's, it is raising the flag to say, uh, we're facing a fiscal cliff when it comes to maintaining these programs. And they're either at risk or the general fund's gonna have to absorb some large price tags here that you see on the screen. So I just wanted to put a final point on that and appreciate the questions. Council Member Watkins. Um, yes, I, I know that, I mean, I, I'll just recognize the complexity of the issue. And I think my, I don't know if it's necessarily a question or just a comment, but I think part of also what a temporary um, shelter site is for is for temporary shelter. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, in terms of the 135 spots currently at full capacity, how many individuals are trans, you know, transitioning out of that into more stable, independent living? And, and if we're getting into the business, and you don't have to answer that question. Oh, it's on the slide. Yeah, sure, yeah. yeah oh. we had it. We had it, okay. Somewhere in there, but go ahead, keep 67? going. 67? Yeah, I think 67. so. And then do, they, do we um, c account for who potentially comes back if not successful in terms of duplicated numbers? So we try for six months because it is temporary uh -huh. and there's plenty more folks who would like that space and the opportunity to stabilize and to receive services so that they can then make the next leap. But the next leap is into housing and there is not any housing available. So that's the other problem. There's a lot in the works, and the county's working on it, we're working on mm -hmm. permit supportive housing, but there's nowhere else the next move to go to. to right. Which means then that it's not really temporary because there's nowhere else for people to go. As, you it's know, moving, it's right. hopefully connecting them to other resources, family, More stability. Yeah. something else. Um, <laughs> To help them move along and help them stabilize but it is an intent is to six months because that's about a, a good time then to uh, exit them from the program right and I, I mean i don't yeah i don't question how challenging yeah. that can be for people who are struggling so i, I totally understand that um, I guess in terms of the advocacy, and then I'll, I know that Sorry. Vice Mayor has a comment. No, no, no. In terms of the advocacy and that, you know, if we're thinking about cities taking on direct services, then thinking about reimbursement and being able to draw down reimbursement dollars, particularly like the, the Cal AIM and the shifts there, I think should be part of that conversation yeah. and part of the advocacy component if, you know, if that's the service we're providing. So I'll just, I'll just leave it there. Um, I agree with all the points that you made, Matt, in terms of needing our other jurisdictions to step up too. I know you're jumping to do this, but Council Member Bruner is next. <laughs> and I know you were very good about raising your hand and everything, Madam Vice Mayor, but nonetheless, Council Member Bruner is next. Uh, thank you. And thank you for all of this information and the questions that have been asked. Um, Let's see, my, my, I guess at this point, my first question is, um, can you talk about the RV dump station maintenance? What is that? What is it's the actually maintenance? actually building an RV, a dump station. Think of like when you go camping. Oh, so it's, it's not maintenance of an RV dump station. It's, it's creating. Yes. So creating and operating. So why is it not with new? It's not new. It was programmed in the when you okay. all adopted the program uh, in 2022. That was a line I see. item. So the new applies to after the program was adopted That's items. Right. That okay. That's correct. Thank you for clarifying that. And so then back to that creating an RV dump station um, as it relates to the recent Coastal Commission <clears throat> conditions and action and the work that will happen over the next couple months and 
the, the pilot program over the year with this permit, um, it seems like that would be a priority as part of that. And I'm curious how, I mean, each of these are very important, but how that decision was made to prioritize the ones you did and um, it specifically with that RV dump station. Yeah. While it would be great to have, it's not necessary to have for the OVO. It, that, that's the bottom line. Uh, it would be beneficial, but given the other uh, needs, it was a trade-off. But it's not necessary to operate the, the OVO program. Okay. Madam yeah. Vice Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you were, I'm, I'm sorry. I still have more questions, I'm very too. Sorry. Okay. But I, I just, I'm sorry. I just want to add a little bit of context, because that's exactly right. Sort of the provision of an RV dump station was not a requirement uh, of the OVO and the conversations with Coastal. Um, but related and, and part of the prioritization, prioritization process is uh, we've developed, uh, working with Public Works, we've developed initial draft designs for an RV station, and they've actually submitted a grant to try to get funding to um, develop that. And so waiting for the resolution of that. So there's potentially other funding sources to be able to make that happen. Uh, so that was part of the process in determining what to prioritize. That's great news. Oh, fingers crossed on that grant. I've forgotten about the grant. Um, OK. And then the storage program, it, that was part of the initial direction, previous um, direction as well. Um, so that's moving forward. It's not. Oh, wait. Yes, it, we, we hope to. I'm sorry. I have to look at the right column. We hope to move it forward. Originally, it was in the budget for 60000 When we went out for bids, it's 230000 So it was much more expensive than what we originally planned. But in order to try to get the CSSO implemented, we needed to have a daytime storage. Right. But the difficulty, yet again, is the location, staffing, those, those are the high drivers because it's every day, in and out, twice a day, um, and the location having an operator. That's why it has not been implemented. How many bids did you get? Do uh, you know offhand? If not, that's okay. We had two. It's been, a, it's been a while, but we thought that was quite high. And so there that, was, a, there was a potential of try to look at other options, whether it was going to maybe potentially at the um, outdoor world. Um, but to continually operate that program, we wanted to see if there's other options. Okay. Um, and then let's see. Um, my other question. Um, I think some of the comments about our sustainability with with this and the you know 35,000 something per person if you kind of divide for example the city overlook number um, it's an investment into people that aren't capable of taking care of themselves for whatever reason is happening and I mean it's there are some people who make that in a year, but if you're not able to make that and you're not qualifying for assistance in other ways or not capable of getting to that point, this temporary investment um, in in people, I think, is is huge and investment in our community where they're not finding investment elsewhere. So um, the fact that it's temporary and rotating through I think it, you know, the the fact that it says full capacity makes it sound stagnant. Like, it's 135 spots, it's full, and nothing else, but it's a rotating... Um, we have people moving in and out for yeah, various reasons. Yeah, max capacity. Um, and so I'm happy to see, and the, the previous slide I made a note about the 67, and when we start thinking of solutions going forward and sustainability, there we have to think about the changes that are also happening simultaneously 
that didn't exist before. And a lot of that is supply, housing supply is coming. And that's where I feel a little hopeful that eventually it's going to be like this. Um, you know, if, we, if we're thinking long term and investing in this way because state, county, other resources, I mean, it takes so much to assist people where they're at and what their needs are. And it's so varied and complex of, as we've learned. So the fact that we've been able to invest these dollars in this way, I hope that we can... Um, have more earmarked money coming in, more grants helping and assisting. I'm glad you you mentioned a federal legislator to to help the lobbyist, the lobbyist um, to um, hone in specifically on this area, which I think is huge. And um, um, yeah. I think that's th those were all my c questions and comments right now. Thank you, Council Member, Madam Vice Mayor. Okay, so I think where I'm a little frustrated is um, we sat in another meeting and I did a little other calculation, and what I calculated based on our point in time survey and what I did some quick searches was that. Um, in the United States, 0.1% of the population is homeless. If we look at California, it's 0.2%. Los Angeles, 1%. And Santa Cruz, the city, 2%. So I think we're, for whatever reason, and I don't think it's necessarily all because of the cost of housing, unfairly burdened with um, solving some of society's toughest issues. I think the other thing is when we say housing isn't available after those six months, housing isn't available maybe that they can afford here because it's really expensive. If you move three hours east or, you know, somewhere else, you can afford it probably a little more. And you keep looking, our, you know, Santa Cruz is great. It's not Mecca. Like there's lots of wonderful places around the world that are affordable. So I think when you're getting people stable and helping them, try to find resources, I think we need to look beyond the city, beyond the state, and help people find places that they can achieve, like, you know, integration back into society in a meaningful way, and it doesn't have to be living in Santa Cruz. And I don't know, people say I'm asking people to leave. Maybe if you can't afford it here, you can't live here. And, and, and right now, from what I see, the, from the people living up there, they're not exactly contributing to the quality of life for other people in, in a way that, that I appreciate, and I'm wondering if that number would be 135 if there wasn't drug use allowed. When I went up there, there was you know needle disposal and Narcan available, and so if you said no drugs up here, would it still be 135? I don't know. And so I just I'm really frustrated, and that 35,000 is like a punch in the gut, knowing that in public schools in this county it's less than half that that our kids are being funded for. Like, and I, and I com completely understand these people aren't capable of taking care of themselves. Having said that, they are, and I'm not talking about children, but the adults, adults, you have to take some responsibility for the situation that you're in. You can't, be, I, I, like the victim mindset is something that I have no empathy for. If you look at their situation compared to people worldwide, this is like extremely frustrating to me and I wish I had seen this slide over the weekend so I could process and come down and not be like cranky up here tonight. But I just had to throw that out there as my. Hmm. There's one last one, just question. Just one last question, sorry, because I was wondering about the ability for individuals who may be using drugs or have other you know challenges in their life. Are they able to access or be eligible for some of the housing that could come online, or are they not? You know, what it, I mean? every it depends on the caseworker. We really every case is so individual. And so, so in I wouldn't terms be able to of like your assessment of the individuals we're serving. Do you think they would qualify or not? I mean, if we're saying that that's going to be a potential, solution. I wouldn't know. I really, I don't have. I mean, I'm just curious because there is a requirement. 
Right. I mean, it, it's complex, you know, trying to make some generalized statements about that. But certainly with the process, everybody the overlook. Um, we also have connections with our county partners with the Housing Pathways Program, Healing the Streets, that are working on an array of service issues, but also really working on housing navigation. And so a number of those folks are specifically connected to caseworkers, navigators, in addition to the work that Salvation Army staff is doing there. So that activity is happening, but trying to be able to um, deconstruct that down to particular cases is really difficult. Okay, then I guess I would just uh, caution us for overgeneralizing that, that that housing coming online will be the solution for some of these individuals mm -hmm. then, exactly. essentially, yeah. Mr. Imwali, if I could ask you to stay there for a second. Uh, What's the, remind me what the most recent point in time count is in the city of Santa Cruz for folks experiencing homelessness? I believe the 22, 20, 2022 point in time count, there was uh, 1,469, or is it 1,439? Apologies. Close that, enough. For and, yeah. Budget work tonight. Yeah. Um, and of those, let's call it 1,500. Easy to do arithmetic at 1,500. So those 1,500 uh, folks experiencing homelessness, uh, we don't count anybody who, am I right, we wouldn't count anybody who's actually now sheltered. No, it includes, it includes um, people that do not have a regular house who are in shelter. So the shelter population is included in the point in time count. So it sheltered includes both unsheltered right. and sheltered in temporary emergency shelters. Okay, good, that's that's helpful. Uh, we're on the underway with regard to the safety, public safety clearing of Sycamore Grove and the, excuse me, and uh, Poganip. And uh, what is your, I've heard various estimates when we all took, a, or many people took a, tour on the railroad tracks and then in subsequent discussions, something like 100 people in that area. What is your best estimate of how many people were in that area? I think before uh, we started in Sycamore Grove, if you looked at the entire area counting Poganet, both upper Sycamore and lower Sycamore, there was approximately 100 people is, our, 100 is people. Our, roughly our best estimate. Again, highly variable day to day. A lot of it is inference Certainly. from number of tents rather than Certainly. contacts with individual. When the city engaged in the clearing of Ross Camp and the clearing of the bench lands, my recollection, I wasn't here when the Ross Camp or bench lands were cleared. I arrived here after that. My recollection was that somewhere around 30% of the folks at, in each of those instances when offered assistance, uh, about 30% said yes. Is that about right? Um, similarly, I was not here for the Ross camp, uh, so I don't have that data. Yeah. Last year for the bench lands, through our process, it was actually 39% of individuals uh, who we worked with zone by zone through the entire process um, actually accepted shelter. And that is just at the overlook in 1220, so that does not include Outside of that, the work with community partners and a number of uh, individuals were also housed at Housing Matters. So mm -hmm. it's slightly over 40 at least. Mm -hmm. And do we have any data on how the clearing at Poganip and Sycamore Grove is going relative to people being willing to accept some sort of assistance, whether it's shelter or any other assistance? Um, yes. Um, I don't have that data available right now, but uh, we do have numbers on uh, individuals that we we're able to connect to shelter at either Overlook or 1220 with Sycamore Grove. Uh, the numbers at the time of closure were um, not considerable at that point, but we'll have that data aggregated. And similarly, through the Poganet process, uh, we will be collecting that information throughout. Will those be? Will that information be available prior to the close of our budget actions in June? That's You got to got to come to the microphone. We Thank could you. probably give you you receive weekly updates from our staff member Susie Oki. We can be sure to include 
the numbers of individuals that um, accept shelter. We don't start the POGO up until next week. We started noticing this week, the 23. Yeah, so it's not till next week. So I don't have numbers on POGO up. I think we're facing an extraordinary problem here. The county, the, the state government has said that all counties will need to stand up a CARES court which may be helpful with some portion of those experiencing homelessness. I must say that when the county was here and presenting, which admittedly in fairness to them, was this is a brand new concept to them, just like it is to us, except they have the obligation to stand it up, not us. Uh, but I was a bit taken aback by the sense that perhaps the county was reluctant to go in this into this space that they are required to go into and that there are rather significant costs as it was explained by Ms. Colburn and her staff when they were here that the county had not identified and the state was not providing subvention of any kind. So this comes out of the, presumably out of the county's general fund. A general fund which, looking at their budget, is not a general fund that's going to have millions of dollars of surplus anytime soon, and they will have to undertake a multi-million dollar activity in order to stand up these care courts, if I understand it. Am I right in thinking that at this moment, the state is not providing an the offset state, to the expenses that the counties are going to incur. It's a reshuffle. No, they're not, but one of the things we have been told from the county, it's basically a reshuffling of the decks. It's just taking the same population and prioritizing those that will get the services first. It's a reprioritization. Uh, is, well, is basically even, what it is. Well, that's even worse than I thought. No, that's even worse than I thought. Because they're really not going to be doing more, they're going to be doing different. And they hope that that different results in a different outcome. And I'm okay with that, with them hoping that. Doing the same thing over and over, expecting we know what the answer to that is. So they're going to try something new. So let's say they reshuffle the deck and they stop funding this and they go over here and they fund this, which I think is an optimistic expectation. I don't think they will stop doing everything in order to go over here and do the state program. And we're facing, at a minimum, if we approve this budget, a $6 million hole uh, in funding homeless services in the next fiscal year. And if I look at, if I read this chart correctly, not a heck of a lot of that would fit into the homeless component of an affordable housing bond. Because if I understand it, this most of this is not capital outlay. Almost all of this is, is program. It's programs. So no capital outlay program going away, no money from the state, a county that seems reluctant to want to engage in a, in a CARES court, they will do it because it's the law, but I didn't hear anything close to enthusiasm of getting on with it. And according to your characterization, which I totally trust, uh, we may not see a net gain in, in county expenditures. So, this is not so much a question as an observation. Uh, and you've probably heard me say this before. Cities are not small versions of the county. We don't, we are not very good. We, you do it quite well, but cities are not designed to be health and human service providers. We're not. There's nothing in our mandate that requires that. We do it out of the kindness of our hearts is how we spend this general fund money. But we're gonna face a tremendous challenge on the operations side. I'm, I'm willing to think that within the next couple of weeks we can fashion a, uh, 
uh, an affordable housing bond that covers a lot of ground and provides some capital outlay for, for either shelter needs or some tr transitional housing or permanent support, whatever it may be. We'll, we'll make, try to make a capital contribution of that in the right way. But I see us facing a tremendous challenge sitting here one year from now with no apparent change in the state. The state's budget this year, the governor seems to have forgotten all about and the legislature seems to have forgotten all about anything they wanted, uh, that they used to claim was their highest priority. And they seem to have forgotten that. I mean, am I right? There's, there's no funding coming our way to a city for any of this or any of the other things we talk about in the area of, of homeless services, is that right? That's right. There's a marked difference between the May revise and the, the earlier projections of, of what the funding was available for homelessness. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Any other questions or comments? We'll see you at budget. Uh, we'll see you in June. Thank you very much. I'm, I want to say, before you leave, this is a very good presentation. I think what you're hearing from the council is and probably what you experience, a high level of frustration about this. We have no doubt that there are people in tremendous need out there. I think it varies. I will tell you that. I don't think every person who's experiencing homelessness is uh, someone who, uh, who we need to spend $35,000 on. I really believe that. I don't know what portion we should or shouldn't. But your work on this is very good every year. We have given you a very difficult task. You do it very well. That's different than whether we are very frustrated about what's going on here. Thank you. Thank your, you. Appreciate it. Thank that. you for your very yeah. fine work. Yeah. Is there further business come before us? Am I right in understanding we'll be back here at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning? Further business come before the council. The vice mayor moves adjournment. Ms. Brown seconds. <laughs> Mr. Newsom would have, but, uh, but he I didn't. I was going to move. We and, all fall uh, under the It's not debatable. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned. <laughs>